Oh, God. Well, you know what? It's, uh, it's been a fun ride, folks, but, uh, you know, every, every great thing must come to an end, and this is the end of my, uh, the end of my rope, really. Um, welcome to <laughs> what is going to be a great time for everyone. We are going to be in continuation. Now we're gonna... I guess without further ado, I can't think of anything else to uh, prolong this. <laughs> so let's let's go into the, the manual for male circumcision under local anesthesia. This is done by the World Health Organization, UN AIDS, and JH Pigo, whatever that is. Then we have what is probably going to be one of the only blank pages. Male circumcision under local anesthesia. Version 3.1, December 9th. Mail Manual for male circumcision under local anesthesia. Version 3.1, December 2009. Page II. Another blank page. I am having... They are having mercy on me. Contents. Preface. Acknowledgements. Photo credits. Financial support. Abbreviations and acronyms used in this manual. Benefits and risks of male circumcision. Summary. Introduction. What is male circumcision? How circumcision is performed. Benefits and risks. Benefits. Risk. Male circumcision and HIV infection. The evidence linking male circumcision and HIV. Male circumcision and regional differences in HIV prevalence. Randomized controlled trials to assess the e e efficacy of male circumcision in reducing risk of HIV infection. Possible biological explanations for the protective effect of male circumcision. Protection for women. Other health benefits of circumcision. Acceptability of circumcision among African men. References. Male circumcision to other male sexual and reproductive health services. Summary. Men's sexual and reproductive health needs and services. Counseling and testing for HIV infection. Barriers to male sexual and reproductive health services. Meeting the sexual and reproductive health needs of men. Meeting uh, men's roles in women's and children's health. Who should, provide, who should provide sexual and reproductive health? Yes. You're listening to the uh, male circumcision audiobook. You're going to love it. Um, no, I'm gonna take my sweet time. This feels like a, a terrible collaboration. Oh my god, Mars, what are you doing in my audiobook? I guess we have to, like, make a video together. Oh shit, alright. Mm-hmm. Alright, good. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to keep the distractions to a minimum, you know, in case there's anybody who has this PDF and needs it for like a class and they want an audiobook, I want to be there for them. So um, let's get back to uh, who should provide sexual and reproductive health services and information to boys and men. Oh, yeah. For you just joining us, we are just reading through the table of contents right now. Detection and treatment of selected male sexual and reproductive health problems, sexually transmitted infections, balanitis. Phimosis, oh, I'm excited for that one. Paraphimosis, urinary tract infections, infertility, and references. Chapter 3, educating and counseling clients and obtaining informed consent. Summary, education about sexual and reproductive health and male circumcision. Group education script. Counseling, basic facts about counseling. Confidentiality, counseling skills. Informed consent for surgery. General. Adolescent boys, ooh, consent and confidentiality. Documenting informed consent for surgery. Infant circumcision. Integration of traditional circumcision events with clinical circumcision. Appendix 3.1, additional script for counseling reproductive health. Appendix 3.2, sample information sheet for adult and adolescent clients. Appendix 3.3, sample certificate of consent for adults and adolescents. Chapter 4. Facilities and supplies, screening patients and preparations for surgery. Summary, equipment and supplies, maintenance and review of equipment, screening adult clients, history, physical examination, HIV testing and informed consent for surgery, preoperative washing by the patient, scrubbing and putting on protect protective clothing, whether to use a gown, face masks and protective eyewear, 
Appendix 4.1, sample client record form for, for adults and adolescents. Appendix 4.2, sample disposable consumables for, for one adult male circumcision. Appendix 4.3, detailed anatomy of the penis. Appendix 4.4, selected anatomical abnormalities of the penis. Surgical procedures for adults and adolescents. Summary, surgical skills required for safe circumcision. Anatomy of the penis and choice of surgical technique. Tissue handling. Hemostasis. Diathermy. Suture material, suturing, tying knots, skin preparation and draping, skin preparation with povidone iodine, draping, anesthesia, penile nerve supply, maximum dose of local anesthetic, safe injection of local anesthetic, ring block technique, retraction of the foreskin and dealing with adhesions, marking the line of the circumcision, surgical methods, Forceps guided method of circumcision, dorsal slit method of circumcision, sleeve resection method of circumcision, dressing, appendix 5.1, variations in technique for minor abnormalities of the foreskin. Chapter 6, circumcision of infants and children, summary, screening male babies and young boys for circumcision, consent, preparation, anesthesia, safe injection for local anesthetic. EMLA cream, glucose by mouth, vitamin K, skin preparation and draping, retraction of the foreskin, and divisions of adhesions, pediatric surgical methods, suture material, dorsal slip method for children, the Plastibel method, the Mojin clamp method, the Gompco clamp method, Appendix 6.1, information for parents considering circumcision for their child, Appendix 6.2, Sample Consent Document for a Minor. <sighs> Postoperative Care and Management of Complications. Summary, postoperative care, postoperative monitoring, instructions for the client, transfer of client records, follow-up visits, routine follow-up, emergency follow-up, recognition and management of complications, organizing referrals, complications occurring during surgery, complications occurring within the first 48 hours of sur after surgery, Complications that occur within the first two weeks after surgery. Late complications. Appendix 7.1. Sample post-operative instructions for men who have been circumcised. Chapter 8. Prevention of infection. Summary. Basic concepts. Standard precautions. Hand hygiene. Washing hands with soap and water. Alcohol-based hand rub. Surgical hand scrub. Personal protective equipment. Gloves. Masks. Caps and protective eyewear. Aprons and the surgeon's gown. Footwear, immunizations, safe handling of hypodermic needles and syringes, tips for safe use of hypodermic needles and syringes, sharps containers, processing of instruments, environmental cleaning and management of spills, disinfection, cleaning, high-level disinfection, sterilization, environmental clearing, management of spills, safe disposal of infectious waste materials, waste management, Tips for safe handling and disposal of infectious waste, disposing of sharp items, burning waste containers, encapsulating waste containers, burying waste, post-exposure prophylaxis, managing occupational exposure to hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, management of exposure to hepatitis B, management of exposure to hepatitis C, post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, clinic staff should now know their HIV status. Eight, uh, nine, managing a circumcision service. Summary, record keeping, monitoring and evaluation, indicators, what is monitoring, what is evaluation, why evaluate male circumcision programs, what, it, what is a monitoring system, monitoring performance in male circumcision programs, evaluation, what are good data, quality assurance, supervision, the goal, the style, the process. Appendix 9.1. Simple stock card. Sample stock card. Appendix 9.2. Sample stock taking card for consumables. Appendix 9.3. Sample male circumcision adverse event form. Appendix 9.4. Sample male circumcision register. So with that out of the way, we officially have the entire table of contents. So we know how far we are because each chapter is about a little like 11 percent of the entire um the entire thing that's uh 
comforting. So here is the preface. Male circumcision has been performed on boys and young men for many years, primarily for religious and cultural reasons or as a rite of passage to mark the transition to adulthood. Data from cross-sectional epi epidemiological studies conducted since the mid-1980s showed that circumcised men have a lower prevalence of HIV infection than uncircumcised men. This finding was supported by data from prospective studies that showed a lower in Incidence of HIV infection in circumcised men than in uncircumcised men. Although the analysis adjusted for cultural and social factors associated with male circumcision, it was not clear from these studies whether promoting male circumcision among men who would not otherwise be circumcised would result in a lower incidence of HIV infection. To address this question, three randomized controls trials were launched in Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa in 2004. The results from South African study were published in late 2005 and showed 60% lower incidence of HIV infection among men randomly assigned to undergo immediate circumcision compared to those assigned to a delayed circumcision. Confirmatory results from the other two trials were released on de in December 2006. These data lay led World Health Organization and United UNAIDS to recommend in 2007 that male circumcision should be considered an additional way of reducing risk of HIV infection in men and programs for safe male circumcision should be expanded rapidly in countries and settings where gen with gen generalized HIV epidemics and low prevalence of circumcision. There is, there is increased demand for male circumcision in several countries with a high incidence of HIV, but there is little technical guidance on how ser services can be safely expanded given the limits, limited resources available. Reports of high complication rates following circumcisions performed on young men by traditional circumcisers in southern and eastern Africa are common, but the true incidence is not known. Technical guidance on the provision of safe perform, safe Male circumcision services is therefore necessary. Although circumcisions are widely performed by surgeons and general practitioners in an appropriate clinical environment, resources are not currently adequate to meet the anticipated increased demand. It, this technical manual on male circumcision is aimed at providers of male circumcision services and program managers. No attempt is made to describe all possible methods for male circumcision. The me methods covered have been selected on the basis of their safety and practicality for use in resource-limited settings. The manual forms part of co a comprehensive package, which includes training guides and materials, as well as male circumcision quality improvement framework for use by providers, program managers, and national medical authorities to ensure high-quality services while providing detailed technical information on different surgical approaches. The manual also addresses broader issues of sexual and reproductive health of men and emphasizes that male circumcision must be set within the context of other strategies for reducing risk of HIV infection. A full description of best practices for the surgery and anesthesia in, resource li in a resource-limited setting can be found in the WHO publication, Surgical Care at the District Hospital, Geneva, World Health Organization, 2003. The manual has been developed by the World Health Organization, WHO, in collaboration with the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, UN AIDS, and JPEGO as part of work to support countries in safe male circumcision services and ensuring that circumcised men do not perceive themselves as fully protected against HIV and other sexually transmitted infections and consequently forego other HIV risk reduction strategies. This manual was developed from reproductive health and surgery training materials, as well as on the basis of experience with several provision in Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, and developed countries. The manual and materials were reviewed by an actual, by actual and potential providers of male circumcision services, representing a large a range of healthcare and cultural settings where demand for male circumcision services is high. The manual is one of several documents and guidelines developed by. World Health Organization, UN AIDS, and partners to assist countries to develop and implement programs for safe medical male circumcision for HIV prevention within the context of their existing HIV prevention activities and sexual reproductive health programs. All documents can be downloaded from Clearinghouse on Male Circumcision for HIV Prevention, www.malecircumcision.org, a website created to share technical and policy guidance, knowledge, tools, and experience relevant to implementing male circumcision programs. The most relevant documents include new data on male circumcision and HIV prevention, policy and program implications, provides guidance 
to policymakers and program managers on issues that need to be considered and addressed when planning for program scale up. Operational Guidance for Scaling Up Male Circumcision Services for HIV Prevention. This document guides operational and program programmatic guidance for to decision makers, program managers, and technical support agencies on scaling up programs in the public and private sectors. Male Circumcision Quality Assurance, a guide to enhancing the safety and quality of services, outlines the roles and responsibilities in national dis of national and district program managers for implementing a safe quality male circumcision services and provides guidance for planning of a national quality assurance program. It defines 10 quality standards against which the quality of services can be measured and used as part of a continuous process of service improvement. The guide is used as a part of a continuous process of service improvement the guide is supplemented by the Male Circumcision Services Quality Assessment Toolkit, which is used by facility managers and providers to assess their own performance. It can be used by national and district managers to conduct external assessments of facilities. The toolkit includes a scoring tool in which, into which users can enter assessment findings and monitor progress towards meeting the standards. Considerations for implementing models for optimizing the volume and efficiency of male circumcision services for HIV prevention. This document provides guidance to help programs improve the efficiency of clinical and surgical activities so that they can strengthen their capacity to meet demand for male circumcision services. It addresses clinical techniques, staffing, facility space, client rescheduling and flow, commodities management, cost efficiencies, and quality assurance. It also includes detailed model lists of equipment and supplies required to support a male circumcision program. A guide to indicators for male circumcision programs in the formal healthcare guide system. Healthcare system lists indicators that programs you can use to monitor and evaluate progress towards their program objectives. Adaptable to different country situations, the guide includes indicators of demand for and supply of male circumcision services, as well as measures to assess secondary services of the program, such as changes in sexual behaviors at the individual and community levels. Acknowledgements. The manual is based on the I'll say on the work of a large and clinical public health experts who participated in technical consultations and reviews. Particular particular thanks are due to the following: Tim Hargreave and Emmanuel Otolarin, who wrote and edited the draft manual, the Orange Farm, Kisumu and Rakai study teams who generously shared slides, videos, and training materials. Robert Bailey. Palsia Mohalaro, Emmanuel Otolaran, and Stephen Watga for photographic illustrations, oh Ohaniba Owusu Danso, and Quabina Danso for photographs and a description of the Gomco clamp method for which the illustrations were made, Bill Manson and John Orr for review of Chapter 7, Micheline Dipart, Gerald Dezikan, and Selma Kamasi, review of chapter 8. Gillian Kidd, Department of Medical Illustration, University of Edinburgh, Scotland, who prepared the illustrations of the surgical methods. Melanie Bacon, Robert Bailey, A.S. Chawla, Hansoon Chang, Kelly Curran, Adam Groeneveld, John Krieger, Jasper Neduson, Red. Doane Rabi and Stephen Watia, who provided detailed written comments on the manual. Joanne Ashton, Joint Commission International. Oh god, these, these foreign names, they're fun AF. Bertrand Alvert, Melanie Bacon, Cassandra Boa, Dai Boon Shem, Kelly Coran, Adam Groenveld, Tim Hargreave, Chris Hyens, Martin Kaluwaji, Sifuni Koshuma, Chiapo Lestidi, Palsi Molaharo, Samuel Matumba, Jasper Ndosind, John Opea Ulu, George Shal Shilaluke, Ajit Sinha, B.S. Toma, Stephen Watya, and Charles Wisanji, who participated in a technical review of the draft manual in Montreux, Switzerland, in April 2006, and 
Khalil Abu Dalu, Autumn Ab Abzak, Yona Amitai, Zah Zahavi Cohen, Cyril Fine, Esther Galili, Benjamin Kazundheit, Debbie Gettlebeer, Ethan Gross, Mordechai Halperin, Pinhas Livni, Yoram Moore, Neil Perlman, Hani Rosenberg, Inan Schenker, Francis Soror, Eli Simhi, and Moshi Westreach for a detailed review and comments during a technical meeting in Jerusalem, Israel in December 2006, facilitated by the Jerusalem AIDS Project. The technical content of the manual has been reviewed by representatives of the Pan-African Urological Surgeons Association, PAUSA. Now that's funny because it's from Africa. The Korean and Andrology Society, the Taiwan Andrology Society, and the Israeli Association of Pediatric Surgery. The development of the manual was coordinated by Tim Farley and Manjula Lusti Narash Simhan, World Health Organization Development of Reproductive Health and Research, Isabel de Zoisa, WHO and Community Health Cluster, Kim Dixon, and George Schmid, WHO Department of HIV and AIDS, Mina Sharian, WHO Department of Essential Health Technologies, and Kate Hankins, UN AIDS. Final technical editing and layout were undertaken by Pat Butler and dot dot dot, respectively. Photo credits. Stephen Watya, Emmanuel O'Tullerin, Robert Bailey, and Policia Mohelero. Yes, there are photos in this. Graphic photos. I did a brief skim, and I'm not ready for those. Financial support. This manual was developed with financial support from French Agency Nationale des Researchers de Sur La Cita, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the USA National Institutes of Health. So Bill Gates has got his microchips all over this. So here's some abbreviations and acronyms that, you, that are used in this manual. So we've got AIDS, which means Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. I didn't know that. ALAT, Alanine Aminotransferase, ARV, Antirotrovial Drugs, EMLA, U Eutectic Mixture of Local Anesthetics, HBV, Hepatitis B Virus, HCV, Hepatitis C virus, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, HPV, human papilloma virus, NRTI, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, STI, sexually transmitted infection, UN AIDS, Joint UNAS United National Program on HIV slash AIDS, USA, United States of America, WHO, World Health Organization. All right, before we get into chapter one, I know that this is this video is called male genital mutilation, but that's mostly just because I did a video on female genital mutilation, and I thought that that you know that that would just fit. Personally, do I think that circumcision is genital mutilation? Well, I mean, kind of. Like, I'm not one of those people who, like, demonizes uh, circumcision and thinks it's, like, the most evil thing in the world. I think it's kind of cringe to, you know, like, cut off a part of a human body, like, you know, before you even have, like, the awareness of it. Like, if you want to do it on your own, not on your own, but if, like, you as an adult is like, yeah, I want to cut my foreskin off, you know, like, there shouldn't be anything stopping you, but, like, when you're fresh out the womb, like, you know, like, what if you want to keep that? What if you want to keep your foreskin? Like, but, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to demonize any, um, any parent who gets their kid circumcised, but, like, you know, if I have a kid, probably not going to circumcise them, you know, like, if they want to, if they want to get circumcised, if it's, if it's that important to them, like, they can, you know, get it done, you, they can get it done when, when, when they want to, you know? Like, if they're eight and they're like, I want to get circumcised, like, I guess I'll take him to the doctor. So, now, without further ado, we are at Chapter 1, Benefits and Risks of Male Circumcision. Summary. 
Circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin, the fold of skin that covers the head of the penis. Glands. The benefits in male circumcision include a reduced risk of urinary tract infections in childhood, a reduced risk of ulcerative sexually transmitted diseases in adulthood, protection against penile cancer, a reduced risk in cervical cancer in female sex partners, and prevention of balanitis, which is inflammation of the glands. Posthitis, that's inflammation of the foreskin. Phimosis, inability to retract the foreskin. And paraphimosis, inability to return the retracted foreskin to its original location. Complication rates following male circumcision are very low when it is performed by well-equipped and trained healthcare providers. Numerous regional and global studies since the 1980s have noted a lower risk of HIV infection in circumcised men, as well as lower HIV prevalence in populations where male circumcision is common. Randomized controlled trials in Kenya, South Africa, and Uganda have demonstrated that male circumcision reduces the individual man's risk of acquiring HIV infection by 60%. Introduction. What is male circumcision? Um, hang on. All right. I had to take a shot for this one. What is male circumcision? Circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin, the fold that covers the head of the penis, the fold of skin that covers the head of the penis. It is widely practiced for religious and traditional reasons often within the first two weeks after birth, or at the beginning of adolescence as a rite of passage into adulthood. It may also be performed for medical reasons to treat problems involving the foreskin. How circumcision is performed. During a circumcision, the foreskin is freed from the head of the penis, glands, and removed. When done in a newborn baby, the procedure, procedure is simpler and quicker than in adolescents and adults. Superficial wound healing after circumcision in adults generally takes five to seven days. However, after about, about four to six weeks are needed for the wound to heal fully. In babies and young boys, however, the healing time is considerably shorter. Benefits and Risks whether or not circumcision is necessary has been a subject of heated debate in many countries. In some settings, circumcision is widely performed for religious and or cultural reasons, while in others it is performed principally on medical grounds. In order to make an informed decision, every potential client in, or parent is entitled to full information about the benefits and risks of the procedure. The decision of, a, of an adult or young man to be circumcised and the decision of a parent to have his or her son circumcised should be based on culture, religion, personal preference, and evidence-based information provided by a healthcare worker. Benefits. In circumcision, if circumcision is being done for reasons other than the treatment of a specific medical problem, the health benefits are primary, primarily preventative and may only be realized that long after the procedure. Circumcision may reduce the risk of acquiring some infections and related complications, but does not guarantee complete protection. Some of these conditions are common, while others are less so, and the degree of risk of the individual is likely to depend on his behavior and where he lives. Although the strength of the evidence varies by disease, the benefits of circumcision include the following. It is easier to keep the penis clean. There is a reduced risk of urinary tract infections in childhood. Circumcision prevents inflam inflammation of the glands, balanitis, and the foreskin. Posthitis. Post post Circumcision prevents the potential development of scar tissue on the foreskin. And paraphimosis. Swelling of the retracted foreskin resulting in an inability to return the foreskin to its normal position. There is a reduced risk in so of some sexually transmitted infections, STIs, especially ulcerative diseases such as chancroid and syphilis. There is a reduced risk of becoming infected with human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. There is a reduced risk of penile cancer. There is a reduced risk of cancer of the cervix in female sex partners. Risks. As for any surgical procedure, there are risks associated with circumcision. While the benefits of circumcision may be wide-ranging and long-term, any problems generally occur during or soon after the procedure. They include pain, bleeding, hematoma, Formation of, blood, of a blood clot under the skin, infection at the site of the circumcision, increased sensitivity of the gland's penis for the first few months after the procedure, irritation of the glands, metitis, inflammation of the opening of the urethra, injury to penis, adverse reaction to the anesthetic used during the circumcision. These complications are rare when circumcision is performed by well-trained, adequately equipped, 
experienced healthcare personnel and are usually easily and rapidly resolved. Data from controlled trials show that fewer than 1 in 50 procedures result in complications. That's still, what, like 2%? Male circumcision and HIV infection. There is currently great interest in the role of male circumcision in protecting, preventing HIV infection. Research studies have shown a lower risk of a of infection in circumcised compared with uncircumcised men, as well as a lower prevalence of HIV infection in populations where male circumcision is common. These da data led World Health Organization and UN AIDS to recommend that male circumcision be promoted a as an additional method of HIV prevention, and that countries or settings with generalized HIV epidemics and low prevalence of circumcision should urgently care scale up circumcision services. The evidence linking male circumcision and HIV. A systematic review and meta-analysis of 28 published studies found that uncircumcised men are two to three times more likely to be infected with HIV than circumcised men, with the difference being that most pronounced in men with high exposure to HIV infection. A sub-analysis of 10 African studies involving men considered to be at high risk of becoming infected found a 3 to 4 time 3.4 times higher incidence of HIV infection among those who had not been circumcised. In a prospective study in Uganda of HIV negative men whose partners were HIV positive, none of 50 circumcised men became infected within two years, compared to 40 compared with 40 of 130 and 37 uncircumcised men. Male circumcision and regional differences in HIV prevalence. The geographical regions of, in sub-Saharan Africa where men are more commonly circumcised overlap with areas of lower HIV prevalence. An extensive study by the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, UN AIDS, investigated behavioral and other factors that could account for the large disparities in HIV prevalence across different African regions. A low prevalence of male circumcision and a high prevalence of genital herpes, which is more common in uncircumcised men, emerged as the principal as the principal determinants of the HIV of the differences in HIV rates. <sighs> male circ wait hang on. Table one point one shows the prevalence of HIV infection in a number of countries with lower high rates of male circumcision. Countries in sub-Saharan Africa where male circumcision is common, over 80%, generally have HIV prevalence levels with well below the, in those of countries where circumcision is less common, less than 20%, despite the presence of other risk factors for heterosexual HIV transmission, such as high frequency of multiple sexual partners, low rates of condom use, and high prevalence of other STIs. HIV prevalence in the countries of South and Southeast Asia, where nearly all men are circumcised, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Philippines, remains extremely low, despite patterns of risk factors for HIV and other STIs similar to those found elsewhere in the, in the region. Table 1.1 HIV prevalence according to frequency of male circumcision. Low circumcision rate, less than 20%. Sub-Saharan Africa. So we've got the country and the HIV prevalence. So, low circumcision rate. Botswana, 24.1%. Mal Malawi, 14.1%. Mozambique, 16.1%. Namibia, 19.6%. Rwanda, 3.1%. Swazil Swaziland, 33.4%. Zambia, 17%. Zimbabwe, 20.1%. South and Southeast Asia, Cambodia, 1.6%. India, 0.9%. Myanmar, 1.3%. Nepal, 0.5%. Thailand, 1.4%. So now here is the high circumcision rate. Country and HIV prevalence, 80%. So high circumcision rate is over 80%. Benign, 1.8%. Cameroon, 5.4%. Democratic Republic of Congo, 3.2%. Gabon, 7.9%. Gambia, 2.4%. Ghana, 2.3%. Guinea, 1.5%. Kenya, 6.1%. Liberia, 5.9%. Nigeria, 3.9%, Sierra Leone, 1.6%.
Bangladesh is less than 0.1%, Indonesia and Pakistan are 0.1%, and the Philippines is less than 0.1%. The source is updated from Halperlin, Halperin and Bailey using most recent UN AIDS data. A study in India fo followed 2,298 men attending at three STI clinics. A significantly lower incidence of HIV infection was observed among circumcised men, although rates of STIs such as syphilis and gonorrhea were similar. The similar incidence of STIs in the two groups indicate similar sexual risk behavior and suggests a biological rather than behavioral explanation for observed lower rate of HIV. However, it is important to note that of the 191 circumcised men, 62% were Muslim. When non-Muslim men were, were assigned separately, the circumcised group was small and no significance protective event was found. This illustrates the difficulty of separating the effect of male circumcision from that of other cultural factors. Only randomized, randomized controlled trials can determine the efficacy of male circumcision in reducing the risk of HIV infection. Randomized controlled trials to assess the efficacy of male circumcision in reducing risk of HIV infection. In July 2005, the results of the Orange, Family, Orange Farm in, intervention trial in South Africa were made public. They were subsequently published in November 2005. This was the first report from a randomized controlled trial of male circumcision as a means to prevent HIV infection. A total of 3,274 uninfected men aged 18 to 24 years were randomly assigned to undergo circumcision either immediately or after 21 months. The incidence of HIV infection was found to be 60% lower among those who were circumcised. On the strength of these results, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee recommended that the men initially assigned to be delayed circumcision group should be offered the procedure without further delay without waiting the full 21 months. Two further trials on male circumcision and HIV infection were stopped in December 2006 and published in early 2007. Both trials involved random allocation of HIV-negative volunteers to either immediate circumcision performed by trained medical professionals in a clinical setting, intervention group, or, or circumcision delayed for two years, control group. The first trial in Kisumu, Western Kenya, was, result was, was conducted among men aged 18 to 24 years and showed a 53% reduction in HIV incidence. The second study was conducted in Rakai, Uganda, among men aged 15 to 49 years and showed a 51% reduction in HIV incidence. Following release of the study results, circumcision was offered without further delay to the men in both non-intervention groups. Possible Biological Explanation for the Protective Effect of Male Circumcision The primary cells through which HIV enter the, the body are the Langerhans cells. These cells are present in high density on the e epithelium of the inner foreskin and are close to the surface because of the layer of keratin is thin. In, a, in an in vitro study, viral uptake by cells from the mucosal surface of foreskin was seven times more efficient than that by tissue from the female cervix. The inner mucosal surface of the foreskin lacks the thick layer of keratin that covers most exposed skin. This leaves numerous mucosal Langerhans cells and other immune cell targets easily accessible to HIV infection. The highly vascularized foreskin mucosa and in particular, the frenulum is prone to tearing and bleeding during intercourse. These micro injuries allow e easy access to, of HIV in the, to the bloodstream. A further factor that may facilitate entry of the virus is the presence of an ulcerative STI, such as herpes simplex, chancroid, or syphilis, which tend to be more common in uncircumcised men. Protection for Women. A study in Uganda observed lower rates of male to female transmission of HIV if the man was circumcised. Among 47 couples in which the circumcised male partner was infected with HIV and whose viral load <laughs> was below 50,000 copies per milliliter, none of the female partners became infected in two years. By contrast, 26 of the 147 women whose HIV-infected partners were not circumcised became infected. A subsequent randomized control trial of circumcision among men with HIV infection did not confirm this result. 
It showed there might be a higher risk of HIV transmission to women in the first two years after the operation. Further observational study has shown 40% lower risk of HIV infection in couples where the male partner was infected and the female partner was not infected with HIV, but the reduction in risk was not significant. Other health benefits of circumcision. A multi-country study found a lower prevalence of human palipomavirus, HPV, infection in, a circumci in circumcised men than in uncircumcised men. HPV infection is a necessary casual factor for cervical cancer and is associated with an increased risk of cancer of the vulva, va vagina, and anus in women, and of the penis and anus in men. Prospective studies have shown that circumcised men are less likely to have HIV, HPV infection. The incidence of invasive penile cancer is significantly lower in circumcised men than in uncircumcised men, though this condition is extremely rare. Acceptability of circumcision among African men. Surveys and, and qualitative studies among young men as well as older men in six African countries have found that a considerable proportion expressed interest in circumcision, ranging from 45% in Harare, Zimbabwe, to over 80% in a large survey in Botswana. These studies indicate that many men would willingly undergo circumcision if it could be performed safely and at a reasonable cost. In the surveys, the men reported that their main interest in circumcision was related to hygiene, infection, control, and for some, a belief that, that condom use is easier for men who are circumcised. Before we continue, I would like to note that we have officially gotten past the first 20 pages, which is rough, roughly, what, 10% of this, and it has been 50 minutes. So to take that into account, that means that we have, what, 500 minutes, and what is 50 divided by 6? Um, 6 times, what, 7 is... Six times eight. So we have it. We're looking at a bit, just a little bit over eight hours of this, and we've already got what ten percent of it down. That's not bad. Not bad in my book. Okay. References. We've got twenty nine references. We've got Wiswell T E Hatchy. W.E., Urinary Tract Infections and the Uncircumcised State. Klin, Petitar, 1993, 32, 130-4. The COJM et al. Genital Ulcer Disease Among STD Clinic Attenders in Nairobi Association with HIV-1 and Circumcision Status. Int J S T D AIDS, 1996-7, 410 410-414. Cook, L.S., Kutsky, L.A., Holmes, K.K., Circumcision and Sexually Transmitted Diseases, M.J., Public Health, 1994, 84, 187 to 201. Krieger, J., et al., Adult Male Circumcision, Results of a Standardized Procedure in K Kisumu District, Kenya, BJU International, 2005, 96, 1109 to 1113. Weiss... Weiss H. Quigley M. Hayes R. Male Circumcision and Risk of HIV Infection in Sub-Saharan Africa. A Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, AIDS 2014, 2361-2370. Alvert B. Talihard D. Lagarde E. Saab Saabengui Tam Bioku J. Sita R. Purin a randomized <clears throat> controlled intervention trial of male circumcision for reduction of HIV infection risk, the ANRS-1265 trial, PLOS Medicine, 2005, 2, 11, E298. Bailey, Moses, S. Parker, C.B., Agat, K., McLean, I. Krieger, J.N. et al. Male, Circumcision for HIV Prevention in Young Men in Kisumu, Kenya, a randomized controlled trial. Lancet, 2007, 369, 643 to 656. Ray R.H., Kigozi, G. Sirwata, D., Makumbi F. Watya, S. Nelgoda F. et al., Male Circumcision for HIV Prevention in Men in Rakai, Uganda, a randomized trial, Lancet 2007, 369, 657-666, that's a sign. 
American Academy of Pediatrics report of the task force of on circumcision <laughs> task force on circumcision pediatrics 1989-84 388 to 391 Dodge OG Kavidi JN male circumcision among the peoples of East Africa and the incidence of genital cancer East Africa Med Journal 1965 42 98 to 105 Agarwal SS et al role of male behavior in cervical carcinogenesis among women with one lifetime sexual partner cancer 1993 yo cancer wrote that one 72 166 to 169 apologies i want to keep the comments to a minimum but i am doped up on bang so there's no guarantee World Health Organization and Joint United Nations Program on AIDS. New data on male circumcision and HIV prevention. Policy and program implications. World Health Organization, Geneva 2007. HTTP back, uh, colon backslash backslash www.who.int slash HIV slash media center slash news 68 slash en slash index dot html. Bray RH. Kiwanuka and Quinn TC et al. Male Circumcision and HIV Acquisition and Transmission. Cohort Studies in Rakai, Uganda. Rakai Project Team AIDS 2014, 2371 to 81. Overt B. Boove A. Ferry. B. Kareel M. Morrison. L. Lagarde E. et al. Ecolo ecological and individual level analysis of risk factors for HIV infection in four urban populations in sub-Saharan Africa with different levels of HIV infection, AIDS 2001, 15S15 15 to 30. Hal Halperin DT Bailey RC, male circumcision and HIV infection, 10 years and counting, Lancet 1999, 354, 1813 to 1815. 2006 Report on the Global AIDS Epidemic, Geneva Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS 2006. Reynolds S.J. et al. Male Circumcision and Risk on a of HIV-1 and Other Sexually Transmitted Infections in India, Lancet 2004, 363, 9414, 1039-40. Salu E.J. Coleman, An Expression of D.C. S.I.G.N. in Human Foreskin May Facilitate Sexual... Transmission of HIV, J. Clinn, Pathol, 2004, 57, 77 to 78. Hussein, uh oh. Hussein, um, LA, Leher T. Com comparative investigation on Langerhan cells and pr potential receptors for HIV in oral, genitourinary, and rectal. Epithelia, Immunology, 1995-85-475-484. Estrada CR et al. Biologic Mechanisms of HIV Infection of Human Foreskin. Implications for Patterson BK et al. Susceptibility to, uh, to Human Immunodeficiency Virus 1. Infection of Human Foreskin and Cervical Tissue Grown in Explant Culture. AMJ Path, 2002, 161, 876-873. Wauer MJ, Macumbi F. K Kigozi G et al. Ercomcision in an HIV infected in HIV infected men and its effect on HIV transmission to female partners in Rakai, Uganda. A randomized controlled trial. Lancet 2009, 374, 9685, 229 to 237. What I'm gathering is that AIDS seems to be less of like a gay problem, like everywhere other than America. Beaten JM, Donald D. Kapiga S.H. et al. Male Circumcision and Risk of Male-to-Female HIV-1 Transmission, a Multinational Perspective Study in African HIV-1, Serodiscordant Couples, AIDS, 2010, 24, 5, 737 to 744. Travis J.W. Male Circumcision, Penile Human Papillomavirus Infection, and cervical cancer. Letter. New England, J. Med, 2002, 346, 1105 to 12. Sirwada D. Wauer, M.J., Makumbai F. et al., Circumcision of HIV Infected Men, Effects on High Risk Human Papillomavirus Infections in a Randomized Trial in Rakai, Uganda. 
Journal of Infectious Diseases, 2010 to 2001. Smith, J. S. Moses, S. Hudgens, M. G. et al. Increased risk of HIV acquisition among Kenyan men with diseases, 2010 to 201. Smith, J. Moses, S. Hudgens, M.G., et al., increased risk of HIV acquisition among Kenyan men with human papillomavirus infection, J.I.D., 2010-201-11. Gray R.H., Servada D. Kong, X., et al., male circumcision decreases acquisition and increases clearance of high-risk human papillomavirus in HIV-negative men. A randomized trial in Rakai, Uganda, Journal of Infectious Diseases, 2010-201. American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on Circumcision, Circumcision Policy Statement, Pediatrics, 1999-103-3688-86-693. The Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute, Male Circumcision Study, 2001, http colon backslash backslash www.hsph.harvard.edu slash bhp slash research slash male underscore circumcision html. Now that we have that out of the way, it's time to get to the good stuff, you know? Kind of feels like uh, an anime fan where they're like, oh, yeah, the first, like, 55 episodes are terrible. You have to watch them, but, oh, man, after that it gets real good. Because now we're back into the narrative arc. Speaking of narrative arc, today we are looking at, or I mean today, but we are starting with, linking male circumcision to other male sexual and reproductive health services. Here's the summary. Oops. Summary. Men have different sexual and reproductive health needs at different ages. Male sex circumcision reduces the risk of acquiring HIV infection by 50 to 60 percent, but does not guarantee complete protection. In addition, it may provide some protection against other sexually transmitted infections, such as syphilis and herpes, but offers little or no protection against gonorrhea and chlamydia. Male circumcision does not prevent unwanted pregnancy. Comprehensive education and information programs and the provision of services for contraception and STI prevention and management are needed to address male sexual and reproductive health needs. World Health Organization and UNAIDS recommend HIV testing and counseling for all patients who have signs and symptoms of HIV infection. In certain epidemic situations, they recommend routinely offering an HIV test at every contact with health services. World Health Organization and UNAIDS recommend that all men who request circumcision to reduce their risk of HIV infection should be offered the un-HIV test. The core goal for, for male sexual and reproductive health services include promoting responsible male sexual behavior and encouraging men to support their female partners and, and children in meeting their sexual and reproductive health needs. Ooh. Sexual and reproductive health education and services are important for men and adolescents, as well as for women. A wide range of people and organizations can provide information and services, including parents, teachers, non-governmental organizations, churches and youth groups, as, and, as well as health care providers in outpatient, family planning, STI, and HIV clinics. Every opportunity to provide education and services should be taken. Male circumcision provides for Male circumcision services for older boys and young men offer an opportunity to provide sexual and reproductive health education and counseling to these key groups. Then sexual and reproductive health needs and services. For many men, accessing circumcision services may be on their, lit their first contact with health services. This contact offers an opportunity to address other aspects of men's sexual and reproductive health. As noted in Chapter 1, male circumcision does not provide full protection against HIV, but appears to reduce the risk of infection by 50 to 60 percent. It gives little or no protection against STIs that affect the urethra, such as gonorrhea and chlamydia. It provides no protection against acquisition of HIV infection from unsafe injections from <laughs> infected blood products or through receptive anal intercourse. It also does not prevent pregnancy. Unsafe. Why would getting circumcised stop the heroin needle from giving you AIDS? To reduce the risk of H STIs, including HIV, the unwanted pregnancy, comprehensive er education and information programs are needed, as, po as well as services for contraception and STI prevention and management. A possible consequence of promoting male circumcision for HIV prevention is that circumcised men may perceive themselves as immune and subsequently increase their exposure to HIV, ig ignoring other important strategies to reduce risk. These strategies include delaying the onset of sexual activity, reducing the number of sexual partners and using condoms correctly and consistently every time they have sex. 
In many societies where male circumcision, circumcision is performed at the beginning of adolescence as a rite of passage to adulthood, the circumcision festival period is, all, is used also to educate young men about various health and social issues. These cultural traditions can be harmonized with modern clinical practice to ensure safety of circumcision and to use their, the opportunity to educate the young men about a number of sexual and reproductive health issues. Male circumcision should therefore be regarded as an entry point for sexual, reproductive, and other health services for men, figure 2.1, including sexual and reproductive health education and counseling, screening and treatment for sexually transmitted infections, counseling and testing for HIV, with referral for care and support for those testing positive, family planning education, counseling and services, including provision of condoms and vasectomy, Ev evaluation of management of infertility, counseling on gender issues, including promotion of respect for women's and girls' sexual and reproductive health needs and rights, and the importance of preventing gender-based violence, education about cancers of the male reproductive organs, testes, penis, and prostate, counseling for alcohol dependence and other substance abuse, which are associated with a number of health risks. No opportunity should be missed for education and counseling about male sexual and reproductive health issues before and after the initia initiation of sexual intercourse. And then we have a lovely figure, male circumcision as an entry point to other health services. So we've got um, kind of like a flow chart, but a circle. So we've got male circumcision in the middle and then a bunch of arrows. So male circumcision can lead to sexual and reproductive health education and counseling. Counseling on gender issues, including gender-based violence, alcohol dependence and substance abuse counseling, family planning, counseling and services, sexually transmitted infection screening and treatment, HIV testing and counseling, infertility evaluation and management, education about cancers of the male reproductive system, other male reproductive health disorders, counseling and testing for HIV infection. Men considering circumcision do not need to know about their HIV status. Circumcision can be offered to men irrespective of whether they are infected with HIV or not. The procedure can be performed safely on men who have HIV infection and may confer some benefit by reducing the risk of HIV transition to their female partners. The surgical staff who perform male circumcision should take full precautions to avoid acquiring HIV infections during surgery, universal or standard precautions. World Health Organization and UN AIDS promotes testing and counseling for HIV at all contacts with health services, particularly in settings with high HIV prevalence and incidence. However, clients should have the option to refuse an HIV test without affecting the care and services they receive. This approach is referred to as routine offer of testing with optional opt-out. It is estimated that fewer of 10% of people developing in developing countries are aware of their HIV status, and access to an uptake of counseling and testing services are limited. Knowledge of HIV status is important so that those infected can seek advice, support, and proper care, and can take measures to avoid path seeing the infection to others. Care includes prophylaxis and cotrimoxazole to reduce the rate of progression to acquired immunodeficiency system syndrome, AIDS, and antiretroviral treatment when clinically indicated. These treatments are becoming more widely available in developing countries. Specific information and messages can also be given to people known to be uninfected with HIV to help them remain free of infection. Before we continue, I would like to note that we have officially passed page 25, which means that we are more than one-eighth of the way through the book otherwise known as 12.5%. I would say we are probably closer to somewhere around 15%. Barriers to male sexual and reproductive health services. There are a number of barriers to the development and use of reproductive health services for men, including a lack of information on men's needs and concerns that could be used to design an appropriate method appropriate programs and services, embarrassment and alienation among men about using health facilities that are primarily de designated to address women's reproductive health issues, men's reluctance to seek medical care, 
Inadequate training of health workers to address men's sexual and reproductive health issues. Limited availability of contraceptive methods for men. Negative attitudes of policymakers and service providers towards men. For example, viewing men as irresponsible or not interested in playing a positive role in support of women's reproductive health needs or not an appropriate clientele for sexual and reproductive health services. Unfavorable legal and policy constraints such as ban on promotion of condoms. Lot logistic constraints such as lack of separate waiting and service areas for men, lack of trained male staff, lack of male-friendly clinics, and inconvenient clinic hours. These barriers must be addressed if men are to become more involved in sexual and reproductive health matters. Meeting the sexual and reproductive health needs of men. Access to sexual and reproductive health services is a human rights issue for women, men, and young people. The, the lack of services to address the sexual and reproductive health needs of men contributes to the stress and anxiety among them. Various strategies have been used to extend sexual and reproductive health services to men and to engage men as partners in improving women's sexual and reproductive health. Services for, for men may be offered in existing clinic-based services. Separate services may be established to provide provide information, education, and counseling on sexuality, physiological development, family planning, STIs and HIV, genital health and hygiene, interpersonal communication, and sexual and reproductive behavior. Special services may be established to offer diagnosis and treatment of sexual dysfunction, STIs and HIV, cancer of the prostate, testes and penis, and medical indications for male circumcision. Other approaches include community-based distribution and social marketing of condoms, reaching men with information and services through their workplace, the military, and men's groups, special outreach campaigns to young men, educational campaigns through the media, special initiatives such as outreach through football matches or other popular sporting events, promotion of vasectomy. Because gender inequality has a strong influence on women's sexual and reproductive health, program managers need to consider the needs and perspectives of men, women, and young people. It is also important to use gender-related and gender-disaggregated indicators when evaluating programs. Men's roles in men's roles in women and children's health. Men can influence women's health in numerous ways. As husbands, boyfriends, fathers, brothers, and friends, men can have a positive effect on women's health by preventing the spread of STIs by using condoms consistently and correctly and supporting and encouraging regular condom use by others. Using or supporting the, the use by partners of contraception so that couples are better able to control the number and timing of their children. Supporting women during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. Supporting women to take decisions about their health without reference to their partner. Responding to the physical and emotional needs of women prior to prior to and responding miscarriage, following miscarriage and abortion. Refraining from and insisting other girls avoid and prevent all forms of violence against women and girls. Working to end harmful sexual practices, such as female genital mutilation. Ayo, shout out to female genital mutilation. Go watch my other audiobook about female genital mutilation and, in quotes, dry sex. Sharing financial resources with women and supporting the notion of shared property rights. Supporting women's full participation in civil society, including their access to social, political, and educational opportunities, many of which have a direct or indirect impact on women's health. Supporting the rights of daughters to have the same health care, edu education, and respect as sons. If you're still with me, take a shot. <laughs> I'm drinking bang energy, by the way. It's not alcoholic. I hate alcohol. It's bad. Who should provide sexual and reproductive health services and information to boys and men? I've, been, I've asked myself that very same question. A wide range of people and organizations can provide sexual and reproductive health services and information to boys and men. Some of its key providers are listed below. Parents. Ideally, boys and young men should receive information and basic education on sexual and reproductive health from their parents. However, available data suggests that less than half of boys and young men discuss HIV slash AIDS, STIs, or family planning with their parents. Teachers. Many adolescent boys now receive some education on health, family life, and sexuality in school. However, for some, the instruction comes after they have begun having sexual intercourse. Gulp? Peers. Boys and men of all ages get information on sexual and reproductive issues from their peers. 
Much of this information, however, may be inaccurate. One approach is to educate key youth leaders who can then pass on accurate information to their peers. This has been an ongoing process to reach each new generation of or group of young men. Community-based organizations. Places of worship and youth groups are important sources of information and also provide an opportunity for counseling and skill building in relation to sexuality. Method taught for, for preventing STIs for pregnancy and STIs is sexual abstinence. Despite the fact that young people find it difficult to adhere to abstinence, hey oh, I'll say, as a result, they may, they may not know how to protect themselves from risk when they become sexually active. Family planning clinics. Some, pe some family planning clinics reach out to men, particularly to the partners of their female clients. The availability of male health care providers and separate consultation sessions for men may encourage men to use these services. Although family planning clinics have a long history of providing both medical and counseling services, many men see them as being only for women. Equally, some providers may be uncomfortable serving men. Youth-friendly services. Some countries have developed programs that specially address the needs of young people, either through special youth-friendly services or by making existing services more welcome and acceptable to young people. Such programs are an important way of reaching young men who often feel excluded from family planning and other reproductive health services. STI clinics. These facilities have a long experience addressing sexual health matters, and many men are comfortable seeking services in such settings. However, STI clinics tend to focus on treatment and secondary prevention. Primary prevention of STIs must, therefore, be addressed through, the, through other mechanisms. HIV services. HIV testing and counseling centers can also provide counseling on sexual and reproductive health. If such centers are integrated within primary health care services, if they can also provide some sexual and reproductive health services. Facilities providing care for patients with HIV infection and AIDS also have a role to play in promoting sexual and reproductive health for men, women, and young people. Physicians, clinical officers, and nurses and other healthcare professionals. Healthcare professionals play a critical role, not just as healthcare providers, but also as educators and counselors. Urologists and other specialists commonly deal with certain aspects of male sexual and reproductive health, such as diagnosing and treating prostate cancer and performing circumcision or vasectomy. Primary care physicians treat large numbers of men for their genital health needs, general health needs, but may not have the necessary training to provide comprehensive sexual and reproductive health education and services, or be comfortable doing so. Staff providing male circumcision services should be trained to educate and counsel men on their sexual and reproductive health, and should take the time to do this. Male circumcision provides circumcision services provide a unique opportunity to teach men with education and counseling about sexual and reproductive health. Detection and treatment of selected male sexual and reproductive health problems. Some common reproductive health problems are described below. below. Sexually transmitted infections. More than 20 species of micro, microorganisms are known to be transmissible through sexual intercourse. STIs in men include gonorrhea, gonorrhea chlamydial infection. This is the commonest cause of non gonococcal urethritis, balanitis caused by candida albicans, trichomoniasis, chancroid, soft chanchir, syphilis, lymphogranuloma venerum, granulo granuloma inguinal donovanosis, genital, herpy, her genital herpes, Genital warts, Con condylomata acuminata. The most common symptom of an STI is pain on urination, a burning sensation in the penis, or an ulcer on the genitals. Male patients who complain of urethral discharge or pain when passing urine should be examined for evidence of a discharge. If none is seen, their urethra should be gently massaged from a ventral part of the penis towards the metis. Examination of a urethral smear under a microscope may show an increased number of polymorphonuclear 
leukocytes in men, a finding of more than five polymorphonuclear leukocytes per high power field times 1,000, is an indicate is indicative of urethritis. A gram stain may demonstrate the presence of gonococci. If urethral discharge of a genital ulcer is confirmed, the patient should be managed according to local treatment guidelines and procedures, syndromic approach. For both conditions, non-medically indicated male circumcision should be performed until the condition has been satisfactorily resolved. Balanitis. Balanitis is an inflammation of the foreskin and the glands of the penis. The condition occurs most often in men and boys who have been not been who have not been circumcised and have poor personal hygiene, the inflammation can occur if the sensitive area inside of the foreskin is not washed regularly. Symptoms of balanitis include redness of, or swelling, itching, rash, pain, and foul-smelling discharge. Factors that predispose or cause balanitis include phimosis. This is a condition in which foreskin is too tight to be retracted. Dead skin cells, smegma, a white substance excreted by small glands around the corona of the gland's penis, and bacteria accumulate under the foreskin. It is difficult to keep this area clean, and inf inflammation can easily develop. Dermatitis. This is an inflammation on the skin with irritation, itching, and rash, often caused by an irritating substance or an allergic reaction to chemicals in certain products, such as soaps, detergents, perfumes, and spermicides. Infection with yeast, candida, albicans, can result in an itchy, spotty rash. Certain sexually transmitted infections, including gonorrhea, herpes, and syphilis, can produce symptoms of balanitis. In addition, men with diabetes are at greater risk of balanitis. Glucose, sugar, in the urine that is trapped under the foreskin serves as a breeding ground for bacteria. Treatment for balanitis. Treatment for balanitis depends on the underlying cause. If there is an infection, treatment should be include an appropriate antibiotic or antifungal medication, according to national guidelines. In cases of severe or persistent inflammation, or if there is a difficulty retracting the foreskin, circumcision is usually recommended. If the diagnosis or treatment of balanitis is uncertain, the patient should be referred to a higher level of care. Maintaining good personal hygiene can help prevent balanitis. In addition, may, the patient should be advised to avoid strong soaps or chemicals, especially those known to cause a skin reaction. Now, another thing to note, we are officially past page 30, so what does that make us, like, one-sixth of the way through this PDF? Congratulations on making it this far. Bimosis. Bimosis is a condition in which the foreskin of the penis is so tight that it cannot be pulled back, retracted from the head of the penis, figure 2.2. Now, that's interesting and all, but I wish there was a, a picture that went along with it. Well, what do you know? Fig figure 2.2. By most of showing that the foreskin cannot be retracted at erection. Reproduced with permission from www.netterimage.com, image number 1468. You know what? That image definitely does show that the foreskin cannot be retracted at erection. Causes of phimosis. Phimosis can occur at any age and may be present at birth. It may be caused by an infection, balanitis, or by scar tissue formed as a result of injury or chronic inflammation. A tight phimosis can interfere with urination, resulting in a thin urinary stream. In extreme cases, urine may collect between the foreskin and the glands, causing ballooning of the foreskin. In this situation, an urgent circumcision is necessary, usually using the dorsal slit method. Ooh, that sounds like uh, foreshadowing. Treatment for phimosis. If seen at a peripheral health facility, adult patients with phimosis should be referred to a higher level of care for proper assessment and treatment. This will usually involve circumcision. Paraphimosis. Paraphimosis occurs when the retracted foreskin cannot be put back in place because of the swelling, figure 2.3. This usually occurs when the penis is erect and during sexual intercourse. The retracted foreskin swells and tightens around the penis. This tightening, in turn, causes more swelling. Men with paraphimosis should be referred to the district hospital for emergency treatment. If left untreated, the condition can result in serious complications, such as skin loss and infection. In extreme cases, it can result in loss of the penis. Now, if only there was a picture of that. Well, what do you know? Figure 2.3. A tight band of foreskin constricts the shaft of the penis. The foreskin is swollen with... 
Odema Beyond the Band, reproduced with permission from www.netterimages.com, and this is image number 1468. Not only is there a drawn image, there is also a real image. Thanks for that. Treatment of paraphimosis. Treatment depends on how long the paraphimosis has been present. For acute paraphimosis, wrap the swollen area in gauze and a and apply increasing pressure on the on, on the gauze to squeeze the tissue field, oedema out of the penis. This may take 10 to 15 minutes. Once the fluid has been squeezed out, it is usually possible to replace the foreskin over the glands. Circumcision can be can then be done as a planned procedure a few days later. If this procedure fails, or in cases of a chronic paraphimosis, the man should be sent to the nearest surgical referral center. Urinary tract infections. Ooh, if you're still with me, take a shot. Ooh, my can is almost empty. <sighs> Urinary tract infections are infrequent in adult men, but more frequent in children and older men. Usually, there is an underlying cause, for example, kidney or bladder stones. Symptoms include frequent urge to urinate, pain and a burning feeling in the area of the bladder or urethra during urination, dysuria, feeling tired, shaky, and weak, malaise. Feeling pain in the bladder or urethra even when not urinating. Passing only a small amount of urine despite an intense urge to urinate. Milky or cloudy urine. Sometimes urine may be reddish, indicating that blood is present. Fever, suggesting that the infection has reached the kidneys. Pain in the back or side below the ribs. Nausea. Vomiting. Urinary tract infections in men should be distinguished from urethral discharge caused by an STI. A patient with a urinary tract infection should be told to drink plenty of water starting immediately. He should also be given an, appropri given an appropriate. Men and boys with recurrent urinary tract infection or who do not respond to treatments at the first level of care should be referred to for further investigations. Infertility. Between 60 and 80 million couples around the world are infertile, and most of them live in developing countries. Infertility is defined as a failure to conceive after at least 12 months of unprotected vaginal intercourse. A large proportion of cases of infertility in developing countries are attributable to STIs, which can damage the fallopian tubes in women and obstruct the sperm ducts in men, particularly when left untreated. Reproductive, tracts men, reproductive tract infections in men can affect can affect the prostate prostatitis, prostatitis, the epididymis, epididymitis, and the testes, or chitis. In many societies, childlessness is highly stigmatizing, and the couple's emotional response to their infertility is often exacerbated by family, peer, and media pressure. Frequently, the female partner is considered responsible for the fail year to conceive, commonly resulting in marital tension, divorce, polygamy, or ostracism. However, a, a, a World Health Organization investigation of 5,800 infertile couples found that reduced male reproductive capacity was a, contri was a contributory factor in at least 50% of infertile couples. In, over, in order to provide more efficient, systematic, and cost-effective care for infertile couples and to provide the accuracy of diagnosis, healthcare providers managed an infertile couple should ensure that all essential information is collected. The World Health Organization Man Manual for the Standardized Investigation and Diagnosis of the Infertile Couple provides clear guidelines and a logical sequence for of steps for clinicians to follow in evaluating both partners in an infertile couple. References. Counseling and Testing, Geneva, Joint Uni United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, http colon backslash backslash www.unaids.org slash en slash policies slash testing slash default dot ASP. Family Health International, Men and Reproductive Health, Network 1998, 18 3, 6. Lovich, Role of Men in Their Lives of Their Children, New York, UNICEF, 1997. Looking at Men's Sexual and Reproductive Health Needs, the Guit Macher Report, 2002, 5-2. Kirby D. Emerging Answers, Research Findings on Programs to Reduce Teen Pregnancy, Washington, D.C., National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy, 2001. Behrman P. S. Brucker, Bruckerner, H, Providing the Future, Virginity Pledges, and the Transition to the First Intercourse. P.S. Bruckner, H, Promising the Future. Oh, wait, no. 
um, Intercourse, American Journal of Sociology, 2001, 106, 4, 859 to 912. Cates W. Farley, TMM, Road PJ. Worldwide Patterns of Infertility. Is Africa Different? Lancet, 1985, II, 596 to 598. World Health Organization, WHO, Manual for the Standardized Investigation and Diagnosis of the Infertile Couple, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 1993. Chapter 3, what does that make us? One third of the way through this in chapter-wise, not bad, not bad. Educating and counseling clients and obtaining informed consent. Summary. Group education is used to support counseling services. It also allows clients to be given basic information on sexual and reproductive health, including HIV, before an individual counseling session. Providers of male circumcision services have a duty to A, ensure that voluntary and informed consent is obtained before the procedure is performed, B, maintain confidentiality, and C, provide services without discrimination. Where tradition demands group circumcision for boys, healthcare providers should work with the community to design a way of combining the surgical procedure with education techniques. All counselors need basic counseling and skills in order to talk with clients in a helpful way. Now, let's just take another shot of bang energy to celebrate that we've made it to chapter three. Ooh, almost tapped out. Education about sexual and reproductive health and male circumcision. Hang on. All right, I'm just gonna, gonna take a moment here before we dive into this to just invite my friend to the server, because he deserves to be here too, and I love him. He deserves to be here. Let's just talk about how great it is to be... I'm discussing... Circumcision. We are discussing circumcision here at What Have I Done? All right, now back to the education about sexual and reproductive health and male circumcision. It is 2.30 in the morning. I can't believe I've been going for this long. Bang Energy is a magical mistress. Group education is used to support individual counseling services. It allows clients to be given basic information about male circumcision before an individual counseling session. Counselors can then work with clients and or their parents on specific issues related to male circumcision or sexual and reproductive health in general. Group education allows the first counseling session to be shorter, which is an advantage in busy clinics. The information given to clients during an education session may be differ, differ, may differ slightly from site to site. Counselors should be familiar with the standard education on male circumcision offered at the place where they work so that messages and information given are consistent. In conducting group education on male circumcision, the counselor should include the following main messages. Underline that women and girls, men and boys, have sexual health and reproductive health needs. Explain what male circumcision is. Outline the benefits and risks. And describe how sur the surgical procedure is performed and what happens afterwards. Emphasize that male circumcision does not provide complete protection against HIV AIDS. Explain that circumcised men can become infected and can pass on HIV infection to their sexual partners. God, not the hiccups. Oh, I'm having so much fun. I am at 36. Page 36 of 190. Right? Yeah, right now we are talking about the education about sexual and reproductive health and male circumcision. So... Um, no, this is, um, chapter three. Educating and counseling clients and obtaining informed consent. No, this is not gonna be a two-parter. I'm gonna go- I'm going to go until I either die or finish this. So... I'm- I'm high on bang energy, man. The, like... Ooh, really? Yes, I do want to hear it. Mm-hmm. 
and what might this green pill be? be? Oh shit, man. Dude, that's my political ideology, green apple. That is that is beautiful. That is actually pretty funny, I'm not going to lie. I, that was a much needed pick me up. Yeah, I Yeah, Bang Energy is like basically the legal version of PCP. Like I could probably go out and like kill like 50 Vietnamese children on this. Uh, okay, bye. So we're gonna get back to this. We're describing the service take the service takes to ensure that patient records are kept confidential and provide assurance that confidentiality will be maintained. Discuss the importance of knowing one's HIV status. Include how HIV is transmitted, how a person can protect him or him or herself from HIV infection, and where people with HIV infection can find support. Explain that men with an STI have a greater risk of becoming infected with and transmitting HIV. Emphasize the importance of avoiding HIV infection and outline different ways of reducing the risk of acquiring the infection. Explain that patients with an STI have a greater risk of becoming infertile in the future. Emphasize that only condoms consistently and properly used protect against H STIs, HIV, and unwanted pregnancy. Other methods of contraception, even those that are highly affected in preventing pregnancy, do not protect against STIs, HIV, or possible future infertility. Emphasize that vasectomy is the most effective and permanent method of, of contraception available for men, but that, do, that it does not protect against STIs or HIV. Emphasize that men should treat women as equal partners in decision-making related to sexual and reproductive health. Emphasize that men should support the sexual and reproductive health of women and the well-being of their children, with equal regard for female and male children. Underscore the importance of not perpetrating gender-based violence, especially in against women and girls. Emphasize that responsible men do not force or coerce their partners to have sex against their will. That is known as rape. Group education script. Below is a sample script that shows how a group education session might be conducted. The script should be adapted to the specific situation in the clinic or region. The text in italics contains instructions for the group educator. So I guess instead of reading this, I um, will do it as they, you know, I will do it as an orator. So, opening. Hello, my name is Myla, and I am a practitioner here at this clinic. For some time, we have been aware that the reproductive health needs of men and boys have not been receiving enough attention. At this clinic, we provide the following services for men. Information and education on male circumcision, including the management of post-operative complications. Male circumcision for men and women who choose to have the procedure. Oh no, just for men. I don't know where I got the in women there, but I guess if a woman wanted to get some male circumcision, you know, who's going to stop her? Information and counseling on, on sexual intercourse, safer sex, and health problems related to the reproductive system. Diagnoses of ma and management of sexually transmitted infections, counseling and testing for HIV and AIDS, and referral for care and support. Contraception. Through vasectomy or the use of a condom, condoms will prevent both pregnancy and physical and sexual mat maturity comes with those social responsibilities. These include recognizing that safer sex can prevent STIs and HIV infection. Safer sex includes using condoms the right way every time you have sex, reducing the number of sexual partners, delaying the start of sexual relations, and avoiding penetrative sex. Okay. Um, taking the fun out of it. I'm a, I'm a lame doctor. God damn. Never putting yourself in a situation in which you lose control of your judgment. For example, because you are under the influence of alcohol or drugs. This may lead to behavior that will increase your risk of becoming infected with STIs and HIV, such as having unprotected sex with strangers or multiple sexual partners. Treating women as equal partners in sexual relations and deciding together whether and when to have children. Respecting the sexual and reproductive health rights of girls and women, including the right to refuse sex, both within and outside marriage. Supporting women's sexual and reproductive health. Such support is particularly important during pregnancy. Supporting children's well-being with equal regard for female and male children. Stopping all kinds of violence against women and girls and not forcing or coercing girls to have sex against their will. Again, that is rape. Male circumcision. Okay, just don't be a rapist, okay? Nobody likes a rapist. 
For those of you who are here to find out more about male circumcision, let's talk a bit about that. What is male circumcision? Male circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin of the penis, also called the prep use. It is one of the oldest surgical procedures in history. Male circumcision has been shown to have several health benefits, including a reduced risk of urinary tract infections in childhood, a reduced risk of some sexually transmitted infections, such as herpes and syphilis, Male, um, some protection against cer cancer of the penis, a reduced risk of cervical cancer in female sex partners, prevention of several medical problems of the penis and foreskin, such as inflammation, scarring, and swelling of the foreskin. Some of you may have heard that male circumcision reduces the risk of HIV infection. That is not correct. However, I may must remind you that male circumcision does not Oh, wait, that is correct. Whoops. Does not protect completely against HIV infection. It only reduces the risk of becoming infected by about one half. It is very important to continue using other ways of reducing the risk of infection, using condoms the right way every time you have sex, reducing the number of sexual partners, delaying the start of having sexual relations, and avoiding penetrative sexual intercourse, and avoiding unsafe injections. That's, that's not even sex. That's just heroin. As with any surgical procedure, complications may occur after the operation. However, in our clinic, we do everything we can to reduce this risk. Possible problems include pain, bleeding, swelling of the penis caused by bleeding under the skin, infection of the surgical wound, and increased sensitivity of the exposed head of, a, of the penis glands. On average, if we operate on 50 men or boys, one will need to come back to the clinic for the treatment of complication. However, the problems usually settle down quickly with additional treatment. Many men ask how soon after circumcision sex can be resumed. <laughs> it takes about four to six weeks for the wound to become strong enough to withstand sex, and about three to four months for the wound to heal completely. We advise clients to avoid sex or masturbation for the four, first four to six weeks after circumcision, which, let's face it, fellas, is practically a life sentence, and to use a condom during sex until the wound is completely healed. At least six months, it is always best to use a condom whenever there is any risk of STI or HIV infection. At this clinic, we perform circumcision using local anesthesia to take away the pain of the procedure. Patients can go home the same day, but it is important that they come back for follow-up. Do you have any questions or concerned about male circumcision? I know there are many myths about male circumcision that circulate. For example, some people think that circumcision can cause impotence, failure of erection, or reduce sexual pleasure. Others think that circumcision will cure impotence. Let me assure you that none of these is true. If time permits, other sexual and reproductive health topics can be covered. We'll see Appendix 3.1. Surely, because we have all the time in the world! Summary. We have talked about the different, different services that we offer in this clinic. It is up to you to let us know what services are of interest to you. If you are worried that you may be infected with an STD or HIV, or if you want to be tested, counseling and testing services are available here. If you want to register yourself or your son for circumcision, please let us know. We will be very pleased to assist you in any way you wish. Please take some of the information leaflets we have here. They may answer other questions that you may have. Thank you for your attention. Counseling. Basic facts about counseling. Counseling is not telling clients what to do, criticizing clients, forcing ideas or values on clients, taking responsibility for clients' actions or decisions. Anything that's in a box, that's just the way I'm going to read it. Basic facts about counseling. And then it's to the power of B, which I guess means that's probably like the reference it's referencing. Oh, let's take a shot. There's not much bang energy left in this can. Uh. Oh, it's tapped out. Alright, I'm gonna have to do the rest of this dry. Counseling is a process in which individual communication is used to help people examine personal issues, make decisions, and make plans for taking action. Some types of counseling, the counselor and client talk about whatever the client wishes. In counseling for male circumcision, the counselor, the provider ensures that his child, or if, or if the client is a child, his parents, has all the information he needs to make a decision about undergoing the procedure. HIV counseling concentrates on helping clients reduce their risk of becoming infected with HIV or those already infected, transmitting the virus to others. In family planning counseling, the provider helps the client make an 
clients make an informed decision based on their reproductive intentions and personal situation. Counseling may involve some or all of the following, listening to clients or parents for circumcision in boys who are too young to understand fully the reasons for circumcision and the risks associated with it, or are below the legal age to consent to the operation, respecting clients' needs, values, culture, religion, and lifestyle, talking with clients about the risks and benefits of the service requested, in this case, male circumcision, Answering questions about the male circumcision procedure and correcting any false information. Allowing clients and or their parents to make their own informed decision on whether or not to choose male circumcision. Asking clients questions that help them identify behavior that puts them at risk of STDs and HIV infection, or might do so after circumcision. Helping clients understand the benefits of knowing their HIV status or just knowing the benefits of understanding their HIV status, helping clients understand their HIV or STI test results, helping HIV-negative clients understand that male circumcision does not provide full protection against HIV infection, and suggesting how they can, become, they can stay negative, helping HIV-positive clients find support and treatment services, and discussing ways to avoid transmitting HIV to others, helping clients obtain other services such as family planning, screening, and treatment of, for STIs, and counseling and treatment for alcohol and drug abuse. Confidentiality. Confidentiality is an important characteristic of all sexual and reproductive health services. Counselors should keep all client information private and allow clients to decide when and with whom to discuss their sexual and reproductive health problems. Clients will feel more comfortable about having personal information with counselors and being tested for STIs or HIV if they know that this information will remain secret. This also applies when the client's main interest in male circumcision when the client's main interest is male circumcision. An atmosphere of trust will encourage clients to discuss other sexual and reproductive health needs. Another reason why confidentiality is so important is that many, many people have negative feelings about STIs, S, S, HIV, AIDS, and, and sexual health concerns. I, you know what? I have negative feelings about STIs. I'm going to be honest. I'm just going to put that out there. This is a strong social pressure to conform and considerable social stigma is associated with behaviors or conditions per perceived as unusual. Sometimes healthcare workers at a clinic need to know a client's HIV status. This happens, for example, when a client is sick and the best treatment depends on knowing whether the person is HIV positive or HIV negative. And the counselor should tell the client about his possibility during counseling. An HIV test is recommended for all clients rec requesting circumcision, but is not required for the operation to go ahead. Male circumcision can be safely performed in men whose HIV status is unknown and in those whose H with HIV infection, provided that they are clinically healthy. However, except in some rare cases where Circumcision is necessary to correct a health problem or the glands of a foreskin in a man with HIV infection. There are no medical or public health reasons to perform circumcision in men with HIV infection. HIV testing of clients before circumcision is not necessary to protect the clinic or surgical staff during the operation. It is, not, it is important that the clinic applies high infection control standards, including proper implementation of universal precautions to minimize the risk of transmission of HIV and other infections to care to healthcare workers of other patients. Universal precautions are discussed to, in full in Chapter 8. Whew, chapter 8 is a long ways away, let me tell you. Counseling skills. All counselors need basic, certain basic counseling skills in order to talk with clients in a helpful way. Some of these skills are explained below. Empathizing. Empathy is the ability to see the world through another person's eyes and understand how that person feels. Counselors should listen to a clients carefully and show them that they understand without judging. Empathy is not sympathy. It is not feeling sorry for the client. Empathy is understanding the client's feelings. Example, an adolescent says to the counselor, my girlfriend keeps asking me to go for circumcision. I feel embarrassed and angry. Counselor's empathetic response. So you often feel irritated, uncomfortable, and pressured by your girlfriend. This must be difficult for you. <laughs> I love how in these, um, like... Um, like documents for like describing like like um, procedures like genital procedures they always have like the like just in case you are also socially inept this is how you talk to somebody who you're about to like cut off their foreskin active listening 
Active listening involves paying attention to what a client says and does in a way that shows respect, interest, and empathy. Active listening is more than just a hearing what clients say. It is paying attention to the content of the message, as well as the client's feeling and worries that show through his movements, tone of voice, facial expressions, and posture. Example, the client looks very nervous and is biting his nails, but tells the, the counselor he's fine. Counselor, sometimes when we think we are relaxed, we can still feel quite anxious inside. I see you are biting your nails. Perhaps something is bothering you that you do not know how to express. Do you have any idea what that might be? Open questioning. Open questions are questions that require more than one word answers. They usually begin with words such as how, what, or why. Open questions encourage clients to express their feelings and share information about their situation. Examples. Why have you decided to come for male circumcision? How do you think circumcision can reduce your risk of STI or HIV infection? What do you think, what do you think, what do you do that maybe make it possible for you to get infected with an STI or HIV? What are you currently doing to protect yourself against STIs and HIV? How is this working? Probing. Probing is using questions to help clients express themselves more clearly. Probing is necessary when the counselor needs more information about the client's feelings or situation. Asking a probing question is a good way to follow up a situation that has been answered by a yes or no. Example, can you tell me more about that? How do you feel about that? focusing <laughs> these these are some these are some brand new tips next time i uh cut off someone's foreskin i'm going to be using these clients are often overwhelmed by emotional or personal problems related to their particular sexual reproductive health problems i'm out of being and i'm already yawning this may they may want to address all issues at once if clients start to talk about problems or situations that will be discussed later in the session the counselor may want to bring the topic of discussion back in the current issue Example, at the beginning of the first counseling session, the client may begin to talk about the most recent situation when he may have been exposed to HIV. He asks about where and how he can get condoms. The counselor does not want to interrupt the flow of the discussion, so says using condoms is an excellent way to redu reduce your risk of getting an STI or HIV infection. We can talk about that in a few minutes. Right now, let's continue talking about your HIV situation. If the client wants to talk about other emotional or personal issues, such as problems at home or a partner's drug use problems, the counselor should help the client find appropriate support. Affirming. Affirming is congratulating or com complimenting the clients on the positive actions that they have taken. It is important to encourage success. Complimenting clients helps make them feel respected and valued and encourages them to try other changes to reduce the risk of HIV infection. It may also make them more willing to share information about other actions they may have taken. Example. Client, I recently started using condoms each time I have sex. Counselor, that's a really positive step in protecting yourself against HIV and sexually transmitted infections. Well done. Clarifying. Counselors clarify in order to, s to make sure that they understand a client's statement or questions. Clarifying also helps the client understand his own situation or feelings better and identify uncertainty or, in or conflict between his thoughts and behavior. Example. Client, my partner gave me gonorrhea. <laughs> I'm afraid of getting HIV, but I also think that if I use condoms when I have sex with her, she'll think I am not faithful. Cou counselor, help her understand this. You are afraid you might get HIV from your partner, but you do not want to use condoms with her. Pointing out a conflict may help client identify which of the two issues is more important to him. It is better than the counselor telling the client to do something that he is not ready to accept. Clarifying also helps clients make their own choices and draw their own conclusions. Say, uh, help me understand this is a good way to begin this type of discussion. Correcting false information. It is important to provide correct information to clients and to correct any myths about false and false information. There are many incorrect rumors about HIV, AIDS, and sexually transmitted infections, male circumcision, and vasectomy. These should be corrected. However, this needs to be done in a sensitive way without making the client feel stupid or defensive. Counselors should acknowledge false information and then correct it quickly. It is not necessary to give detailed explanations. Example, you mentioned that it is possible to cure HIV by having sex with a child or virgin. Oh, this is by the counselor. Many people believe this, but it is untrue. Firstly, sex with a child is wrong and is a crime. Second, it is no benefit to you. At present, there is no cure for HIV or AIDS. 
Third, and most important, you are likely to transmit the virus to the child. Counselor, you mentioned that you want to have a circumcision in order to prevent you from getting HIV from your multiple sexual partners. I think you need to know that male circumcision does not fully protect a man against HIV infection. Circumcised men who do not use protection or who engage in risky sexual behavior are more likely to contract a HIV infection than circumcised men who practice safer sex. Having sex with multiple partners certainly is risky behavior. You can reduce your risk of HIV infection by cutting down on your number of sexual partners, avoiding full sexual intercourse, penetrative sex, and using condoms correctly every time you have sex. Summarizing. Counselors summarize in order to present the main points of a conversation to the client. Summarizing can be useful when moving to another topic or ending the session, and make sure the counselor and client have understood each other correctly. Summarizing also helps clients see the whole picture better and understand the situation. Ex example, counselor, we have discussed several ways in which you can reduce your risk of getting infected with an STI or HIV. For example, you seem comfortable with starting to use condoms during sex and drinking less alcohol when you go out with friends. You have many choices and we will develop a specific plan later. Firstly, let's talk about HIV testing because your plan could change depending on your test result. Informed consent for surgery. General. Clients or parents, in the case of a child, must give informed consent before a circumcision is performed. Healthcare providers should give clients all information they need to make a fully informed decision. The following elements should be included. Provide information. Clients or parents should be given an explanation in plain language of male circumcision and the nature of the surgery. They should be informed about the risk and benefits of the procedure and other ways that can reduce the risk of HIV infection. They should also know that they can choose not to be circumcised. Assess whether the client understands the information provided. Assess the capacity of the client to make the necessary decisions. Damn, okay, that's throwing some serious shade. Assure the client that he is free to choose whether or not to be circumcised. If there is any suggestion that the client is not ready to provide consent, advise him to reflect on it for a few days. Ask clients who decide to undergo circumcision to sign a consent document. The goal of this consent process is to ensure that the clients or parents understand the surgical procedure. At the same time, they should be given the opportunity to make use of, of other sexual and reproductive health services. The goal of the consent process is to ensure that the clients or parents understand the surgical procedure. At the same time, they should be given the opportunity to make sure uh, make use of their sexual and reproductive health services. Only clients who have appropriate decision-making capacity and legal status can give their informed consent to medical care, where a child, usually defined as a person under the age of, of majority in the national law, lacks the legal status required to provide, a, to provide independent informed consent or lacks the capacity to appreciate the risks and benefits of association with the procedure, written consent based on full information must be obtained from the parent or legal guardian. The parent or legal guardian should make sure the decision according to the best interest of a child, of the child. Children nevertheless have a right to participate in decisions affecting their health according to the evolving, their evolving capacities. Even where the law does not allow the child to give his own consent, providers of circumcision should allow the risks and benefits to the child in a way appropriate to his capacity. If the child has sufficient ca capacity, he should be given the opportunity to give or withhold assent to the procedure. Ugh. Adolescent boys. Ooh. Get, get Catholics, get, it, get ready for this one. You're going to like this. Oops. Where... Okay, there we go. Male circumcision is often performed during adolescence or early adulthood. It is important that healthcare workers know how to respond to an adolescent boy's request for circumcision in a way that responds confidentia conf that respects confidentiality, but does not put the healthcare worker in conflict with the law. Healthcare workers need to know what the law says about con consent for minors. They need to know at what age, in what circumstances, minors can legally make an independent decision to seek clinical or mon medical services without the agreement of their parents or guardian. The age at which an adolescent is allowed to give his own consent may differ, may differ for appropriate procedures. For example, in some countries, an adolescent may be able to consent to be tested for HIV or receive condoms at a younger age than at which he consent, can consent to circumcision. The Ministry of Health and National Medical or Nursing Association should be able to provide the information on national rules and regulations. <laughs> Adolescent boys who are mature enough to appreciate the risks and benefits associated with a medical procedure such as circumcision or HIV testing 
should not be allowed to to should not should not be subjected to the procedure without their informed consent, whether or not parental consent is required by law. All health services provided to adolescents should be confidential, where the law allows minors to provide independent information consent. Providers must ensure that information is not disclosed to the parents without the child's consent. Children are more likely to use a service that are friendly and supportive, provide a, provide a wide range of services and information, are geared to their needs, give them the opportunity to participate in decisions affecting their health, are accessible, affordable, confidential, and non-judgmental, do not require parental consent, and are not discriminatory. Committee on the Rights of the Child, General Com Comment number three, HIV slash AIDS and the, right of the, ch the Rights of the Child, 32nd Session, January 2003, UN document CRC GC 2003-3, PARA 20. Healthcare workers should be guided in their response of at to adolescents by human rights principles. All adolescents have a right to use health services. Healthcare workers should act in the best interests of the adolescent with an understanding of his evolving capabilities and ability to make independent decisions. In some situations, healthcare workers may, may need to judge whether or not an adolescent has the maturity to request and consent to circumcision, independent of his parent or guardian. Circumcision is an opportunity to make contact with adolescent boys, whoa, okay, and provide them with an information and, and counseling about their own sexual and reproductive health and that of their current or future partners. Adequate time should be given to allow the, for counseling before and after the operation. Adolescents should be, given, should be advised that this is important to return after the procedure for a health checkup and further counseling to informa and information on condom use and other aspects of sexual and reproductive health. Documenting ins informed consent for surgery. The circumcision team should ensure that the client has been informed about the risks and benefits of male circumcision, as the information has been given in an understandable way using everyday local language. The oral information should be backed up by written information sheets in the local language. See, sample, see the sample information sheet for adult and adolescent clients in Appendix 3.2. After receiving the information, the client should be allowed to ask questions. He should then be given the time to reflect before being asked to sign and cons the consent documents. See the sample certificate of consent for adults and adolescents in Appendix 3.3. Circumcision. Circumcision can be performed with the least physical risk on infants when counseling parents who have been offered or have requested the to explain all of the associated benefits and risks any benefits with regard to preventing hiv infection will be realized with only many years in the future when the child becomes sexually active parents or guardians should use the information they are given to evaluate what is in the best interest of the child they may also wish to consider cultural and religious factors in research in reaching a fully informed decision. More information in count on counseling parents who wish to have their baby circumcised is given on Chapter 6. <sighs> Integration of traditional circumcision events with clinical circumcision. In some communities, groups of boys are circumcised at the same time by a traditional circumciser who uses a traditional technique without anesthesia. The group activity cons cons coincides with the rites of passage from adolescence to adulthood and often takes place in circumcision camps or ceremonies. The event us is usually both festive and educational for the par participants of in the community. The goals are to acknowledge the boy's physical and emotional maturity and readiness to face the challenges of adulthood, as well as to support him during the, the painful circumcision procedure. In the camps, young boys attend various civic education classes facilitated by the traditional circumciser, community leaders, or event organizers. As essentially, they are taught how to behave as men. Some parents prefer to have their son circumcised individually. They may take the boy to a hospital or clinic, then have a healthcare provider perform a medical circumcision under local anesthesia. If they choose to have the boy circumcised at home, they may engage with an either they may engage either a nurse or a traditional circumciser. They may also specify which technique they prefer. The increased technique, the increased interest in medical circumcision in communities with a culture Traditional circumcision provides an opportunity to integrate appropriate follow-up. There are many reports of high complication rates following circumcision ceremonies and circumcisions performed 
perform performed by traditional providers. Safety can be improved by introducing the medical circumcision in traditional ceremonies or by performing the circumcision under local anesthesia at a clinic separate from the link to the traditional ceremony. Educational topics for a circum during a circumcision event may include the following. Physical and psychological changes that occur in boys and girls during adolescence, sexuality and gender issues, male and female sexual reproductive health and rights, sexually transmitted infections, HIV infection, safer sex practices, correct and consistent use of condoms, reducing the number of sexual partners, delaying the start of sexual relations, and avoiding penetrative sex, family planning, Substance use, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, violence, including gender-based violence, community expectations of men, goal setting and decision making, health institutions that want to organize group circumcision events should do so in partnership with traditional circumcisers and community. A joint education program can be drawn up under shared responsibility. The decision to circumcise boys in camps will depend on resources, customs, and traditions in the community. A mobile outreach service during the holidays is a convenient way to reach many boys and their parents. Whichever approach is adopted, it's the quality of the clinical circumcision should be ensured in order to build and maintain confidence in the community regarding the safety and advisability of medical circumcision. Appendix 3.1. Additional script for counseling on reproductive health. HIV testing and counseling. You've all probably heard of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. We do not talk about it much in the community, but we are going to talk about it here because it is important to your health. HIV is increasing all over the world. How many of us know family me members or friends who have HIV or have died from illnesses related to HIV and AIDS? During this session, I will give you some basic information about HIV and AIDS and how being tested for HIV can be beneficial to you, your partner, family, and community. You will also learn about the relationship between male circumcision and HIV infection. I will also tell you about services that are available locally, especially about the counseling and testing services that are offered here at the circumcision facility. We will also talk about family planning. HIV testing is recommended for individuals who are at risk of HIV infection, for example, by having unprotected sexual intercourse with an, a with an HIV-infected person or someone whose HIV status is unknown. Using non-sterile needles to inject drugs is another risk for HIV. For those who are tested and find out they have HIV, here are medicines that help them stay healthy longer and may reduce the risk of of infecting others with HIV. People living with HIV here are, have the same rights as anyone else. Discrimination against people living with HIV is against the law. There are organizations such as blank that can provide legal and other types of support for people with HIV infection. I guess that was just a edit in later when we find one. While medicines do not provide answers to all of our problems in dealing with HIV, they do allow people with HIV to live longer, healthier, and productive lives. Before going into detail about the services we offer, here are a few facts about HIV and AIDS. The difference between HIV and AIDS. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. It is the virus that causes AIDS. HIV is a slow-acting virus and it is possible for a person to be infected with HIV for many years without knowing it or feeling ill. AIDS is a condition caused by HIV. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Immune Deficiency Syndrome means that the immune system that which protects your body from an infection does not function properly. AIDS develops because HIV weakens the body's defense system. There is no cure for HIV infection, but medicines are available that can help prevent other infections in people who are living with HIV. Other medicines can slow down the virus and help HIV-related people stay healthy longer. The increasing availability of medicines and other resources to support people with means that that more and more include more and more people with HIV infection can live a full and productive life, including a healthy sexual life. Country statistics on HIV. Here are some information on HIV infections in our country and region. Share with the group recent national statistics on the prevalence of HIV and the numbers of clients with HIV in antenatal and STI clinics. How HIV is transmitted. HIV is transmitted through unprotected sexual intercourse, vaginal or anal, with a person who has HIV infection. 
through infected transfused blood or blood products, or by using needles that have an, that an HIV-infected person has already used for injecting drugs, body piercing, or tattoo, and formed from an infected mother to her baby during pregnancy and childbirth and through breath, breast milk. HIV is not transmitted through mosquito bites, everyday contacts, sharing workplace or home utensils, hugging or kissing. Sexually transmitted infections. Sexually transmitted infections are quite common in our country. Community. The most common STIs are syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and herpes. It is important that these infections are promptly diagnosed and treated in order to avoid complications such as infertility. Men should be responsive to requests from STI clinics and come for testing if their spouse or partner is diagnosed with an STI. Treatment of both partners is an important element of STI control in the family and community at large. Having a sexually transmitted infection, especially one that causes sores or ulcers on the genital area, increases the risk of getting HIV by up to five times. People living with HIV are more likely to infect others when they also have an STI. Sounds like a zombie movie. Individuals with a sexually transmitted infection should carefully consider the benefits of HIV testing. Preventing HIV infection and reducing risk behavior. A person may be infected to HIV once or many times before he or she becomes infected. The more often exposure occurs, the more likely a person is to become infected. Most people do not know their HIV status or whether they have been infected and may continue to behave in a way that puts them at risk or of infection or risks giving others HIV to others. HIV infection can be avoided by avoiding penetrative sexual intercourse, by having only one partner, who is HIV negative and faithful by using condoms the right way every time you have sex and by only using clean needles for injections. Correct and consistent condom use prevents not only HIV, but also other sexually transmitted infections, thereby protecting future fertility and unwanted pregnancy. When, when used correctly every time, condoms are an excellent method of family planning and help prevent the spread of HIV and other STIs. Reducing the risk of getting infected by HIV. Do you know of which ways in Do you know of ways in which people can reduce the risk of getting infected with HIV? Add to participants' suggestions: not having sex with high-risk partners, talking to a partner about testing, having HIV concerns with a partner or friend, decreasing alcohol or drug use, increasing condom use, avoiding places where you often have high-risk behavior, abstaining from sex, avoiding penetrative sex. Correctly be using condoms every time until you and your partner have been tested, etc. Try to think of some ways you could personally decrease your risk of getting infected with HIV. When you think about some ways you can reduce the risk of getting infected with HIV, share them with someone you trust, such as a close friend. Now I will do you the, the now I will show you the proper demonstration of a condom. Include a common demonstration here if appropriate. Use models and participants to show some demonstrations themselves. HIV testing. Our HIV testing facilities off our health facilities offer HIV testing and counseling. Each person has the right to choose whether or not to be tested for HIV. Before you make a decision about HIV testing, you will have the chance to talk with a counselor about your specific situation which with regard to STI and HIV infection, and about which ways to reduce your risk of getting infected. The test results shows your HIV status as of three months earlier. If you became infected in the three months before your test, it may not have detected. For this reason, some people will need to be restored. And with that, we have made it to the 51st page in the book the pdf so what does that make us just a little bit a little bit more than than halfway through um it is what 311 and i'm tired i'm going to finish the rest of this later mm, we're at page Fifty. Oh, great. 
getting back. For example, if you had unprotected sex in May and were tested in June, you may want to be tested again in August. A positive HIV test means you have been in means you have been infected with HIV. It does not mean you have AIDS, and it does not tell us when you were infected or when you will get sick. A negative HIV test means you have not been infected with HIV or were infected too recently for the test to detect your infection. Share information on how to remain HIV negative. If you are ill with signs and symptoms of HIV infection, medical staff will recommend an HIV test in order to determine the best way of treating and helping you. Only relevant if the country has adopted a national policy of provider-initiated testing and counseling at all contacts with healthcare services. It is the policy of our country to routinely offer an HIV test for all people who come to healthcare services, even if it is for reasons not linked to the HIV infection. This policy has been adopted to encourage more and more people to know their HIV status. Those who are infected with HIV will then be able to take better care of themselves, their partners, and their family members for those who are not, for those who are not infected. A negative test will be a strong motivation to remain free from HIV infection and can reinforce good practices that reduce the risk of infection. Here is how the testing works at our facility. Describe the testing process at your clinic. Emphasize the confidentiality of test results. Medicines. In this facility, medicines are available to slow down the progression of HIV infection to AIDS and therefore prolong life. Medicines are safe to take. Discuss the medicines that are available in your country for people who test positive and how to get them. Contraception for men. Two methods of male contraception are available in this clinic. Temporary method, male condoms, and a permanent method, male sterilization or physectomy. The male condom is suitable for those wanting to space, space pregnancies to protect themselves against STIs and HIV and preserve their future fertility. In fact, the condom is the only method that pro both prevents pregnancy and provides protection against HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. <clears throat> Vasectomy is a surgical procedure in which the tubes, vas deferens, that transport sperm cells from the testes to the penis are cut and tied off. Show drawing of male reproductive system to illustrate vasectomy. No, they're not. Vasectomy is a permanent method of contraception and should be used only by men who are very sure that they do not want to have more children. You'll still need to use a condom to protect yourself against STIs, including HIV. Vasectomy is done in this clinic as an outpatient under the local anesthesia. That means that patients go home the same day. Vasectomy does not change a man's ability to have erections and does not interfere with sexual intercourse. Does anyone have any questions or concerns? <sighs> Appendix 3.2 Sample information sheet for adult and adolescent clients. Normal anatomy. The head. Glands of the penis is covered by a fold of skin, foreskin. As the penis becomes erect, the skin withdraws freely so that the head of the penis is fully exposed. In fig figment uh, digraph diagram A, we have foreskin covering the head of the penis, scrotum, or bag <laughs> containing the testicles. This is a normal circumcised, uh, uncircumcised penis. And then in, fig in diagram B, we have the glands or head of the penis, and the urethral meatus opening of the urinary passage should be at the tip of the penis, and this is a normal circumcised penis. What is circumcision? Circumcision is surgical removal of the foreskin. It is an ancient practice that has its origin in religious and traditional rites. Many parents have their sons circumcised for religious reasons. More and more men are now choosing circumcision for health and hygiene region reasons. Who will do the operation? A specially trained member of the circumcision team will do the operation. Is circumcision a painful operation? Normally, circumcision is done with a local anesthetic. This is given by injection through the skin near the base of the penis. Although you will be awake during the operation, you will not feel it being done. And the local anesthetic wears off after an operation. It is usual to feel some discomfort. This can be reduced by taking pain-relieving tablets. <clears throat> For some clients, it is preferable to do the operation in a hospital under general anesthesia rather than a clinic. Effects of circumcision. After the operation, the head of the penis is exposed all the time. The skin on the shaft, the penis is left intact. In adults, it is left slightly loose to allow some allow skin for erection. The penis looks different, and this may take some getting used to. It takes 
Some months for the stitch marks to fade completely. <laughs> Benefits of circumcision. <laughs> There is more and more evidence that men who are circumcised have a lower risk of catching HIV infection. In countries where most men are circumcised, the number of people with HIV is much lower than in countries where most men are not circumcised. However, the use of condoms is, best, is the best form of protection. Other ways of reducing the risk of acquiring HIV infection include that of not having sex and reducing the number of sexual partners. Sexual behavior remains the most important factor in HIV transmission. Avoiding multiple sexual partners and high-risk sexual behavior and always using condoms reduce substantially the risk reduce substantially the risk of acquiring or transmitting HIV. Circumcision also reduces the risk of some other sexually transmitted infections, such as herpes and genital ulcers. Sometimes circumcision is performed for medical reasons, such as when the foreskin is too tight to be pulled back from the glands. After circumcision, it is much easier to wash the head of the penis and keep it clean. Problems and complications after the operation. Immediate problems. Some swelling and discomfort can be expected after the operation, but this normally gets better after the first day or two. No special treatment is needed. One of the possible complications of circumcision is bleeding or accumulation of blood under the skin. That is because the skin of the penis is less tight than other parts of the body and has a very good blood supply. If a large blood clot forms, it is sometimes necessary to perform another small operation to remove it. If this happens, it may be necessary to stay in the hospital for a few days and rest for a week or two. The wound can become infected, particularly in men with diabetes. The operation is performed in sterile conditions, but the penis is an area that is not as clean as other parts of the body. The first signs of infection are increasing pain, redness, and swelling at the site of the operation. If this happens, you should return to a cl the clinic for a follow-up, as antibiotic treatment may be needed. Antibiotics are not given routinely, and antibiotic ointment should not be used unless given to you by a nurse or a doctor. The actual risk of having a complication such as bleeding infection is about one in every 50 men who have the operation. If you are unable to pass urine or have difficulty in doing so, you should return to the client for assessment. Most men get erections during the night while sleeping. If this occurs after the circumcision operation, you may experience some minor discomfort because of pulling on the stitches. This is nothing to worry about. Other complications. Occasionally, the head of the penis may remain very sensitive after the operation. The increased sensitivity will become less over the first few weeks as the skin of the glands becomes slightly thicker. Instructions to follow before the operation. Please bring a pair of well-fitting, clean underpants to wear after the operation. They will hold the wound dressing in place for the first day or two. A day or two after the operation, once the dressing has been removed, it is better to wear loose underwear. At, on the morning of the operation, wash the genital area in the penis carefully with water and mild soap, giving special attention to the area under the foreskin. If you have long pubic hair, it's a good idea to clip this with scissors before the operation, so that it does not interfere with the dressing that will be put on it after the circumcision. There is no need to shave your pubic hair in advance of the operation. You will be more comfortable if you empty your bladder before the operation. Instructions to follow after the operation. In the first three days after the operation, it is helpful to avoid strenuous physical activity and rest at home. Lying on your back means that the penis is at its highest point in your body, and this takes the pressure off the area. However, you should, not, you should also walk about regularly, for example, to get meals or visit the toilet. You should not ride a bicycle for the first five days after the operation. Keep the area of the operation dry for 24 hours. Keep the area clean. Do not use any antiseptic cream, ointment, or any other substance. If clean water is available, wash carefully twice a day in a shower or sits bath. Warm water taken in the sitting position in which the hips and buttocks are in the water. Do not remove the bandage until told to do so by the clinic staff. Circumcision is the circumcision wound is closed with an absorbable stitches. These dissolve by themselves and it is not necessary to return to the clinic to have them removed. You should return to the clinic if any of the following occurs. Continued bleeding from the wound. Formation of a large blood clot under the skin near the site of the operation. Pain. You will feel some pain when the local anesthetic wears off, but this should diminish after the first few hours. However, if the pain comes back, return to the clinic. Swelling. After the procedure, some swelling is normal and return to, and return to normal over the first few days. If the swelling gets worse, return to the clinic. 
discharge of fluid or pus, this may indicate infection. Avoid any sport or other strenuous activity for four to six weeks. The healing process will be well advanced after seven days, but it takes four to six weeks for the wound to become strong. Full healing takes longer three to four months, it is best to avoid sexual intercourse or masturbation for the first four to six weeks after circumcision. It is very important to use a condom during sexual intercourse to protect the healing wound for at least six months after the operation. It is always wise to use a condom whenever there is any risk of STI or HIV infection. Contact number for emergencies. Appendix 3.3, Sample Certificate of Consent for Adults and Adolescents. My name is, and write this in block capitals. I am asking you to do a circumcision operation, removal of my foreskin on me. I give you my permission to do this operation. Signed, client requesting circumcision. If the patient is too young to give legal consent, the form should be countersigned by a parent or legal guardian. I am the parent or legal guardian. I am asking you to do a circumcision operation on my son slash word, son word, and I give you permission to do this operation. Signed, parent or guardian requesting Circumcision on behalf of a minor. My name is right in block capitals. I am the counselor slash surgeon who has given information to the above client. I've given information about what circumcision is, the benefits of circumcision, how circumcision is done, the risk of circumcision, what to do before circumcision, what to do after circumcision, what to do if there are any complications after circumcision, an emergency contact number and information about where to go in an emergency, why it is important to use condoms after circumcision. I have given the client an opportunity to ask me questions about all of the above. I've given the client some questions to make sure that he understands the information I have given. To to, to the best of my belief, the client is capable of giving consent and has enough information to make a proper decision about whether to proceed with the operation of circumcision, removal of the foreskin. Chapter 4. Facilities and Surgery, Supplies, Screening of Patients, and Preparations for Surgery. Summary. Circumcision should be performed in, an appro in appropriate facilities with proper equipment and supplies. Surgical instruments wear out with use and with repeated disinfection and sterilization. Therefore, each clinic should carry out periodic review of all surgical instruments. The surgeon must use good aseptic technique to prevent infection. Before circumcision, clients should be assessed for contraindictions to surgery and conditions that need treatment or referral. The assessment includes history taking and physical examination. Equipment and supplies. This chapter describes the facilities and equipment needed to perform male circumcision safely in a clinic setting. The clinic should be equipped with a narrow operating table, which is high enough to allow the surgeon to operate without stopping or bending. Ideally, this should be a purpose-built operating or minor procedures table, which can be pumped up and down according to the surgeon's height. Also, ideally, the table should be should tip so that if the client feels faint, he can put his he can be put in the head down position. However, such tables are expensive, and circumcision under local antiseptic can be safely performed with a fixed height table. Steps can be provided for the client to climb onto the table, and bricks can be put under the table legs to create the head down position. An instrument trolley or table is required on which the instrument tray can be unpacked. The procedure room floor should be made of material that can be easily cleaned and disinfected. Between cases, the instrument trolley and the operating table should be disinfected. If there is any spillage on the floor, this should be mopped with clean water and detergent and then disinfected. At the end of the operating day, the procedure room should be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected starting at the top and continuing to the floor, including all flat surfaces. A liquid disinfectant should be used, diluted as recommended by the manufacturer. Other parts of the clinic, such as the waiting and recovery areas, should be cleaned regularly with water and detergent. The lighting in the procedure room should be arranged so that the penis is well lit and the surgeon can see what he is doing. Ideally, the clinic should be equipped with an operating theater minor procedures lamp, but these are expensive. Adequate illumination can be provided by fluorescent lighting over the operating table. Emergency medications and equipment for managing anaphylactic reactions should be available or near the procedure room. These should be kept in a clearly labeled box, and the contents should be checked periodically, at least every six months, to ensure that they are complete and that none of the medications are approaching or beyond their expiry date. The box should be kept in a cool place away from direct sunlight. In addition, it is important to have to have available or, or in or near the procedure room 
alternative antiseptic surgical cleaning solution, such as chlorhexidine for patients allergic to povidone iodine and spare sutures and needles. The following equipment and instruments are required for standard ma adult male circumcision. Instrument tray wrapped with sterile drape. Dissecting forceps. Finely toothed. Artery forceps. Too straight, too curved. Curved metzan balm scissors. Stitch scissors. Mayo's needle holder. Sponge holding forceps. Scalpel knife handle and blades. O drape. 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters with around 5 centimeter hole. Gallipot for antiseptic solution, e.g. povidone iodine, povidone iodine, povidone iodine, 50 milliliters of 10% solution. Plain gauze swabs, 10 by 10 centimeters, 10 for the procedure, 5 for dressing. Petroleum jelly impregnated gauze, 5 by 5 centimeters or 5 by 10 centimeters, tool grass and sticking plaster. 15 milliliters of 1% plain lidocaine without epiph... Epinephrine, epinephrine anesthetic solution. Syringe, 10 milliliters. If single-use syringes and needles are unavailable, use equipment suitable for steam sterilization. Injection needles, 18 or 21 gauge. Emergency medications and equipment, essential. Pocket mask with one-way valve. A atropine, 0.6 milligram slash milliliter ampules. Epinephrine, one in 1,000 solution, one milligram in one milliliter, ampules. Desirable. Diazepam suppositories in rect for rectal administration, 10 milligrams in 2.5 milliliters. Oxygen supply with mask and reservoir bag. Saline for intravenous administration and giving set. Additional information on surgical equipment is available in the World Health Organization Essential Emergency Equipment List. www.who.int slash surgery slash I-M-E-E-S-C. Suture material, chronic, get gut, or visceral, 3 to 0 and 4 to 0, with 3 8 circle reverse cutting needle. Genetian violet, no more than 5 milliliters, or sterile marker or pen. Gloves, masks, caps, and aprons. Condoms and information materials for client. A specimen list of the disposable materials required for one adult circumcision is given in Appendix 4.2 equipment and should be disinfected and cleaned as described in Chapter 8. A detailed discussion of kits and bundles of supplies, consumables, reusable, and disposable instrument sets for efficient delivery of circumcision programs is included in optimizing the volume and efficiency of for male circumcision services. This discusses various combinations of consumables and supplies required according to circumcision method and approaches to implementing a high-throughput circumcision service. Maintenance and review of equipment. Surgical instruments wear out with use and with repeated disinfection and sterilization. Each clinic should therefore carry out a periodic review of all surgical instruments. Failure to maintain instruments in a good working condition can cause operative difficulties and complications. A hemostatic artery forceps with bent blades, for instance, will not properly occlude a bleeding vessel, while blunt dissection scissors can result in a ragged wound. Check for hemostatic artery forceps. Do the points meet accurately? Is the grip on the point it's worn? Does the ratchet look securely? Does it lock securely or is it worn? Checklist for surgical dissection scissors. Is the cutting edge of the blade sharp? Do the blades meet securely? Is the screw loose? Checklist for needle holders. Do the points meet accurately? Is the grip on the points worn? Checklist for dissection forceps. Weezers. Do the points meet accurately? Cross points are a common problem with old instruments. If toothed, are the teeth worn? Screening adult clients. Oof. We are on page 60. Um, what is that of... Does that make us, what, like a third of the way through? Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> 
Good job for everybody making it through here. I had to take an eight hour nap because this was exhausting, even though I had a bang energy, which I guess I'm immune to now. <laughs> circumcision team needs to ensure that clients are fit for surgery, are well informed about the surgery, and that are suitable for circumcision under local anesthesia in their clinic. If there is any doubt to a client's sustainability, he should be referred to the district hospital or a higher level of care. The circumcision team should be should take a focused medical history and perform a clinical examination of the penis. Both the history and the examination should be documented. See sample record from, from form in Appendix 4.1. History. When taking the medical history, inquire about current general health whether the client has taken any medications, whether the client has any known allergies to medications, history of hemophilia, bleeding disorders or anemia, any current genital infection under the ulcer or penile discharge, see chapter two, whether the client has problems with penile erection or any other concerns about sexual function. There are a few medical contra... contra contradictions to circumcision under local anesthesia. However, as for all elective surgery, circumcision should not be formed on anybody when suffering from an acute disorder, infection, or febrile illness. In this case, the operation should be postponed until the problem has been resolved. Physical examination. The anatomy and structure of the normal penis are described and illustrated in Appendix 4.3. When examining the penis, retract the foreskin and inspect the glands. The urinary opening, urethral metis, should be near the tip of the glands and should not be scarred or diseased. The foreskin should be easily retractable and not inflamed or narrowed. If the penis, glands, metis, and foreskin are healthy, the client is suitable for circumcision in the clinic. Foreskin covering head of penis, scrotum or bag containing testicles, that is figure A, and B is the glands or head of the penis, and the urethral metis opening or urinary passage should be at the tip of the penis. Figure 4.1, appearance of the normal penis, A, uncircumcised, B, circumcised. Absolute contraindictions to clinic-based circumcision include anatomical abnormality of the penis, Men whose urethral metis is on the underside of the penis, hypostadius, or on the upper side of the penis, ep epispadius, must not be circumcised because the foreskin may be needed in, re in a repair operation. See illustrations in Appendix 4.4. Oh, I can't wait. Chronic par paraphimosis. In this situation, the foreskin is permanently retracted. It is thickened and swollen, and the client will indicate that this is a long-standing problem. See in illustration in Appendix 4.4. Genital ulcer disease. This should be investigated and treated. See Chapter 2. Once treatment has been completed, the client may be suitable for clinic-based circumcision. Urethral di discharge. This should be investigated and treated. See Chapter 2. Once treatment has been completed, the client may be suitable for clinic-based circumcision. Other obvious visible pathologies, such as penile cancer. The client should be referred to a specialist. Chronic disorders of the penis and foreskin, such as filariasis, a parasitic infestation that blocks the lymph ducts and prevents drainage. The client should be referred to a specialist. Bleeding disorders such as hemophilia, the client assessment and medical preparation are required, and there may be a need to give preoperative infusion of factor 8 to a given vitamin K or other medication. There are a number of relative contraindictions to clinic-based circumcision. Whether circumcision can go ahead in these circumstances will depend on the experience of the surgeon. They include a tight foreskin as a result of scar tissue, phimosis, this may make it impossible to retract the, the foreskin. See illustration in Appendix 4.4. There is a history of penile discharge or repeated infections, balanitis. The client should be referred to a specialist. Thick adhesions between the glands and the foreskin may also require referral to a specialist. Scar tissue at the frenulum. Sometimes young men suffer from repeated tearing of the frenulum. This can result in thick scar tissue in the frenulum area and may make circumcision and healing more difficult. Penile warts. Penile warts can cause a lot of bleeding. Whether the circumcision can proceed will depend on the extent of the warts. It is usually possible to proceed with the circumcision if there are one or two small warts on the foreskin, as these will be removed with the foreskin. However, if there are extensive warts, circumcision is best undertaken in a specialist hospital where diathermy is available. Balanitis ex erotica obliterans.
This is a plaque of scar tissue that extends onto the surface of the glands and involves the urethral meatus in the foreskin. It also is called lichen planus et atrophicus. In mild cases, circumcision can proceed as normal. If the process involves the urethral meatus, the client should be referred to a district hospital or specialist center where, in addition to the foreskin being removed, the meatus may be widened. Other abnormalities of the genitalia, such as hydrocele causing scrotal swelling, the patient should be referred to a specialist center for, for assessment, HIV testing, and informed consent for surgery. All men requesting circumcision for HIV prevention should be offered an HIV test and appropriate post-test counseling. The purpose of the test is to ensure that, that more people in the community know their HIV status and are thus better able to to take care of themselves, either to remain free of HIV infection or to take medicines that will slow the progression to AIDS. Well, an HIV test is recommended for all men requesting circumcision to reduce their risk of HIV infection. The test is not mandatory before the operation can be performed. No person should be forced to, take, to have an HIV test against his or her will, and men have the right to refuse without affecting their clinical care. The purpose of the HIV test is not to protect clinic staff for HIV infection, they should, in any case, take standard precautions to avoid infection with HIV and other organisms, and to avoid passing such infections from one patient to another. Men who are found to be infected with HIV can safely have a circumcision procedure, providing they are clinically healthy, but there is no point in having a circumcision to reduce the risk of acquiring or transmitting HIV infection. It is most important that men with HIV infection take steps to reduce the likelihood of Submitting the virus to others by avoiding penetrative sexual intercourse or always using condoms. The circumcision team should ensure that the client has been informed about the risks and benefits of male circumcision as described in Chapter 3. This, the information should be given to in an understandable way using everyday local language. The oral information should be backed up by written information sheets in the local language. After receiving the information, the client should be allowed to ask questions. He should then be given time to reflect before asking being asked to sign the Certificate of Consent. An example information sheet and consent certificate can be found in the appendices uh, to Chapter 3. Preoperative washing by the patient. On the day of surgery, the client should wash his genital area and penis with water and soap, retracting the foreskin and washing under it. This ensures that the genital area is clean before he comes to the clinic. Immediately before the operation, the skin should be further cleaned with povidone iodine. See Chapter 5. If the pubic hair is long and likely to get in the way of surgery or interfere with the dressing, it should be clipped before the patient enters the operating room. The patient can do this at home on the day of surgery, or it can be done at the clinic. Shaving is not necessary. A patient should be given the opportunity to empty his bladder before going into the operating room. Scrubbing and putting on protective clothing. Before entering the operating room area, all members of the surgical team should remove all jewelry to ensure nails are, are trimmed or filed, remove any artificial nails or nail polish, wash hands and arms to sh up to the elbow with a non-medicated soap, make sure that the hands and nails are not visibly soiled, before circumcision operation, anyone who will touch the sterile surgical field, the surgical instruments, or the wound should scrub their hands and arms to the elbows. Scrubbing cannot completely sterilize the skin, but it will decrease the bacterial load and risk of wound contamination from the hands. Each scrub should take five minutes, and the process should be done at the start of operating session, and if more than one circumcision is planned between each operation. The scrub can be done with medicated soap and water, or with an alcohol-based preparation. Surgical scrub with a medicated soap, figure 4.2. Ooh, we're going to learn how to wash our hands the right way. Start timing. Use a using a medicated soap, scrub each side of each finger between fingers and the back and front of each hand. Wash each hand to the arms from wrist to elbows. Keep your hands higher than your arms at all times during the procedure. Rinse hands and arms by passing them through the water in one direction only, from fingertips to elbow. Do not move your arms back and forth. After scrubbing, hold your arms to allow the water to drip off your elbows. Turn off the tap with your elbow. And we have a lovely picture of somebody doing just that. Figure 4.2 and 4.3 are reproduced from World Health Organization Surgical Care at the District Hospital, World Health Organization 2003.
The World Health Organization considerations for implementing models for operation of the World Health Organization of Male Circumcision Services Field Testing Edition Geneva World Health Organization 2010 available at www.malecircumcision.org. Dry the hands and arms with a sterile towel. Make sure that this towel does not become contaminated by coming into contact with non-sterile surfaces. <sighs> Hold your hands and forearms away from your body and higher than your elbows until you have put on the gloves or gown and gloves if gown is, is used, figure 4.3. Surgical scrubbing with an alcohol-based preparation. Start timing. Use sufficient alcohol to rub... To rub Rub to keep hand rub to keep the hands and forearms wet throughout the scrub. Rub each side of each finger between fingers, the back and front of each hand, and each side of the arms from wrist to elbow. Allow hands and forearms to dry thoroughly. After scrubbing, put on sterile operating gloves, taking care not to contaminate the sterile outer surface of the gloves. Figure 4.3. And we have a lovely image of somebody putting on gloves the right way. Basically, you gotta. Pull it on, and then you gotta use your gloved hand to force the one into your other hand, and then you do that thing that they do in cartoons where they slap it down. Figure 4.3, putting on surgical gloves. Surgical gloves prevent transmission of HIV, hepatitis, and other infections through contact with the blood. However, there is always a possibility that a glove will be accidentally puncture, punctured. If this happens during an operation, properly remove, promptly remove the glove, rinse the hand with antiseptic, and put on a new sterile glove. If... The glove has leaked as a result of the puncture, or re-scrub before putting on new gloves. Patient safety is of primary concern. Do not compromise it. Change gloves only when it is safe for the patient. For example, if the patient is bleeding a lot, stop the bleeding with an artery forceps before changing the punctured glove. Whether to use a gown. A surgical gown is recommended, though a circumcision operation may be performed with the surgeon wearing sterile operating gloves, but with a sterile gown or using full operating theater gowning techniques. It is less expensive to use gloves only. And this, and this is the practice of many clinic settings. The surgeon should, in any case, wear a clear, clean theater uniform, cap, and, and, and theater shoes. If a surgical gown is not used, it is important that the surgeon wears a clean apron to protect clothes from splashes during the, the operation. Face masks and protective eyewear. Face masks are recommended as they reduce droplet contamination if the surgeon coughs or sneezes and protect the surgeon's mouth from any spray of blood droplets. Eyewear is also recommended and should be worn together with a mask whenever an accidental splash of blood onto the face is likely. Appendix 4.1 Sample client record form for adults and adolescents. Name, address, date of visit, patient's ID number, hospital ID number, if different from above, date of birth, age in years, parent is referred by one, self-parent, two, family planning clinic, three, voluntary testing and counseling center, four, urology clinic, five, outpatient department, six, non-governmental organization, seven, other, specify. Marital status, one, single, two, married, three, divorce separated, four, other, specify. Tribe slash ethnicity, religion, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, I spelled Muslim wrong, unless Muslim is its own thing. Hang on, I gotta Google that now, because I'm curious. Maybe Muslim is its own thing. M-O-S-L-I-M. -S nope. Oh, wait, maybe. Moslems. Oh, I... I guess it's a real word. Hmm. Speaking of which, did you know that Martin Luther King Jr. was uncircumcised? Good job, sir. Um, Martin Luther King. <laughs> Primary indication for circumcision. One, for prayer for partial protection against HIV, social religious, personal hygiene, phimosis, paraphimosis, erectile pain, recurrent balanitis, perpetual per, neoplasm, other, specify. Is the client sexually active? Yes or no. Previous contraceptive use? One, none. Two, condoms. Three, vasectomy. Four, other, specify. HIV test. Uh, HIV test recommended. Yes, no. HIV test performed? Yes, no. Post-test counseling given? Yes, no. Medical history. Does the patient have a history of any of the following? 
Hemophilia or bleeding disorders? Yes or no. Diabetes? Yes or no. Is a patient currently being treated or taking medications for any of the following? Anemia, diabetes, AIDS, other, specify. Does a patient have any other known aller allergy med to medications? Yes or no. If yes, please specify. If Has the patient had a surgical operation? Yes, no. If yes, specify nature, date, and any complications. Does a client have any of the following complaints? Urethral discharge, genital sore, ulcer. Pain on erection, swelling of the scrotum, pain on urination, difficulty in retracting foreskin, concerns about erection or sexual function, other, please specify. Physical examination of genitals, any significant abnormality on general genital examination, e.g. hypostatius ephesiatus, if yes, specify. Examination of penis, normal or abnormal, e.g. phimosis, paraphimosis, discharge, genital warts, genital ulcer disease, specify. Suitability for circumcision procedure. Has client given informed consent for the circumcision? Is client suitable for circumcision at the clinic? Is client in good general health? If client is not in good general health, circumcision should be delayed until he has recovered. If client shows signs of immunodeficiency, e.g. severe unexplained weight loss, unexplained recurrent opportunistic infections, requires bed rest for at least half the day. Client should be referred to a higher level of care, and an HIV test should be performed to verify that client does not have HIV infection. Circumcision procedure, type of anesthesia, local, penile nerve block with lidocaine, general, other, specify. Type of circumcision procedure, dorsal slip method, forceps guided method, sleeve method, other method, e.g. appliance, specify. Date of operation, day, month, year. 28. Surgeon, nurse. 29. Start time, end time, duration in minutes. 30. Postoperative medications. 31. Complications. None. Yes. Fill in male circumcision adverse events form. Appendix 4.2. Sample disposable consumables for one adult male circumcision. Sponge holding forceps. Disposable scalpel. We want one of each of those. O drape. 80 by 80 centimeter drape with around 5 centimeter diameter hole. Gallopot for antiseptic solution, e.g. povidone iodine. Povidone iodine, 50 milliliters, 10% solution. Plain gauze swabs, 10, 10 by 10 centimeters for procedure, 5, 10 by 10 centimeters just for dressing. Trillium jelly impregnated gauze, 5 by 5 centimeters or 5 by 10 centimeters. Thule gras and sticking plaster. 15 milliliters, 1%, plain lidocaine without adrenaline, anesthetic solution in a single-use syringe with 21-gauge needle. 18-inch chronic gut 4 to 0 sutures with 13 millimeters to 19 millimeters 3 8 circle reverse cutting needle. Sterile marker pen. Gloves, mask, cap, and disposable apron. Two sets. Condoms. Alright, and we are at page 75. So what does that make us? Like, a little bit over a third of the way through this, um, through this book? That's not bad. We, like... A quarter of the way through the book, is that? Is that it? Maybe. Detailed anatomy of the penis. Ooh boy, you got you guys are gonna be gonna love this one. It's important for the surgeon to have a good understanding of penile anatomy before undertaking male circumcision. The penis is composed of two interconnected erectile bodies, the corpora cavernosa which are attached and thus anchored to the underside of the front of the pubic bones. During erection, these bodies will fill with blood, making the penis rigid. The wall of the erectile bodies is made of tough elastic tissue, the tunica alberginia. The, the urethra is on the other side, underside of the corpora cavernosa. Surrounding the urethra is a quilt of erectile tissue. The corpus spongiosum which continues and expands at the quilt of erectile tissue, the corpus, corpus spongiosum, which continues and expands at the distal end of the penis to form the glands. This is like a helmet across the ends of the corporosa cavernosa. The corpus spongiosum contributes to engorgement of the glands and has some expansion of the girth of the penis, but does not contribute significantly to its rigidity. The urethra runs along the underside of the penis to the tip of the gland. The urethral mucus should be at the tip of the glands. In the malformation called hypostatius, 
it, it may emerge on the underside of the glands or in the corona. Minor variations in the position in the urethral meatus are very common, do not require any treatment, provided that the man is able to pass urine freely and has a straight penile erection. Foreskin is the fold of skin that covers the glands when the penis is soft. During sexual intercourse, the foreskin is pulled back away from the glands, in the midline of the underside of the penis. There is a band of skin, the frenulum, which helps the foreskin return to its usual position. Immediately underneath the frenulum is the fren frenular artery, which can cause troublesome bleeding during circumcision procedures. Immediately underneath the frenular artery is the urethra. It is important to understand that the relative positions of the urethra, the frenular artery, and frenulum, be um, because the urethra can easily be injured during attempts to stop bleeding from the frenular artery. The urethra is also vulnerable to injury in babies because the tissue between the frenulum and the urethra is very thin and delicate. The erectile bodies, corpora um, cavernosa, and the urethra, the urethra in its erectile tissue, corpus spongiosum, are in turn held together by a tough penile fascia, lux fascia. The penis has a plentiful blood supply from the internal iliac arteries by, in the pelvis via the pudendal arteries. These in turn divide to give rise to the dorsal penile artery on each side and an artery in the center of each erectile body. In addition, these these there are many small arteries linking these. The dorsal penile nerves are located on the upper aspect of the penis, slightly to the side of the midline and deep into the penile fascia. At the base of the penis, these nerves are relatively compact, but as they run towards the glands of the nerve, fibers fan out. This is why in a penile block, most of the local anesthetic is injected at the 1 o'clock and 11 o'clock positions at the base of the penis. See chapter 5. And now we have um, some anatomy of the penis. Um, I don't even know how to describe this. It's uh, ugly. And then we have, this was reproduced from with permission from Netter Images. Um, they have giant watermarks on them from Saunders Elsevier. This is image number 2969. And then figure 4.5 is a cross section of the penis, which is reproduced with permission from www.netterimages.com. This is image number 7884. And then we have the longitudinal section of the penis, reproduced with permission from netterimages.com. This is image number 7829. This one is hyperlinked. All right. Appendix 4.4, selected anatomical abnormalities of the penis. Figure 4.7, we have hyperaspadius. And I don't really know what that is. 4.8 is... Epispadius, and it's a, another image. Then we have 4.9, which is phimosis, and somebody who is trying and failing to pull their foreskin back. And then we have 4.10, paraphimosis, and this is the same deal except in reverse. Chapter 5 Surgical Procedures for Adults and Adolescents. This chapter gives step-by-step -step instructions for performing a circumcision on an adult or an adolescent. It covers tissue handling, skin preparation, local anesthesia, the circumcision itself, suturing, and dressing the wound. Three surgical techniques are described, the forceps guided method, the dorsal slip method, and the sleeve resection method. But before we get into that, I am going to take a short break, and I will be... Right back. Ah. All right, we're back. Chapter 5. Surgical skills for safe circumcision. Anatomy of the penis and choice of surgical technique. It is important to have a good understanding of penile anatomy before undertaking male circumcision. This is described and illustrated in detail in Chapter 4 and Appendix 4.3. Variations in technique for minor abnormalities of the foreskin are described in Appendix 5.1. Three widely used surgical techniques for adults and adolescent circumcision are used are described in detail in this chapter. Ooh. They have all been selected on the basis of extensive experience worldwide. 
as well as the results from three randomized controlled trials of circumcision in Kenya, South Africa, and Uganda. It is not recommended that a nursing, clinical, or medical officer learn all three surgical techniques. It is best to become a master of one adult technique and, if appropriate, one pediatric technique. This will produce the best results with the least complications. Providers should become expert in the technique most suited to the circumstances of their practice or the preferred technique adopted nationally. All three recommended techniques are fully illustrated and can be referred to in the context of a training course. After the training, il the illustrations and step-by-step -step guide can be used to reinforce what has been lear learnt for and for re retraining. Experienced surgeons should be able to perform all three techniques with little difficulty and to train less experienced providers in any of these three techniques described. So we've got tissue handling. The surgeon should handles tissue gently. Unnecessary crushing of tissue causes more scarring, delays healing, and increases the risk of infection. Use dissecting forceps tweezers to hold the skin edge when suturing the circumcision wound. Do not use artery forceps. Place hemostatic sutures accurately, taking care to avoid inserting the needle too deep in the surrounding tissue. Hemostasis. Minimizing blood loss is a part of good surgical technique and safe medical practice. It is important, particularly for men who are anemic. Ideally, these men should, be, should not be circumcised at the clinic, but should be referred to a hospital. Another important reason to minimize blood loss is to reduce contamination of instruments, operating theater drapes and gowns to lower the risk of transmitting blood-borne diseases, such as HIV and hepatitis B, to theater staff. The following techniques can be used to reduce blood loss. Compression. After the incision has been made, and at any time during the procedure, oozing of blood from cut surfaces can be controlled by applying pressure over a gauze swab for a few minutes. Usually this will stop bleeding. Temporary occlusion of blood vessels. Control individual bleeding vessels by applying an artery forces to the blood vessel, figure 5.1, grasping a minimal amount of adjacent tissue. And then we have a picture of it, and it is awful. Oh, there are more pictures. An alternative technique is used to pick up the vessel during force using forceps, tweezers, and then apply it. artery forceps. This is adapted from the World Health Organization Surgical Care at the District Hospital, Geneva World Health Organization, 2003. Ooh, I'm not looking at those. I'm not looking at those. Okay. Figure 5.2 is picking up a blood vessel with forceps and to facilitate accurate placing of the artery forceps. Tying and underrunning. Either tie the vessel or underrun and tie it. The simplest procedure is to tie the vessel below the artery forceps. Figure 5.3. To the basic tie consists of two throws, but mainly, but many surgeons make a third throw to make give the knot extra security. And then this shows figure sample tie the knot with two throws versus the knot with th three throws, and then the finished knot when pulled tight. It is important to ensure that the tie is securely placed and that and not liable to slip off, particularly in the first few days following the operation during a penile erection. If there is any doubt about the security of the tie, it is better to use the underrunning technique in figure 5.4. Secure the bleeding vessel with an artery forceps. Pass the suture needle just beneath the artery, not too deep, and pull through, leaving enough suture material for the tie. Then pass the suture beneath the vessel a second time, pull, pull gently to occlude it, and tie a knot as above. Figure 5.4, under running a bleeding vessel, the knot with two throws, the knot with three throws. I don't even know what this is. I don't know which tube that they're even tying there. Diathermy. A surgical diathermy coagulation is achieved by creating heat with an electrical current passing through the tissue. The techniques described in this manual can all be undertaken safely without diathermy equipment, and any surgeon undertaking male circumcision should be adept at stopping bleeding without diathermy. Diathermy has the advantage of decreasing hemostasis time, thereby reducing the total, total procedure time. Monopolar and bipolar diathermy. There are two diathermy electrical circuits in common use, monopolar and bipolar. With the monopolar diathermy and the current runs... From, from, the, from the machine through with the diathermy forceps. The, through the tissue held by forceps, through the patient's body to a grounding plate, and then back to the machine. In bipolar diathermy, the current runs from the machine to one of the two prongs of the diathermy forceps, through the tissue grasp between the prongs, and then back through the other prongs of the machine. 
With both types, care must be taken to ensure that the patient is not in contact with any metal or conducting material as there is a risk of earth leakage and burns at the point of contact. What earth leakage is. This risk is greatest uh, with monopolar diathermy. Whenever diathermy is used, care must be taken in positioning and, uh, and on the operating table. The choice of operating table and clinic pr construction to prevent current leakage to earth. Some monopolar diathermy machines include automatic safety switch off in case of earth leakage, disconnected grounding plate, or poor contact between the grounding plate and skin. The grounding plate should be placed to ensure the whole surface is in contact with the patient's skin, usually on the thigh or buttocks. It may be necessary to shave hairs to ensure good contact. Uh, if the machine fails to respond when the surgeon activates the current or... Or if there is no obvious or an immediate visual evidence of coagulation, the surgeon should immediately stop applying current and check all resistance is the greatest. Most commonly where the grounding plate is in contact with the body and, there, and where the body is in contact with metal. In rare circumstances, the burn may occur elsewhere in the body. Monopolar diathermy should not be used for infant circumcision because the point of greatest electrical resistance may be at the base of the penis with risk of coagulation and loss of the whole penis. <sighs> further, te further technical description of the current types is beyond the scope of this manual, but the circumcision surgeon should be aware that many diathermy machines have, circum have different settings for coagulation or cutting currents. Only the former should be used for hemostasis. Diathermy technique. When using diathermy, the surgeon should apply the forceps as precisely as possible. The best results will be obtained if the blood vessel is grasped between the diathermy prongs with minimal other tissue, and the current activated is for the shortest time required to ensure hemostasis. If too much tissue is grasped, diathermy will st not stop bleeding because the heat is to diffuse. These may increase... These may increase the risk of infection, post-operative pain, or scar tissue formation. Particular care must be taken near the frenulum because there is a risk of burning through the urethra wear, which is near to the surface and creating a fistula. Diathermy should also be used with caution close to the skin and mucosal edges as transmitted heat may cause burns. Diathermy can be used to stop bleeding from small blood vessels, but it is safer to apply an artery forceps and tie or underrun larger vessels as described above. Suture material. Suture size is a compromise between ensuring adequate tensile strength and keeping the amount of foreign material to a minimum. Larger suture sizes produce a more unsightly scar and small lumps can persist when large size sutures have been used to tie the blood vessels. The preferred suture system for adult male circumcision is 3 to 0 or 4 to 0 chronic gut or visceral ripide. Visceral ripide is more expensive than chromic gut. The suture may be mounted on a taper cut, round bodied, or reverse cutting needle. According to the surgeon's preference, the taper cut needle passes more thoroughly throughout the skin, but easily tears through the skin on the inner aspect at the corona. Suturing. The fo following are basic suturing techniques. Simple interrupted suture. This is the simplest type of stitch and results in good apposition. The point of the needle should pass through the skin at 90 degrees to the skin surface and exit at the same angle, figure 5.5. The nearer the skin edge the needle goes in, the better the skin edge apposition, but the higher the risk of the stitch cutting out. If the stitches are placed at a greater distance from the wound edge, there is a risk of inversion, burying of the skin edges, and poor healing. For this reason, in male circumcision, a combination of simple and male sutures is recommended. So we've got a picture of A and B, and I guess this is a form of stitching. Figure 5.5 is simple interrupted, interrupted suture. A suture in place holding the skin edges together, and simple sutures clothing the circumcision incision. We have the mattress sutures. Mattress sutures give a more precise apposition of the wound edges, and they reduce the risk of burying the skin edges. They are more complex than simple interrupted sutures, and therefore more time-consuming to put in. The vertical mattress suture. This technique is illustrated in figure 5.6. Start the first bite wide of the incision, and pass to the same position on the other side of the wound. Two. 
start the second bite on the p side of the incision where the needle has just exited the skin. Pass the needle through the skin between the exit point and the wound edge in line with the or original entry point. From this point, take a small bite. Ow. Final exit point is in a similar position to the other side of the wound. Tie the knot so that it does not lie over the incision line. The suture approximates the subcutaneous tissue and the skin edge. When suturing the circumcision wound, vertical mattress sutures are usually placed in the 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 9 o'clock positions, taking the frenulum as the 6 o'clock position. Circumcision over local anesthesia. We've got four figures, and I think this is just someone stitching. Figure 5.6, mattress suture. A, B, the technique. C, vertical mattress suture, holding the skin edges and subcutaneous tissues together. D, a vertical mattress suture in the 9 o'clock position. Horizontal mattress suture. This figure is illustrated in 5.7. Make two sutures aligned beyond, beside one another. Align the first stitch around across the wound. Begin the second on the side at, that the first ends. Tie the knot on the side of the original entry point. A horizontal mattress suture is placed in the 6 o'clock position, frenulum. We have another, we have a, f a diagram of this. Figure 5.7, horizontal mattress suture A, B, C, the technique. D, a horizontal mattress suture at the frenulum, 6 o'clock position. Figure 5.8 shows the orientation and positions of the horizontal and vertical mattress sutures and the sample interrupted structures to closed male circumcision wound. Sample sutures between the mattress sutures. Vertical mattress sutures at the th 9, 12, and 3 o'clock positions. Horizontal mattress suture at the 6 o'clock frenulum position. And this is if you were to look at the, p the penis from a bird's eye view and assign it sort of like a clock, um, you know, where the it's like the hours on a clock. So 9, 12, and 3 being to the left, um, to the up, and to the right. Figure 5.8, sutures used to close the circumcision wound. Tying knots. Knots can be tied by hands or using instruments. It is more economical to tie the knots using instruments as this uses less suture material. And then we have basically the way to tie. So one, you pull it out. Two, you do some sort of flippy flip with uh, the scissors. And three, you have it in a loop. Four, you pull it. Five, you pull it again. Six, you snip it. Seven, or no, six, you hold it. Seven, you move it over. Eight, you swirl it around the scissors again. Nine, you pull. 10, you pull on both sides. You know, figure 5.9. Tying a knot using instruments. Oh, I was not ready to see that. Skin preparation and draping. Skin preparation with povidone iodine. Prepare the skin with povidone iodine antiseptic solution, starting with the glands in the shaft of the penis and moving out to the periphery. Holding the penis with a swab, retract the foreskin in order to clean the glands. The prepared area should include the penis, the scrotum, the adjacent areas of the thighs, and the lower part of the abdomen, su suprapubic area, so that there is no risk of the surgeon touching unprepared skin during the procedure. If the patient has a history of allergy to iodine, use an alternative solution, such as chlorhexidine gluconate. The solution should remain wet on the skin for at least two minutes. Figure 5.10 is the preoperative skin preparation with povidone iodine. It shows somebody with uh, this iodine solution slathered all over themselves. Draping. Draping provides a sterile operative field and helps prevent contamination of the wound. The edges of the drapes that hang below the operating table are considered to be non-sterile. Scrub and put on gown if worn and gloves before covering the patient with sterile drapes. Leave uncovered by the operative area and... Anesthetic will be administered. A single drape with a hole in it for the penis is better than four drapes secured with towel clips. And now, if I were to describe this, it would be like, um, you know how in morgues they, like, cover up the bodies with, like, blankets, but you can see their feet sticking out? Now, just imagine, like, the exact same thing, except you can see their dick sticking out. Figure 5.11 is draping for male circumcision. The minimum sterile operative field is shown by the dotted lines. Anesthesia. Circumcision can be done under general or local anesthesia. Local anesthesia is preferred because it is less risky and less expensive. There are two possible techniques for local penile anesthesia. The penile nerve block and the ring block. The ring block technique is used for circumcision of adults and adolescents as in described below. The penile nerve block is used for circumcision of infants and described in chapter 6. Penile nerve supply. The nerve supply of the penis is the twin dorsal penile, penile nerves. These nerves are located on the top and sides of the penis at the 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock position near the base of the penis. They fan out towards the glands.
year 5.12, nerves apply to the penis. The twin dorsal penis nerves emerge from under the pubic bone at the 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock positions, fan out towards the glands. And they have, um, I guess, what is a penis with like its nerves showing, but really it just looks like the eel from Mario 64. Maximum dose of local anesthetic. The local anesthetic most often used is 1% plain lidocaine. The maximum dose that can be safely given is 3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. The table below gives examples volumes so that this maximum dose is not exceeded. Examples of maximum safe volume of plain lidocaine, 3 milligrams per kilogram body weight. Patient, 0.5% lidocaine, 5 milligrams per milliliter. 3 kilogram infant, e.g. 8 days old, 1.8 milliliters. 15 kilogram boy, e.g. age 4 years old, 9 milliliters. 40 kilogram boy, 24 milliliters. 70 kilogram man, not applicable. 1% lidocaine, 10 milligrams per milliliter. 3 kilogram infant, 0.9 milliliters. 15 kilogram boy, 4.5 milliliters. 40 kilogram boy, 12 milliliters. 70 kilogram man, 21 milliliters. See, 0.5%. That's not it. That that you know, like don't even. That's not for the real men. This, this is where this is where this is for the boys. 2% lidocaine, 20 milligrams per milliliter. You don't do that on the infant. They're, too, they're, not, they're not ready for this. If you want to do it on a 15 kilogram boy, you're going to use 2.25 milliliters. 40 kilogram boy, 6 milliliters. And 70 kilogram man, 10.5 milliliters. Lidocaine with epinephrine. Lidocaine with epinephrine. Must not be used because there is a risk of constriction of the blood vessels to the whole penis, which can cause gangrene and loss of the penis. The advantage of lidocaine is that it works rapidly. An alternative is a mixture of 5 milligrams of lidocaine, 1%, 5 milligrams of plain upivacaine, 0.25%. This is more expensive, but has the advantage of providing longer-lasting anesthesia up to 4 to 5 hours after the operation. Safe injection of local anesthetic. It is the surgeon's responsibility to check the vial of anesthetic to ensure that it is the correct agent and the correct concentration has been selected, and to check the expiry date. It is important to verify that the anesthetic is clear and that there is no visible particles, which may suggest that the vial is contaminated. Once the needle is in place, but before injecting any anesthetic, the surgeon should generally aspirate to make sure that no blood enters the syringe. This is to ensure that anesthetic is not injected into a blood vessel. This safety precaution should be repeated each time the needle is moved before any additional anesthetic is injected. Additional analgesia, anal, analgesia, ooh, throwback to uh, female genital mutilation, that word was in there. Analgesics such as, perform, such as paramet, paracetamol, may be given after the operation. However, best, pra best practice is to give one paracetamol tablet, adult dose 500 milligrams, one to two hours before surgery, and, the, and one tablet for the patient to take six hours later. This produces better post-operative analgesia than post-operative tablets alone. Ring block technique. Using a fine 23 gauge needle, inject approximately 0.1 milliliters of anesthetic subcutaneously at the 11 o'clock position. Then, without withdrawing the needle, advance in it into the subdermal space, making sure that the needle is freely mobile. Oh, this is going to get gross, I feel. At this point, inject 2 to, point, 2 to 3 milliliters of anesthetic to block the dorsal penile nerves, figure 5.3. Then advance the needle subcutaneously around the sides of the penis and inject an additional 1 milliliter of anesthetic. Withdraw the needle and repeat the procedure, starting at the 1 o'clock position so as to complete a ring of anesthetic. In some cases, it may be necessary to make an additional injection on the underside of the penis to fully complete the ring of anesthetic. After injection, massage the base of the penis for 10 to 20 seconds to increase the diffusion of lidocaine into the surrounding tissues. Once the anesthetic has been injected, a surgeon should wait three to five minutes, time by the clock. A common mistake is to start with the procedure before the anesthetic has, time, has had time to work. Sensation should be tested before starting the surgery. This can be done by gently pinching the foreskin with an artery forceps. If there's any residual sensation, the surgeon should wait a further two to three minutes and test again. If there's still sensation, more local anesthetic should be given. Sometimes it helps to give additional local anesthetic separately to the frenulum area, but usually the ring block at the base of the penis is sufficient. And then we have a picture of somebody injecting lidocaine into somebody's dick. Figure 5.13 is injection of local anesthetic for the ring block technique. Figure 5.14 is the ring of local anesthetic after injections have been made during the ring block technique. 
It's called the ring block technique, because after that ring, you can't feel anything. Retraction of the foreskin and dealing with adhesions. This step is common to all methods of circumcision described below. After effective local anesthesia has been achieved, the foreskin should be fully retracted. The opening of the foreskin is tight. It, should, it may be necessary to dilate it with a pair of artery forceps. But this is not usually necessary in adults and adolescents. Care must be taken to stretch just the aperture of the foreskin and not to push the forceps in too far, because there is a risk of dilating the urethra and causing injury to the urethra and glands. This is a figure 5.14. Is dilation of the aperture of the foreskin. Do not push the forceps in too far in order to avoid injury to the urethra. Once the foreskin has been retracted, separate any adhesions by gentle traction using a blunt probe, such as a pair of closed artery forceps, figure 5.16. If adhesions are particularly dense, the surgeon may decide to abandon the procedure and refer the patient to a more experienced surgeon. Gently divide adhesion by traction or with... With what? Figure 5.16, retracting the foreskin to fully expose, expose the glands and separate any adhesions. And this is uh, what appears to be done using fingers. Making, marking the line of circumcision. This step is common to all methods of circumcision described below. With the foreskin retor return to a natural resting position, indicate the intended line of incision with a marker pen. The line should be could, should correspond with the corona just under the head of the penis. Figure 5.17. Some uncircumcised men have a very lax foreskin, which is par partially retracted in the resting position. In such cases, it is better to apply artery forceps at the 3 and 9 o'clock positions to apply a little tension to the foreskin before mar ma marking the circumcision line, illustrated in figure 5.28 below. However, it is important to not to pull the foreskin too hard before marking the line, as this will result in too much skin being removed. If the marker pen is not available, dabs of gentian violet may be applied with a blunt probe, the tip of the artery forceps or other sterile instrument. Pinch marks made with a with a tooth head forceps are also an alternative. With that, we are officially halfway through this. We are at page 95, just finished page 95, of 190. So, um, let's all just give ourselves a pat on the back for making it this far. Figure 5.17 is marking the line of circumcision. Surgical methods. These widely used methods of circumcision are described below. All three methods produce a good long-term result, but require different levels of skill. The sleeve method produces an excellent result, but requires the highest level of surgical skill. The forceps guided method pr produces a less tidy result initially, but has the advantage that it has a simple technique suitable for a clinic setting. In clinical trials, it has been shown to produce consistently good results with low complication rates. It cannot be used for men with phimosis since the foreskin cannot be fully retracted. The dorsal slip method is probably the most widely used method worldwide. At present, devices similar to those used for pediatric circumcision, see Chapter 6, are either not available or not suitable for adult circumcision. Evidence is needed from clinical trials before such devices can be recommended. Forceps guided method for, of circumcision. This is a simple step-by-step -step procedure which can be lent by surgeons and surgical assistants, assistants who are relatively new to surgery. It can be used in clinics with limited resources, and it can be done without an assistant. A disadvantage of the procedure is that it leaves between 0.5 and 1 centimeter of mucosal skin proximal to the corona. The forceps guided technique was used in the South African and Kenyan trials of circumcision and HIV infection. The version described here was standardized by the Kenyan study team. Step 1. Prepare skin. Drape and administer anesthesia, as described above. Step 2. Retract the foreskin and separate any adhesions, as described above. Step 3. Mark the intended line of the incision, as described above. Step 4. Grasp the foreskin at the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock positions with two artery forceps. Place these forceps on the natural apex of the foreskin in such a way as to put equal tension on the inside and outside surfaces of the foreskin. If this is not done correctly, there is a risk of leaving too much mucosal skin or removing too much shaft uh, skin. Step 5. Put sufficient tension on the foreskin to pull the previously made mark to just beyond the glands. Taking care to not catch the glands, apply a long straight forceps along the foreskin, just proximal to the mark, with long axis of the forceps going from the 6 o'clock to the 12 o'clock position, taking the frenulum as the 6 o'clock position. 
Once the forceps are in position, feel the glands to check that it has not been accidentally caught in the forceps. Ooh, and this is figure 5.18, the forceps guided method. The forceps is applied, taking care not to catch the glands, and they are just blooping that, that schlong. Step 6, use a scal using a scalpel, cut away the foreskin flush with the other aspect of the forceps. The forceps protects the glands from injury, but nevertheless, particular care is needed at this stage. Figure 5.19, forceps guided method, cutting off the foreskin. Step 7, pull back the skin to expose the raw area. Clip any bleeding vessels with artery forceps. Take care to catch the blood vessels as accurately as possible and with minimal adjacent tissue. Tie each vessel, see figure 5.3 and 5.4, or underrun with the suture and tie off. Take care not to place hemostatic stitches too deeply. When dealing with bleeding uh, in the frenular area or on the underside of the penis, care must be taken not to injure the urethra. Oh, and this is applying forceps to the blood vessels and stop bleeding. Don't want to look at that. Figure 5.21, hemostasis, and the artery forceps, and tying off suture legitation. Step 8, place a horizontal mattress suture at the frenulum. The technique is shown in figure 5.5 with a real image, and it is, oh, so gross. Figure 5.22, horizontal mattress suture at the frenulum, 6 o'clock position. When placing the frenulum suture, take care to align the medicine. The midline skin wrath with the line of the frenulum figure 5.23 a common error is to misalign the frenulum and the local middle skin wrath which results in misalignment in the whole circumcision closure figure 5.23 is alignment of the midline skin wrath on the shaft of the penis and the line of the frenulum step 9 place a vertical mattress suture opposite of the frenulum in the 12 o'clock position figure 5.24 which also is an image by the way the suture should be placed so that there is an equal amount of skin on each side of the penis to between this 12 and 6 o'clock positions. The technique of the vertical mattress suture is shown in figure 5.6. Place two further vertical mattress stitches in the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock positions. See figure 5.8. Figure 5.24 is placing a vertical mattress suture in the 12 o'clock position. Oh god, there's so many images. It's helpful to leave a long end on the horizontal mattress suture at the frenulum at the 12 o'clock position. You know, the vertical mattress suture opposite of the 12 o'clock position. The long ends of the sutures can be held by an assistant of the, with artery forceps to stabilize the penis during suturing. These are like the ugliest penises I've ever seen because they are, oh, just absolutely mutilated. Figure 5.25 is stabilized by an assistant holding two artery forceps arrows and attached to the long ends of the 6 and 12 o'clock sutures. Step 10, after placement of the sutures at 6, 12, 3, and 9 o'clock positions, place two more simple sutures in the gaps between them. The technique of simple interrupted sutures is shown as figure 5.5. There's another picture. The thing about pictures is that the more there are, the less I have to read, but the worst thing about pictures is that the more there are, the less I want to live. Figure 5.26 shows several simple sutures are placed between the 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock mattress sutures. Depending on the skin pigmentation, there may be a strong contrast between the color of the penile shaft skin and the remaining mucosa. With time, the exposed mucosal skin will become darker and the contrast less marked. Once the procedure is finished, check for bleeding. If there is none, apply a dressing. See dressing at the end of this chapter. Dorsal slip method of circumcision. The dorsal slip method requires more surgical skill than the four forceps guided method. It is helpful to have an assistant present during the procedure, although it can be done without one. There is a risk that more skin is cut away from, the, from one side than the other, giving an asymmetric result. Nevertheless, the, techniques is, is, the technique is widely used by general and urological surgeons throughout the world. It is a technique illustrated in the World Health Organization manual, Surgical Care at the District Hospital. Step 1. Prepare skin and drape. Drape and administer anesthesia, as described above. Retract the foreskin and remove any adhesion. As this is useful on a... Deep leaves of Genetian violet. And that even amounts of skin are marked for removal. With each 
side of the penis scalpel is that there may be an increased risk of accidental surgery to the surgical staff. In addition, a relatively inexperienced surgery surgeon may cut too deeply. However, these risks may be balanced against the risk of a poor result of the circumcision operation if the marking is, too, is difficult to see and too much of or uneven amounts of skin are removed. Figure 5.27 Superficial incision used to mark the line of an of incision on a man with deeply pigmented skin. Step 5. Grasp the foreskin with artery forceps at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock positions. Take care uh, to apply the artery forceps so that there is equal tension on the inner and outer aspects of the foreskin. Figure 5.28. Figure 5.28 is tensioning the foreskin. And oh god, they are pulling that real hard. Step 6. Place two artery forceps on the foreskin in the 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock positions. Figure 5.29. Check that the inside blades of the two artery forceps are lying between the glands and the foreskin, and have not been inadvertently passed up the urethral meatus. Figure 5.29. Placing artery forceps at the 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock positions in the drawing the forceps in, in the drawing, the forceps in the 3 and 9 o'clock positions are not shown. Step 7. Between two artery forceps in the 12 o'clock position, use the section scissors, scissors to make a cut. The dorsal slip up to, but not beyond the pre previously marked incision line. Figure 5.30. Figure 5.30 is cutting the dorsal slit. Using the dissection scissors, cut the foreskin free, following the previously marked circumcision line. Figure 5.31. Figure 5.31 is cutting away the foreskin with dissection scissors. Step 9. Any skin tags in the, the inner edge of the foreskin can be trimmed to leave approximately 5 millimeters of skin proximal to the corona. Figure 5.32. Care must be taken to trim only the skin and not to cut deeper tissue. Oh god, figure 5.32 is trimming the inner edge of the foreskin. They really don't skimp on images, do they? Step 10, stop any bleeding and suture as described in step 7 to 10 of the forceps guided method. Step 11, check for bleeding. If there is none, apply a dressing. See dressing at the end of this chapter. Sleeve resection method of circumcision. The sleeve resection method requires good surgical skill and is better suited to a hospital rather than a clinic setting. The technique requires an assistant. If bipolar diathermy is available, the procedure can be virtually bloodless. There's That's a good sign. Although the cosmetic results are better than with the other two techniques, there is more room for surgical error, either by cutting too deep when marking the two circular incisions or cutting too deep when dissecting the skin flap free. Step 1. Prepare skin. Drape and administer anesthesia as prepared above. Step 2. Retract the foreskin and remove any adhesions as described above. Step 3. Mark the intended outer line of the incision as described above, figure 5.33, with a V-shape, pointed towards the frenulum of the underside, ventral aspect of the penis, figure 5.34. The apex of the V should correspond with the midline raft, figure 5.33, marking the line of the outside cut just below the corona. Now that's, now that's a nice looking... That's, that, that's a better looking penis than the ones that I've seen previously. Oh, and it got ugly. Figure 5.34. Uh, this is a V marked on the ventral side of, or underside of the penis with its point towards the frenulum. Step 4. Retract the foreskin and make the inner mucosal incision line, 1 to 2 proximal to the corona. At the frenulum, the incision line cause, crosses horizontally. I don't even know what I'm looking at here. This is so ugly. Step 5. So that's making the incision line. Step 5. Using a scalpel, make incisions along the marked lines, taking care to cut through the skin to the subcutaneous tissue, but, but not deeper. Figure 5.36, 5.37, and 5.38. As the incision is made, the assistant should retract the skin with a moist gauze swab. So this is inci incising along the marked line, incising the V-shape along the underside of the penis, and ooh, then you get a... Ew... You get some sort of candy cane look. This this guy's uh this guy's dick is like black and red. Any significant bleeding vessel should be clipped with an artery forceps and tied or secured with an underrunning tissue suture. Provided the cut has not been made too deeply, most bleeding will will be from the skin edge and can be stopped by simple pressure over swab. Figure 5.38 is completed incisions with a leaving a sleeve of foreskin. Step six. Cut the, the skin between the proximal and distal incisions with scissors, as shown in figure 5.39, which is the cutting of skin between the two incisions. Step 7. Hold the sleeve of foreskin under tension with the two artery forceps and dissect the skin on from the shaft of the penis using dissection sc scissors. 5.40. And I don't even know what I'm looking at. I don't even know what that is. Figure 5.40. Dissecting the sleeve of skin away from the shaft of the penis. Tie off any bleeding vessels under with the underrunning sutures. 
study any bleeding and suture as described in steps 7 to 10 of the forceps guiding method. Step 9, once the wound has been sutured, check for bleeding. If there is none, apply a dressing as described below. Dressing. Irrespective of the method of circumcision, a standard penile dressing technique is used. Check that there is no bleeding. Minor bleeding for, from a skin gauze will often stop after five minutes of pressure with a gauze. One, once all bleeding has stopped, a, place a piece of petroleum jelly impregnated gauze around the wound. Place a sterile dry gauze over this and secure the position with adhesive tape, figure 5.41. Take care not to apply the dressing too tightly as it could restrict the blood supply and cause necrosis of the glands. Oh, standard dressing. The, this dressing should be left in position no longer than 48 hours. Either the patient can return to the clinic where the circumcision was performed or go to another clinic for post-operative follow-up and removal of the dressing. If the dressing is dried out, it should be gently dabbed with an antiseptic solution or otherwise known as aqueous centromide until it softens. Then it can be removed gently, like as in fi figure 5.42. It is important not to disrupt the wound by pulling at a dressing has dried the wound. And there is a. After removal of the gauze swab, using cetramide to soak off a paraffin gauze that is dried around to the wound and the appearance of a wound healing normally 48 hours after the operation. It's gross. Appendix 5.1. Variations in techniques for minor abnormalities of the foreskin. Zoop. The techniques described in this manual assume that the foreskin frenulum are normal. However, clinic-based circumcision can be undertaken in the presence of a minor abnormality. If the circumcision team has sufficient experience, any abnormality should be detected in the preoperative examination of the penis, which should include full retraction of the foreskin. Two abnormalities, both of which are common indicators for circumcision, require slight variation in technique. Phimosis. Common indicators. Phimosis is scarring of the aperture of the foreskin to the extent the foreskin cannot be retracted. Often the tip of the foreskin will appear white because of scar tissue. If the scar tissue is extensive, then the man is not suitable for clinic-based circumcision and should be referred to a higher level of care. The first step in all circumcision operations is to mark the fore foreskin with the line of incision. If the sleeve rese resection method can be used, the phimosis will prevent retraction of the foreskin and the line of incision near the corona cannot be marked. In this case, a small dorsal slit should be made which is just long enough to allow the foreskin to be retracted. Once retracted, any adhesions can be divided and any debris under the foreskin can be cleaned with a swab soaked in provodone iodine or cetramide. Once all adhesions have been divided, the second line of incision uh, on the foreskin near the corona can be marked and the circumcision operation can proceed as usual. In the forceps guided and or dorsal slip methods, the line of incision is marked the outer aspect of the foreskin in the normal manner. However, with minor degrees of phimosis, it may be necessary to make a small dorsal slit to allow full retraction and cleaning under the, under the foreskin before proceeding with the operation. The forceps guided method should not be used if there is evidence of extensive scarring. Tight or scarred frenulum. All males have a band of tissue, the frenulum, or the ventru ventral side of the penis, just below the glands. Usually, the frenulum does not interfere with retraction of the foreskin. During early sexual experiences, the frenulum may be stretched as the foreskin is retracted, and minor tears are a frequent problem. Such tears can heal, leaving, leaving inelastic scar tissue, which tightens and further it makes further tearing and scarring more likely. The problem can be seen when the foreskin is retracted during physical examination. Instead of the normal pink frenulum, a tight band of white tissue is seen as in figure 5.43a. This restrictive frenular band can easily be corrected during circumcision. Spread open the foreskin and retract it ventrally and put the frenular band under tension. Using dissection scissors, snip the band at its center, causing not taking care not to injure the urethra, which is just under the frenulum. Any bleeding from the frenular artery should be controlled by careful tying under the or underrunning after the frenulum has been cut. There it will be an inverted V-shaped defect. Circumcision can be performed as usual in this case. However, do not suture the penile skin up to the edge of the foreskin defect since this will cause increased tension or on the ventral side. This tension may cause curvature of the penis or possibly make erection or coitus uncomfortable. Instead, close the V-shaped defect by placing the frenular suture 1 to 2 centimeters, depending on age and penis size, back from the apex of the V, taking both sides of the defect, figure 5.43c. The its V incision is thus converted into a T. Suture the rest of the skin as in normal circumcision, 5.43d. 
And then we have figure 5.43. This is a variation in technique if the frenulum is tight or scarred. And it is, um, it's something. Okay, we've made it to chapter 6. We are page 116 of 190. That means, what, we have, like, 75 pages to go, which, IMHO, ain't too bad. It is currently 1.03 p.m., and I woke up about two hours ago. Circumcision of Infants and Children. Summary. This chapter gives us step-by-step -step instructions for performing circumcision on an infant or young child. Four surgical techniques are described. The dorsal slit method. The plastibel method. The mojin clamp method. The gomco clamp method. Now, if I, if I were a betting person, I would assume that chapter 6 is exactly like chapter 5, except about children. <sighs> Sounds fun! More widely used surgical techniques for pediatric cir circumcision are described in this chapter. The recommended techniques are shown in detail so that they can be referred to in the context of the training course. After the initial training, they can be used to reinforce what has been learnt. Surgeons should be should become expert in the technique most suited to the circumcision of their practice. It is not recommended that that a nursing, clinical, or medical officer learn all the techniques. It is best to become a master of one. This will produce the best results and the least complications. Circumcision in infants and prepubertal boys is simpler than circumcision of older boys and adults because the penis is relatively underdeveloped and the foreskin less vascular. Healing is a quick and, complica quick and complication rates are low. A major disadvantage is that the child cannot give consent for the procedure. In addition, the primary age benefit reduced risk of HIV is not realized... Uh, is not realized... Uh, it's not realized until many years later when he becomes sexually active. Circumcision can be delayed by to old, an older age when the boy can understand the risks and benefits of circumcision and consent to, to the procedure himself. Programs that promote lower promote circumcision of young children are likely to have lower morbidity rates and lower costs than the programs targeting in adolescents and adults. However, this must be balanced by concerns about consent. Screening male babies and young boys for circumcision. I'm really not going to like this one. The screening procedures for infants and young children are similar to those in adolescents and adults, and are aimed at ensuring that the client is suitable for surgery at the clinic. If there's any doubt, surgery should be deferred. Or the client referred to a specialist center. The circumcision team should not inquire, should inquire about the health of a baby or young boy. Normal circumcision within the first 28 days of life should be undertaken only if the birth was a full-term delivery and the baby has no significant medical problems. Known hematological disorders and jaundice are contradictions to the circumcision. Thus, any baby in, with yellow sclera or purple per Purpuric skin lesions should not be accepted for clinic-based circumcision. Any congenital abnormality of the genitalia is a contradiction to circumcision. Only babies with a normal physical examination and an intact, completely normal appearing penis and foreskin should be considered for male circumcision. This is because the foreskin may be needed for plastic surgical repair of the abnormality. Consent. In all cases, the procedure can be undertaken only with the full consent of the parent or legal guardian. The parent or legal guardian should be should be fully informed about the procedure, about how the procedure will be done, what type of anesthetic will be used, what complications are possible, and what type of post-operative care should be provided. A summary of the information that needs to be provided is given in Appendix 6.1. The consent of the child should also be obtained if he is able to give it. Chapter 3 addresses this known issue in more de detail. An example of a consent form is given in Appendix 6.2. Preparation. Before the procedure, the baby should be clean and have a clean, freshly laundered or disposable nappy. Because mothers may need to travel some distance to the clinic, any clinic offering infant circumcision should have facilities for washing babies and changing nappies. Anesthesia. Anesthesia is recommended for pediatric circumcision. Many studies have shown that babies react to pain, and that an effective method of providing local anesthesia is with dorsal penile nerve block. The maximum safe dose of lidocaine in children is, uh, is 3 mg per kilogram of body weight. For a 3 kg baby, this corresponds to a 0.9 mL of 0.1% solution or 1.8 mL of 0.5% solution. See Table 5.1. Anesthetic solutions containing epinephrine adrenaline should never be used.
Kyria C. Worthman, M. W. Ju Jr., neonatal circumcision, and penile dorsal nerve block, a painless procedure. J. Pediatre, 1979, 96, 90, 998 to 1000. And of, of course, they have to have pictures. God damn it. Oh, God. I sure do love my life. Safe injection of local anesthetic. The surgeon's responsibility to check the vial of anesthetic to ensure that the correct agent of the correct concentration is to, has been selected and to check the expiry date. It is important to verify the, the anesthetic is clear and that there are no visible particles, which may suggest that their vial is contaminated. Using a fine needle, e.g. 27 gauge, Injections are made at the 10 and 2 o'clock positions. Before injected any local anesthetic, the surgeon should gently as aspirate to make sure that no blood enters the syringe. This is to ensure that anesthetic is not injected into a blood vessel. The safety precaution should be re repeated each time the needle is moved and before any additional local anesthetic is injected. Figure 6.1, the local anesthetic for dorsal penile nerve at block at the 2 and 10 position. B is a di A is the injection at the base of the penis. B is the diagram of an infant penis to show the anatomy of the dorsal nerve as it passes under the pubic arch and the position of the anesthetic in relation to dorsal penile and pubic symptoms. Note to artist: amend B to look more baby-like. What the fuck? Could use model above to locate landmarks in infant. What? Make it look more baby-like. Come on. <laughs> Local anesthesia alone. Can be used for most infants <sighs> under one year of age who can be held during the procedure so that they do not wriggle. Butler O'Hara, M. Lemoyne, C. Analgesia for neonatal circumcision, a randomized controlled trial of EMLA cream versus dorsal penile nerve block, Pediatrics, April 90, 1998, Volume 101, Number 4. Can also be used for boys who are old enough to cooperate during the procedure. For children between the one, ages of 1 and 12 years, use of local anesthetic alone is more problematic since the boy may not remain still during the operation. Sedation may be required in addition to local anesthesia, but if there are risks, particularly in airway obstruction and anoxia, if sedation is necessary that it, to perform the procedure safely, the patient may should be referred to the inappropriate facility. EMLA cream. EMLA cream, eutectic mixture of local anesthetics containing 2.5% lidocaine and 2.5% prilocaine has been extensively used for placebel circumcision in children of all ages. It is, used, it is safe and provides effective anesthesia when correctly used. It must be applied with care in neonates because of the potential risk of methamogenesis globinemia for prilocaine metabolites, which can oxidize hemoglobin and dangerously reduce oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Care must be taken to ensure that the cream is not accidentally rubbed onto a large area of the baby's body as a result of the hands and feet wriggling during this procedure. This can be done by covering the penis with a small piece of polythene held in place by a sticking plaster. It has been shown that, provided the cream is applied only to the penis, EMLA is safe for both term and preterm infants. Possible minor adverse effects include transient local skin reactions, such as blanching and redness. EMLA cream should be applied to the whole penis one to two hours before the procedure. In older boys whose foreskin can be retracted, and the cream should be applied to the glands so that the glands and the underside of the foreskin are covered. Depending on local circumstances, it is often possible for the pa parent to apply the cream at home before coming to the clinic. If this is done, the clinic staff should ensure that the cream has been applied properly. The maximum, the maximum do recommended doses of, and durations of exposure to EMLA cream are summarized in Table 6.1. And this is Table 6.1! Recommended maximum exposure to EMLA cream for infants and children. So we have the age group of three to so we have the age group, the maximum dose, maximum skin area, and the period of application. So zero to three months, one gram, ten centimeters, one hour, three to eleven months, two grams, twenty centimeters, four hours, one to five years, ten grams, a hundred centimeters, four hours, six to eleven years. 20 grams, 200 centimeters, 4 hours. Notes, EMLA cream should be applied to the penis only. The maximum areas shown are those above with to which toxicity is likely to occur if larger areas are coated inadvertently. EMLA cream will be removed when the penis is cleaned 
and prepared for surgery. Glucose by mouth. Ooh. In addition to other agents described, oral sucrose administration sugar water in the amount of 1 to 2 milliliters has been reported to ameliorate the pain of circumcision. Ooh, sugar water, you hear that, fellas? Vitamin K. In many developed countries, vitamin K is routinely given to babies to prevent vitamin K deficiency and bleeding in the newborn. Vitamin K at a dose of 1 milligram intramuscularly given shortly after birth has been shown in studies in the USA to reduce bleeding after neonatal circumcision. There is a need for evaluation of oral and or injectable vitamin K in the context of neonatal circumcision programs in developing countries. Skin preparation and draping. The penis and lower abdomen should be cleaned with providone iodine solution. If local anesthetic injections are being used, the skin preparation should be done before the anesthetic is injected. If EMLA cream is being used, skin preparation should be done one to two hours after the EMLA cream is applied, just before the procedure starts. The lower abdominal and thigh, uh, thigh area should then be cut covered with a sterile operative drape with a hole to allow the penis through. This drape should not cover the baby's face. To Dito A. Stevens B. Craig K. et al., efficacy and safety of lidocaine, prilly, prilocaine cream for pain during circumcisions, and Ingle J. Med, 1997, 336, 1197 to 201. Moham C. G. Rasucci D. A. et al., comparison of analgesics in ameliorating the pain of circumcision. J. Carinitol, 1998, January to February, 18, 1, 13 to 9. Infant and pediatric circumcision. Retraction of the foreskin and division of adhesions. In infants and children, the foreskin is commonly fused to the glands by fine adhesions. These adhesions are normal. Before circumcision is performed, it is necessary to separate them. Before the foreskin can be retracted, it may be necessary to stretch the opening with an artery forceps. Care must be taken to avoid putting the tips of the forceps into the urethral meatus in order to avoid injury. It's figure 6.2, stretching the foreskin opening with an artery forceps. Once the opening has been dilated, slowly retract the foreskin and separate adhesions by gently running a blunt probe around the glands or using gauze to separate the glands from the, from the foreskin until the corona is exposed. An alternative to a blunt probe is the help of a closed pair of mosquito artery forceps. It sometimes helps to moisten the glands with chlorhexidine or providone iodine, povidone iodine, or to apply some sterile gel when separating adhesions. Figure 6.3, contraction of the foreskin and gentle division of adhesions with a blunt probe. Pediatric surgical methods. I would like to note that we are officially past page 120. So what does that give us, like, 70 pages left? Something like that. Not bad, not bad at all. Congratulations for making it this far. I didn't think I would. I thought I would be dead before this. Four techniques for circumcision of children are described in this section. The dorsal slip method, the plastibel method, the mojin clamp method, and the gomco clamp method. The dorsal slip method with closure of the wound with suture is not typically used for infant male circumcision and is more appropriate for older children, particularly in situations where the surgeon undertakes relatively few procedures so that it is not practical to stock devices. A small dorsal slit is preliminary step in using the gomco and plastibel devices. Typically, in early infancy, the wound does not need to be closed with sutures regardless of the device used. In babies, the foreskin is long in relation to the penis, and there is little chance of penile erection. This has two important consequences. Firstly, the glands will, further, will be further exposed towards puberty as the penis grows relative to the foreskin. Second, clamping devices that remain on the penis for a few days, e.g. the plastibel device, are more feasible than with adults because there is less chance of the device being pushed off by an erection. In early infancy, less than 60 days of age, regardless of which technique is used, closure of the wound is typically not necessary. Beyond early infancy, over 60 days, better cosmetic outcomes may be achieved if the wound is closed with simple interrupted sutures. The Plastibel method provides a unique benefit other than, over the other techniques in that it can be used outside of the early infant period without regularly requiring surgical closure. Extremely rare complications such as loss of the glands, urinary retention, and bladder rupture have been reported with use of Plastivel devices as a result of migration of the ring onto the shaft of the penis, which may happen if the wrong size is used.
The Plastibel should only be considered in areas where a follow-up booth is both reliable and easily available. The Plastibel is a disposable device, whereas the Morgan and Gomco clamps are reusable. The choices between the different techniques may depend on the cost of the Plastibel, the need to sterilize the Mojin and Gomco clamps, the ages at which circumcision is performed, and the possible need for suturing skills. The advantages and disadvantages of the tale of the different methods of pediatric circumcision are summarized in Table 6.2, located on page 122. I'm just doing a brief scan of what the rest of these pages are looking like. And, you know what? They're not bad. Not bad at all. Alright, now we were at page... 122. Now, I'm not going to say necessarily that this is going to be smooth sailing, but it definitely does not look as painful. On the other hand, this con the controls PDF is kind of irritating. Alright, so back to page 122, where we can look at a chart about... Da -da -da -da. Table 6.2. Advantages and disadvantages of four method of pediatric circumcision. Method 1. Dorsal slit. Advantages. Can be performed at any age in any hospital or clinic equipped with standard surgical instruments. Disadvantages. Requires more surgical skill than other methods. Rare risk of urethral injury. Comments. Can be undertaken by skilled surgeons on an occasional basis. Number 2. Plastibel. Can be out performed outside of early infancy without typical requiring without typically requiring closure of the wound disposable reduced risk of penile amputation and laceration disadvantages requires stock of different sizes of plastibel routinely requires dorsal slit with risk of urethral injury rare possibilities of injuries associated with proximal migration of ring may require second clinic attendance to have bell removed comments close follow-up and easy access to care essential suitable for clinics with large numbers of babies number three Mojin clamp. Advantages. Simple one-piece instrument uses only one size, fastest of all techniques, easy to teach, does not routinely require a dorsal slit reducing risk of urethral injury, no parts retained following the procedure. Disadvantages. <laughs> Rare risk of partial glands amputation. Risk of buried glands if device applied for too long. Comments. In older infants, over 60 days, sutures may be necessary. Suitable cl for clinics with large numbers of babies. Damn it. Again, this thing just sent me back to a random page. Reduce, so, Gomco clamp, reduce risk of penile amputation, no parts retained following the procedure. Disadvantages, routinely requires dorsal slit with risk of urethral injury, requires multiple sets of different size of clamps, multi-part device with risk that parts will be lost, damaged, or interchanged, risk of penile laceration if device parts are interchanged. In older infants, over 60 days, suture may be necessary. Suture material. Sutures are almost always used in the dorsal slip method, but are typically not required for the Gomco and Mojin technique when used in early infancy, under 60 days of age. The selection of suture size is a compromise between ensuring adequate tensile strength and keeping the amount of foreign material to a minimum. The preferred suture size for pediatric surgery is 5-0 or 4-0 chronic cat gut or visceral rat rapide. A suture should be mounted or round bodied needle. Dorsal slit method for children. So you tell me a children dorsal slitted this method? The dorsal slit technique can be undertaken by any skilled surgeon using standard operating instruments. The technique is useful in clinics undertaking limited numbers of pediatric circumcision. The penis of an infant is small and any surgeon who is Undergo is going to undertake pediatric circumcision should already be competent with general surgical skills and adult procedures. There is need for fine movements and small tissue bites. Do not bite children's dicks. That is just my uh, opinion. In particular, the surgeon must take care of the region of the frenulum because the urethra is close to the skin and can easily be injured. Step one, after cleaning, draping in anesthesia, a sterile marking pen or Genesian violet 
is used to mark the, f the line of the circumcision over the corona with no tension in the foreskin using the technique described in chapter 5. Figure 6.4, marking the line of circumcision. Step 2, clamp the foreskin at the 12 o'clock position, taking care to place the tip of the clamp beyond the previously marked circumcision line. Figure 6.5. Close the clamp to crush the skin and leave in place for one minute. This reduces bleeding. Kaplan GW, Complications of Circumcision. Ural Clin North, AM 1983, 10543-549. Figure 6.5, Clamping the Foreskin. Open and remove the clamp, then hold the foreskin with artery forceps on each side of the crushed area at the 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock positions, using scissors to make the cut at the 12 o'clock position through the crushed skin. Special care should be taken not to insert the artery forceps or scissors into the urethra, figure 6.6. .6. You know, I'm glad that these... ...pictures aren't... Note to artists, use figure 6... Point ten meters from the corona. If this layer is left too long, the suture line can slip back up over the glands, constricting it and making it appear the foreskin has not been removed. Concealed glands. Control any significant bleeding by clipping the blood vessel with an artery forceps and trying. Bipolar diathermy may be used if available. Minor bleeding can be controlled with simple pressure for five minutes. Figure 6.7. Removing the foreskin by cutting along the, the marked line of circumcision. Mm. Step 4. Suture the edges of the incision with 5-0 or 4-0 visceral or cat gut sutures, depending on the need, the, depending on the age of the child, and a round-bodied needle. Cutting needles should not be used. Approximate the skin edges of the frenulum using simple sutures. Mattress sutures are not necessary. Take great care at the frenulum because the urethra is near the surface and can easily be injured to, by too deep a bite. I mean, why do they call it a bite? Place all sutures approximately one millimeter from the skin edge. Place all first two sutures at the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock positions, leaving them long and temporarily held by forceps, figure 6.8. This keeps the penis stable with the remaining figures are com sutures are completed. In babies, only two further stitches may be needed on each side. In older children, it is helpful to place sutures at the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock positions, and then to place the final sutures in between. Figure 6.8. Suturing the circumcision wound. Finally! Inspect the wound and apply pieces of, a piece of gauze in the impregnated petroleum jelly or with petroleum jelly plus antibiotic. Where was I? Where was I? That's not cool. That's not cool. They can't just do me like that. Don't do me like that. Um, finally, inspect the wound. Petroleum jelly plus antibiotic. Information for parents. The parents or infants of children who have a dorsal slit circumcision should be told that it is not necessary to use a dressing, and the baby can be looked after in the regular way, including washing and use of nappies. Healing is usually complete after about one week. The parents should be told to come back to the clinic if the child appears to be distressed or in pain, the child has a fever, the child does not wake for feeding as per his usual pattern, the glands or wound become dislocated, there is any separation of the skin edges, there is any unusual swelling or bleeding, the child has any difficulties with urination, the parents have any other worry about healing. The PLASTA method. Plastibel technique is widely used and has been shown to be acceptable and practical in developing countries or country settings. This technique requires less surgical skill than the dorsal slip method to produce a neat result. It can be used in children up to the ages of 10 to 12 years and can be used to the EML LA anesthetic cream. However, for other surgical methods, incorrect technique can be used in complications. Any clinic offering Plastibel circumcision needs to have stock in the full range of bell sizes. If the bell used is too small, it may cause pressure, ne necrosis, and injury to the glands. If the bell is too large, it may slip over the glands onto the shaft of the penis and cause constriction. In extreme cases, this may result in gangrene and loss of the glands or urinary retention and bladder rupture, FGH. For these regions, the, the Plastibel technique is only recommended for use in clinics that regularly perform pediatric circumcision. Follow-up can be reassured. It is not recommended for occasional use. The Plastibel method is manufactured by the Hollister Company and comes in six different sizes in each, 
each in a sterile package. Figure 6.9, the Plastibel device, manufactured by Hollister, Inc. 2000 Hollister Di Drive, Libertyville, Illinois, 60048, USA. Step 1. Select the correct size of Plastibel according to the girth of the glands. The most commonly used air sizes are 11 or 13 millimeters. After cleaning, draping, anesthesia, and marking the line of circumcision over the corona, retract the foreskin and separate the adhesions to expose the corona as described above. Broad C. Urkimajoy S. Adamiua, a penile injuries forum. Proximal Migration of the Plastibel Circumcision Ring, Journal of Pediatric Urology, 2009, 0 0.05.011. Mehissen N, Retention of Urine, an Unusual Complication of the Plastibel Device, BJU International, 1999, 84-795. GLD, Raptured Bladder Falling Circumcisions Using the Plastibel Device, BRJ, Ural, 1990, 65-216-7. And separate the adhesions to expose the corona, as described above. Step 3. It is usually necessary to mark, make a dorsal slit, as described above, before the plastibel method can be placed on the glands. The slit needs only to be sufficiently long to allow the plastibel to be placed over the glands. Each plastibel is supplied in a sterile packet with a li ligature, the plastibel tie. The procedure is easier if, after opening the plastibel package, the plastibel tie is placed loosely around the shaft of the penis before the dorsal slit is made. Figure 6.10. Figure 6.10, the dorsal slit, allowing access of the glands. Step 4, place the plastibel on the glands, as shown in figure 6.11. Figure 6.11, placing the plastibel on the glands. Step 5, pull the foreskin back over the plastibel. It is sometimes helpful to hold the foreskin in position by clipping it to the plastibel handle with an artery forceps. Figure 6.12. Figure 6.12, an artery forceps used to secure the forceps to the handle of the plastibel. Step 6. Carefully place the ligature in the groove of the plastibel. Ensure that it is the correct position, then pull it tight and tie. Cut off the foreskin using scissors, leaving 1-2 to two millimeters of cuff to prevent the ligature from slipping off. Figure 6.13. Figure 6.13. Cutting away the foreskin. Step 7. Snap off the handle of the plastibel. Figure 6.14. Snapping off the plastibel handle. Step 8. Check that there is no bleeding. If all is well, the child can be sent home and looked after in the normal way, including washing and the use of nappies. The rim of tissue distal to the ligature will become necrotic after, and drop off after 5 to 8 days. <sighs> Alternatively, the infant can check after 36 to 48 hours and, and the ligature cut. Information for parents. The parents of infants and children who have a plastibel circumcision should be, should be told that it is not necessary to use a dressing and that the baby can be looked after in a normal way, including normal washing and the use of nappies. Healing is usually complete after about one week. Bleeding is rare because of the clamp crushes at the edge of the foreskin. Parents should be told to come back to the clinic if the child appears to be distressed or in pain, the child has fever, the child does not wake for feeding as per his usual pattern, there is any separation of the skin edges, there is any unusual swelling or bleeding, the child has any difficulties with urination, the plastic ring slips onto the shaft of his penis, the tip of the penis becomes swollen or changes color, one part of the foreskin remains pink or has not shriveled after 48 hours, the plastic ring has not fallen off within 8 days, the, pl the parents have any other worry about healing. <sighs> the Mojin clamp method. The Mojin clamp is widely used. There have been several studies comparing it to the Gomco clamp, another widely used device. The Mojin shield clamp compares favorably because it is easy to use and has no parts to assemble. The fewest complications with the method have been reported in the context of circumcision of an eight day of eight day old babies. Since the Mojin clamp is reusable, careful precautions have been taken to ensure the device is properly cleaned and sterilized between procedures. Also there is a risk that the glands can be pulled into the slit and crushed or partially severed. So figure six point fifteen, the Mojin clamp. Step one, after cleaning, draping anesthesia and marking the line of circumcision of the corona, retract the foreskin and separate the adhesions to expose the corona, as described above. It is important to separate all adhesions in order to prevent the glands from getting accidentally pulled into the Mojin clamp and injured. Step 2. Put traction on the foreskin and introduce it to the slit of the device with the concavity facing the glands, figure 6.16. It is important to ensure that the glands is not pulled into the slit. If there are any... If there is any doubt, remove the clamp, inspect the glands for any sign of crushing injury, and reapply the, the clamp. 
Strimling BS. Partial amputation of the glands penis during circumcision. Pediatrics 97, 134 to 136, 1995. Strimling BS. Partial amputation of glands penis during circumcision. Pediatrics 97, 134 to 136, 1995. Figure 6.16. This is the Mojin device in situ. Step three. Close the device, crushing the foreskin, leave it, it kind of looks like a nutcracker, by the way. Leave in the closed position for three to five minutes to reduce the risk of bleeding. If the device is left for too long, it may be difficult to separate the foreskin to reveal the glands after the device is removed. Step four, cut off the foreskin on the outer side of the clamp with a scalpel, figure 6.17. Open the device and remove. Figure 6.17, the foreskin is cut flush with the clamp using a scalpel. The Mojin clamp device protects the glands from injury. Step 5, manipulate the penis using gentle pressure from the side to allow the glands to emerge from under the crushed foreskin, figure 6.18. This is an important step to ensure the foreskin heals below the level of the corona. In older infants over 60 days, it may be necessary to place some 5 to 0 symbol sutures to approximate the edges. Figure 6.18, liberate the glands after removing the Mojin clamp. Ooh, this guy's using his fingers to do this. Step 6, wrap a piece of Praetorium jelly impregnated gauze loosely around the penis. Information for parents. Parents of an infant ch or child who has, has had a circumcision using the Mojin clamp technique should be told that it is not necessary to use a dressing, and the child can be looked after in the normal way, including normal washing and the use of nappies. Healing is usually complete after about one week. Bleeding is rare because the clamp crushes at the edge of the foreskin. Parents should be told to come back to the clinic if the child appears to be distressed or in pain. The child has a fever. The child does not wake for feeding as per his usual time. If there is any separation of the skin edges, if there is any unusual swelling of bleeding, the child has any difficulties with urination, the parents have any other worry about healing. Now, my guess, the next subject section would be about the GOMCO method. The GOMCO clamp method. The Gomco clamp has different bell sizes that can be used for infants, older children, and adults. In addition, the crushing of the foreskin is circular, unlike the Mojin clamp, which is linear. A disadvantage of the Gomco clamp is that, unlike the Mojin clamp, it consists of four parts. Base plate, rocker arm, or top plate, nut, and bell. A number of bells of different sizes are also needed. There is a risk that parts of the clamp may be mislaid or lost during cleaning or sterilization. Before they... Before the clamp may be mislaid or lost, before the start of a procedure and before any anesthetic is given, because the surgeon must check that likely sizes of GOMCO is given, the surgeon must check that likely sizes of GOMCO clamps are available. Once the procedure has started and, have, and the correct size has been selected, the clamp should be assembled to ensure parts of the are complete and fit correctly. Meticulous care must be used not to mismatch device parts. If a small bell is used to with a larger base plate, the device will not cr crush the foreskin or protect the glands, possibly resulting in hemorrhage and penile laceration. Correctly matched and sized parts must be used. Components, parts from different clamps or manufacturers are not interchangeable, and care must be taken to ensure that the clamp is assembled only from its original parts. The Gomco clamp should be used should also be thoroughly checked and not used if it has stripped threads, a warped or bent base plate, a bent arm, twisted forks or on the rocker arm, or a scored or nicked bell. The clinic may mark clamp parts to ensure that they are correctly reassembled. If so, the manufacturer should be consulted on the best way to do this. Some marking methods may weaken the device or make it difficult to sterilize it. Figure 6.19, the Gomco clamp, an a, assembled device, B, rocker arm, C, nut, D, base plate, E, bell. Figure 6.20, photograph of a Gomco clamp. This looks like some sort of, like, 1960s, like, electrical circuits. Step 1. After cleaning, draping anesthesia, and marking the line of circumcision over the corona, retract the foreskin and separate the adhesions to expose the corona as described above. It is usually necessary to mark, make a small dorsal slit to allow the clamp to be placed over the glands. It's figure 6.21. It is important to make the dorsal slit to not to make the dorsal slit too long. Otherwise, it'll extend beyond the ring of crushed tissue produced by the Gomco clamp and may produce an untidy result with an increased risk of bleeding. The dorsal slit should be long enough to allow all adhesions to be divided and the bell of the long of, of the Gomco clamp to to be placed over the glands. Error! Objects cannot be created from editing field codes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Whoops! <laughs> I think yes, that was, they were supposed to be. They were supposed to put a picture in there because this says figure six point twenty one, making a small dorsal slit in the preparation for placing Gomco clamp. Step three: choose the correct size of Gomco clamp bell to fit this glands. For neonatal circumcision, a bell size of 1.1 centimeters is usually appropriate. Introduce the bell through the aperture in the foreskin and place over the glands. Then pull the foreskin over the bell. 6.22. Error! Objects cannot be created from editing field codes. Figure 6.22, placing the bell at the base plate of the Gomco clamp. Step 4. Place the base plate of the Gomco clamp over the bell, keeping the foreskin pulled over the, uh, over the bell. Figure 6.22 and 6.23. Put the rocker arm of the clamp in position, taking care and place the crossbar at the top of the bell correctly in the yoke. The clamp is now ready for tightening. Before tightening of the clamp, make sure that the foreskin is symmetrical over the bell. The apex of the dorsal slit should be visible. Finally, the crossbar at the top of the bell should sit squarely in the yoke of the clamp. Otherwise, there will be uneven crushing and risk of bleeding. Figure 6.23, placing the base plate over the bell. Ooh, God. Step 5. Once you're sure that the clamp is in optimal position, tighten the nut until the foreskin is crushed. Figure 6.23. I mean 6.24. Tightening the clamp. Using a scalpel, exercise... Ooh, ow, my eye is itchy. Exercise the foreskin circumferentially against the bell, distal to the clamp. Figure 6.25. The head of the penis is protected from being cut by the bell of the clamp. Leave the clamp in position for 5 minutes, then loosen and remove. This is Yellen H.S. Bloodless Circumcision of the Newborn, American Journal of Obstrix and Gynecology, 1930, 1935, 146-147. to Man, they've been thinking about the children for a long time. Figure 6.25, exer exercising the foreskin. Figure 6.26, completed Gomco clamp procedure. And that is a... That is completed, all right. Definitely on a young child. Ooh, gross. Step 7. Once the clamp, is, clamp has been removed, figure 6.26, the crushed skin edge will typically have resulted in chemostasis with good tissue alignment. Normally in early infancy, no sutures are required. In older infants over 60 days, it may be necessary to place some 5-0 to o simple sutures to approximate the edges. To obtain a good result with the Gomco clamp, the surgeon must ensure the dorsal slit is not made too long. The apex must be above the crushed skin edge. The crossbar of the bell is placed evenly in the yoke and the rocker arm so that there is even distribution of the crushing force, and the foreskin is symmetrically aligned over the bell. Information for parents. The parents of an infant or child who has had a Gomco clamp circumcision should be told it is not necessary to use a dressing, and there is a ba and the baby can be looked in at, can be looked after in the normal way, including normal washing and the use of nappies. Healing is usually rare is usually complete after about one week. Bleeding is rare because the clamp crushes the edge of the foreskin. Parents should be told to bring the child back to the clinic if the child is, appears to be as stressed or in pain. The child has fever. The child does not wake up feeding as per his usual pattern. There is any separation of the skin edges. There is any unusual swelling or bleeding. The child has any difficulties with urination. The parents have any other concern about healing. References: Dedito A. Stevens B. Craig K. et al. Effic efficacy and safety of lidocaine, prilocaine cream for cr for pain during the circumcision. New England Journal of Medicine, 1997, 336, 1197, 201, 1201. <sighs> Information for parents considering circumcision with for their child. This is Appendix 6.1. Parents should be given information about circumcision so that they can be informed can give informed consent to the procedure. The information should be given verbally in the local language using non-technical terms. In addition, the clinic should have printed information sheets that the parents can take home. Information given needs to, specific, to be specific to the clinic and should include the following topics. What circumcision is? Circumcision is removal of the foreskin. This means that the head of the penis is exposed all the time. It does not affect the ability to pass urine normally and does not affect the ability to fa father children in adult life. Benefits of circumcision. The main, ma main benefits of circumcision are improved penile hygiene, reduced risk of sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, and reduced risk of cancer in the penis. How circumcision is done? Oh, I'm getting pins and needles in my hand. Technique is, is to be used, should be described, i.e. dorsal slit with sutures, plastibel, Moen, or Gomco clamp methods. Mojin. The risk of circumcision. It should be explained that the complications of male circumcision are extremely rare and can include poor cosmetic outcome, bleeding, infection, or injury to surrounding structures. What to do before circumcision? No special precautions are needed before the operation. If the child becomes ill because of the planned operation date, 
Before the planned operation date, the parents should contact the clinic to postpone the procedure until after the child recovers. What to do after circumcision? The instructions will depend on the procedure that has been used. See the descriptors of the techniques in Chapter 6. What to do if there is any complications or problems after circumcision, in particular bleeding, infection, or other concerns. This will usually be for the family to bring the baby back to the clinic. But if, it, if a distance makes a return visit difficult, then affirmative health facility should be identified as emergency con contact number. Oh, an emergency contact number or information about where to go in an emergency. Appendix 6.2, sample document consent for a minor. The name of my son slash word, which I'm assuming is like Squidward, is Block Capitals. My name is Block Capitals. My, name, my son's name is what? I am the boy's parent slash legal guardian. I am asking you to do a circumcision operation, removal of the foreskin on my son, word, and I give you permission to do this operation. Signed, parent or legal guardian. My name is... I am the counsel sur counselor slash surgeon who has given information to the parent or guardian uh, of the above mentioned boy. I've given information about what circumcision is, the benefits of circumcision, how circumcision is done, the risks of circumcision, what to do before circumcision, what to do after circumcision, what to do if there are any complications or problems after circumcision, an emergency contact number and information about where to go in an emergency. I've given the client an opportunity to ask me questions about all of the above. I have asked the parent or guardian some questions to make sure that he or she understands the information I have given. The best of my belief... The client is capable of giving consent and has enough information to make a proper decision about whether to proceed with the operation of circumcision. Signed, circumcision clinic counselor or surgeon. We're officially passed page 140, which means we have 50 pages left. Congratulations on making it this far. We are currently at chapter 7, post-operative care and management of complications. Summary, possible complications of male circumcision include excessive bleeding, formation of... <sighs> Hematoma, hematoma, infection, an unsatisfactory cosmetic effect, lacerations of the female or scrotal skin, an injury to the glands. Certain complications can be managed in the clinic. For others, the patient may need to be referred to a higher level of care. Complications of circumcision can be avoided by ensuring asepsis during the procedure performed careful and accurate ex excision of the inner and outer Preputial glands, ensuring adequate hemostasis, paying attention to the cosmetic results. Post-operative care. Post-operative monitoring it is very important that the that the to monitor the client for at least thirty minutes after surgery, because it is during the period that effects of surgical trauma and other complications can become apparent. Nurses or other staff members can carry out the tasks related to post-operative recovery and discharge. The surgeon is ultimately responsible for the quality of post-circumcision care. The summary below assumes that the circumcision has been performed in a clinic under local anesthetic. If circumcision was performed in a hospital under general anesthetic. The normal hospital recovery room protocol should be followed. Receive the client. From the theater, uh, review the client record, monitor the, the client's vital signs, check blood pressure, breathing, and pulse twice at 15-minute intervals. Check the surgical dressing for oozing and bleeding. Ask the patient if he has any pain. Observe the general condition of the client. Administer any drugs or treatment prescribed. Provide bland carbohydrates, such as biscuit, and liquids to raise blood sugar levels and less medically constrained. Handle the client gently when moving him. Make the client comfortable according to the climate. Complete the client record form. All men have occasional penile erections during sleep, and young men frequently get erections during the day. After the circumcision, the man will still have erections, which will not disrupt the process of wound healing. If, during immediate recovery period, there is a partially prolonged or painful erection, it can be stopped by letting the client inhale one ampule of amyl nitrate. Instructions for the client. It is very important that the client to inform the client that he should avoid sexual intercourse and masturbation for four to six weeks after the procedure to allow the wound to heal. A condom should then be used to protect the wound during every act of sexual intercourse for at least six months. Therefore, conditions should always be used to prevent sexually transmitted infections, HIV, or unwanted pregnancy.
The dressing applied during surgery should be removed 24 to 48 hours later, providing that there is no bleeding or oozing. If there is any bleeding or oozing, a new design may be applied for a further 24 to 48 hours, and then checked again. Once bleeding is stopped, no further dressing is necessary, and the patient should be instructed to wear freshly laundered, loose-fitting underwear. Underwear should be changed each day. After dressing has been removed, the man can shower twice a day and, and should gently wash the genital area with mild soap, baby soap, and water. This advice may be adapted according to local conditions, including availability of facilities for washing and showering. Before discharging the client, make sure that he understands that the complications are infrequent, but that he should look for signs of potential problems, namely increasing bleeding, severe pain in the penis and genital area, inability to pass urine or severe pain when doing so, discharge of pus from the surgical wound, increased swelling, return to the clinic immediately or seek emergency care if a problem returns, make sure the client knows where to go if complications arise, give the client post-operative instructions verbally and in writing, if appropriate, see Appendix 7.1, Ask him to repeat the instructions to make sure that he understood them. Give any medication prescribed and arrange an appointment to for follow-up. See below. Check that a responsible adult is available to accompany the client. Home that this is of particular importance for clients who are below the age of consent. It is particular if it is helpful if the instructions given to the client are also given to any accompanying data adult. The surgeon or of a designated member or or of the team. Surgeon or designated member of the team should assess whether the client is ready for discharge. Finally, the record should be completed. Client record should be completed. Transfer of client records. All client records should be kept at the service site where the procedure took place. If a follow-up visit will take place at another facility, the client should be given a card to give the follow-up provider. The card should indicate the date of the procedure, the type of procedure, and any special instructions. If it is necessary to transfer the client's records, a copy should be made and the original kept at the facility where the surgery took place. Follow-up. Follow-up visits. Ideally, the surgeon who performed the circumcision should conduct the follow-up examination. However, if this is not possible, a trained non-physician can perform the examination and manage minor complications. If the client goes for, to a different health center for a follow-up, it is important that the staff at the facility are trained to do a careful follow-up examination and report any complications to the facility where the circumcision took place. Routine follow-up. Follow-up should be within seven days of surgery. The provider should assess the progress of healing and look for signs of infection. The operation site should be examined, and additional examination should be done as required by the case history. Symptoms or complaint of the client. If the client has a problem that cannot be resolved, another visit should be scheduled or he should be referred to a level of high, a higher up level of care. After the follow-up visit, or at the follow-up visit, check the medical record or referral form for background information on the client and surgical procedure. Ask the client if he has any problems or complaints since the surgery. Specifically, ask if he has experienced any of the following. Discharge or bleeding from the wound, difficulty urinating, fever, pain or other, or other distress, or swelling of the penis or scrotum. Examination of the, examine the operation site to assess healing and ensure that there is no infection. Treat any complications found during the examination, see below, or refer, to the client to a, refer the client to a higher level. Ask the client whether he is satisfied with the service provider or has any comments to make that will help improve the service. Document the follow-up visit in the client's medical record, including any complaints, diagnosis, treatment, and comments. Emergency follow-up. Clients who come for an emergency follow-up visit should be seen immediately. Staff should be, should be alert to the possibility of excessive bleeding or infection. At the emergency visit, examine the client immediately. Check all areas related to, the, to his complaint. Read the medical record if available. If the client ask the client about the sequence of events since the operation, ask about any problems during the surgery or in recovery period, how problems developed in, in any in case increase in discomfort and any medication taken or other treatments obtained. Arrange for treatment of any uh, of any problems that can be handled on an outpatient basis. Refer the client to a higher level of care for treatment of potentially serious complications. Note on the client record of all actions taken. Um, inform the facility of where the male circumcision was performed about the emergency follow-up visit, if applicable. Recognition and management of I'm not having a fun time with this. This uh, The uh, controls, it keeps randomly booting me to a different page. 
The section describes the complications that can be managed in the clinic setting and the indications for referral of a higher level of care. If complications occur during or after the circumcision, the team should take the time to inform the client and, if possible, his family about what has happened and the plans to deal with the complication. Anxiety and fear of the unknown add to the distress caused by complications. These can generally be reduced if the client given explanations about what is happening. For example, a complaint of increasing penile pain and fever four to five days after surgery is indicative of wound infection. If there are any signs of infection on examination, the client should be given antibiotics and the situation reviewed after 24 to 48 hours, depending on the severity of the complaint. In these circumstances, the client and his family should be told that there is an infection, that antibiotics are needed, and when the situation will be reviewed. Organizing referrals. A circumcision team working in a clinical setting should have a formal arrangement with the ne nearest referral center so that there is no bureaucratic obstacles when referrals is required. When strengthening or establishing national or local circumcision services, adequate funding for referrals should be included as part of the cost of circumcision services. Many complications can be managed in the clinic setting, but occasionally emergency transfer may be needed. When there is a need for emergency transfer, the following general rules apply. The client should be transferred by ambulance lying flat. The client and his family should be given a full explanation of what is happening and why. A clear note should be sent to the referral center with the client. The client should not be should be should be told to not to eat and depending on the length of the journey not to drink as a general anesthetic may need to be given at the referral center. Any accompanying family member should also be given this information. Complications during surgery. Excessive adhesions. If the client has phimosis so that the foreskin cannot be restricted prior to surgery, there is uncertainty about what will be found under the dorsal slit. It has been made and the foreskin retracted. If there is excessive adhesions, it may be difficult to separate the foreskin from the glands. Depending on the experience of the circumcision team, it may be better to stop the procedure and refer to the, the man to a hospital. In this situation, the dorsal slit will be, have to be repaired using stitches to stop bleeding. It will not be possible to put on a dressing because the man will need to urinate. Nevertheless, the area should be kept clean as, as, kept as, clean as possible. The man should be covered with a gauze swab, which the man can keep in place by wearing tight underpants. Un arrangements should be made for the man to attend local uh, referral hospital as soon as convenient, and in any case, within 24 to 48 hours. Oh, they got a picture on this one. Excess bleeding during surgery. That sounds like a good thing to have a picture of. There's any excess bleeding during the surgery, the first rule for the surgeon is not to panic. More damage is caused by panic attempts to stop bleeding than the original injury. Place a swab under the penis for, and a second swab over the bleeding point. Apply firm pressure and wait five minutes. Time by the clock. After five minutes, slowly lift off the swab. Often, the bleeding will have stopped. Do not be tempted to look under the swab before five minutes have elapsed. If the bleeding has not stopped after five minutes, the site of the bleeding will, not, will be obvious. Apply a hemostatic artery forceps in the bleeding point. If this does not control the bleeding, apply pressure over a swab for, further, for, for a further five minutes. Time. And if the end of this time, gently lift the swab again and underrun the bleeding area with a suture. Reminder that the larger blood vessels generally run along the length of the penis and place the suture proximal to the bleeding. That is, on the side towards the base rather than the tip of the penis. It is likely that these measures will control bleeding. If, exceptionally, the bleeding continues, the man should be transferred to a referral center as an emergency, or as a more experienced surger, surgeon should be called to help. Bleeding from the frenular artery. Excessive bleeding from the frenular artery, an underrunning hemostatic stitch should not be, should be used to occlude the artery, figure 7.1. Great care is needed not to bite too deeply because the urethra is near to the surface and can be easily damaged. Figure 7.1. Suture running under the frenular artery. And there's a wonderful picture. Accidental injury. Accidental injury can include injury to the glands, e.g. partial severing of the glands, or too deep an incision, resulting in bleeding that is difficult to control. Any bleeding should be controlled by applying pressure over a piece of gauze, and if the man should be transferred to an emergency referral center. If the transfer is likely to be long, insert a urinary catheter, wrap the penis in sterile gauze, and tap the tape the gauze in place. During the transfer, the client should lie flat, and at all times, the client and his relatives should be kept informed about what has happened and the surgeon has received proper training and certification. And if there is a higher system of ongoing appraisal, and recertification, and if there are higher 
are higher if the surgeon becomes overconfident or when timetable constraints result in operations being done in a hurry. To avoid this, countries need to have established and well-funded training and re recertification procedures, and clinics need to ensure the adequate time is allowed for surgery. Severing of the glands. If part or all of the glands has been severed, it should be wrapped in a sterile paraffin gauze to prevent dying, drying, and placed in a poly polyethylene bag. The man and his glands should be transferred as soon as possible to a referral center um, where it may be possible to reattach the glands. Oh, God. Complications occurring within the first 48 hours after surgery. Ugh. Bleeding. Bleeding is the most likely complication during the first 24 to 48 hours. A small amount of bleeding onto the gauze dressings as usual, but may alarm the client. If he comes back to the clinic with blood-soaked dressings, they should be removed and the circumcision wound inspected for an obvious bleeding point. If there is fresh blood from the skin edge, a further suture should be inserted. This will require full sterile procedure as for the original circumcision, including local anesthesia and sterile draping. Usually, placing one or two additional mattress sutures over the area will stop the bleeding. Hematoma may form and may be associated with considerable bruising and skin discoloration. In general, hematomas are best left alone. Unless they are very large, this is continued bleeding. This, the choice is between applying a further clean dressing and reviewing the situation in 24 hours, or applying a clean dressing and sending the... The client to a referral center. If the circumcision team is relatively inexperienced, it is safer to send the man to a referral center. Wound disruption is unusual in the first few days, but is sometimes seen in association with the subcutaneous bleeding and hematonia formation when the stitch is cut out. In this situation, the referral center may decide either to suture the wound or to leave it to heal by secondary secondary intention. Depending on the state of the, of the skin edges, the disruption may occur within 48 hours of the operation. It is usually better for the clinic surgeon to explore and resurface the wound. Complications that occur within the first two weeks after surgery. Infection. After two to three days, the most likely wound problem is wound infection. An infection causes increasing pain and... There may be visible signs such as redness or purulent discharge. The pa patient should be given appropriate antibiotic and advised to take frequent showers and to put on a clean dressing of the wound between showers. If the infection is severe, the man should be put should be advised to lie on his back so that his penis is the highest point of the healing process. Sitting in a cha chair is a bad position. Alternatively, the wound can be left without a dressing, but should be protected from flaw. Flies. <laughs> Wound disruption and cutting out of stitches. When stitches cut out, this usually indicates there is an infection, and the patient should be given antibiotics, seen above. If more than 48 hours have passed since the operation, do not try to resuture the wound, as the new stitches are likely to become infected and also cut out, making the situation worse. The wound should be left to heal by secondary infection. Tension. The man should be seen at the clinic as often as necessary until the wound is healed. In general, the first few for the first few months, I mean, in general, the healing process after the infection leaves an untidy result, at least for the first few months. The man should be reassured that the appearance will usually become normal after about a year. Worsening wound infection with signs of gangrene. A rare risk of genital surgery is infection of multiple bacteria, causing the progressive skin loss. In this situation, the blood supply is cut off, and the skin becomes necrotic and turns completely black. This condition is known as Fournier's gangrene, synergetic, synergistic gangrene, or necrotizing facilitis, and is more common in men who have diabetes. Any man should be urgently... Any man with signs spreading infection or black gangrenous skin should be urgently transferred to a referral center. At the referral center, it is usually necessary to give a general anesthetic and remove all the dead skins. Or you could just not get circumcised and none of this will happen. Late complications. In the long term, the client may complain of decreased sensitivity of the glands, oversensitivity of the glands, unsightly circumcision wounds, ragged scars, or other cosmetic concerns. Persistent adhesions at the corona and inclusion cysts. These problems should be avoided if the foreskin is fully retracted during the operation and all adhesions carefully divided. Discomfort during erection from the scrotal, be from the scrotal being skin pulled up 
the shaft of the penis, and a tight scrotal sac. This can result from the removal of too much skin during the circumcision. These problems can be avoided by careful preoperative marking of the incision illness. <sighs> Torsion, misalignment of the skin of the penile shaft. This can be avoided by taking care or during the operation to align the midline raft with the frenulum. Appendix 7.1. Sample post-operative care. We've made it to page 150, and I just want to say we are good, and congratulations of making it to uh, 150. That is, we have, what, like 40 left, and there are probably a good amount of pictures, so this is probably going to be smooth sailing. It is currently 2.02 p.m., and my friend is messaging me. I would like to keep going, but I also want to hear what he has to say. So this is Appendix 7.1. And this they it's always fun. They always have the fun part. Okay. Let's keep going. Ah, uh, fuck. I am not. Life is a gift. Let's 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 just have a, a fireside chat about um, circumcision right now for until uh, until my friends shut up. Um, if you think that circumcision is good for you, then you may be right. You know, I have I've definitely my opinion has definitely been altered after reading after reading this far. I first thought. That circumcision was just wrong in every situation, and its only purpose was to make you, um, was to, like, circumcise you, and then you'd just be bad. You'd just be dead, bad, and sex wouldn't be fun. But I guess it also prevents, uh, HIV, which seems to be, like, the only positive, but, I mean, you know, I guess if you, if you're at high risk for AIDS, it's probably something that you'd want to do. Appendix 7.1. Sample post-operative instructions for men who have been circumcised. After the operation, rest at home for one to two days. This will help the wound to heal. You may bathe on the day after surgery, but do not let the dressing get wet. Remove the dressing 24 to 48 hours after a surgery. Do not pull the wound while it is. Do not pull or scratch the wound while it is healing. Do not use. Do not have sexual intercourse or masturbate for four to six weeks, and use condoms pr to protect the wound for every act of sexual intercourse for at least six months until the wound has healed completely. Your healthcare provider will advise you about this during your follow-up visit. You may have a little pain or swelling around the wound. This is normal. Check occasionally to make sure that it does not get worse. Take any medications provided or recommended by the clinic. Be sure to follow the instructions given to you. Return to the clinic or call if you notice increased bleeding from the surgical wound. If the pain or swelling at the surgical wound gets progressively worse, if you have difficulty pa in passing urine, if you develop a fever within one week of surgery, if you have severe pain in the lower abdomen, if the wound is discharging pus. If you have any of these problems, go to blank, oops, return to the clinic for a follow-up visit about one week after the operation. A healthcare worker will check to see how the wound is healing. Your next uh, appointment is day, time, day, date, time, place. Are all empty. Here we go. We have made it to 150, 40 pages left, and we are at chapter 8, Prevention of Infection. Summary. Healthcare workers need to, to follow recommended practices for preventing infection in order to protect themselves, other healthcare workers, and their patients from exposure to HIV and other infections. Hand hygiene greatly reduces the number of disease-causing microorganisms on hands and arms. It is the most important way of limiting the spread of infection. If hands are visibly soiled, they should be washed with soap and water, otherwise an alcohol-based hand rub should be used. Personal protective equipment should be worn to protect both patients and staff from infectious microorganisms. Gloves should be worn when there is a reasonable chance of hand contact with blood or other bodily fluids, mucous membranes, broken or cut skin, 
when performing any invasive procedure, and when handling contaminated items. A new pair of gloves should be worn for each patient contact to avoid spreading infection from person to person. Hypodermic hollow bore needles can be used can cause injuries to clinic staff at all cleaning and housekeeping. Staff may be exposed to needle stick and sharp injuries when washing soiled instruments and disposing of waste material. All staff should be trained in the proper handling of sharp instruments. Soiled instruments and other reusable items can transmit diseases if not properly cleaned, disinfected and sterilized or high level disinfected. High-level disinfection destroys all microorganisms, except for some bacterial endospores. Sterilization destroys all microorganisms, including bacterial endospores. Proper waste management is important to prevent accidental injury, injury to people who handle waste items and to prevent the spread of infection to healthcare workers and the local community. Post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV with antiretroviral drugs may reduce the risk of infection for exposure to HIV, and will be, it will be effective only if it is started as soon as possible after exposure, within 72 hours, and if the full course of treatment is adhered to. Post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B can reduce the risk of hepatitis B infection. Basic concepts. Measures to prevent infection in male circumcision programs have two primary objectives. To minimize the infections of people having surgery, to minimize the risk of transmitting HIV and other infections to clients and healthcare staff, including cleaning and housekeeping staff. In the, constant, in the context of circumcision services, there are two important pathways for transmission of infection. Direct transmission. Enteric and skin infections can be transmitted in this by this role. Transmitted by this role. Oh, by this route. By bloodborne pathogens such as HIV and hepatitis B. Gee, from software, we're not cool. Either by direct contact with an open wound or blood, blood products and bodily fluids, or by accident through the needle stick injury. Airborne transmission. Pneumonia, pertussis, diphtheria, influenza, mumps, and meningitis can be transmitted through droplets in the air, usually within a range of about one meter, while active pulmonary, tuberculosis, measles, chickenpox, pulmo pulmonary, pulmonary plague, and hemorrhagic fever with pneumonia can be transmitted via drop droplet nuclei, small particle aerosols over larger ranges. In male circumcision programs, a major concern is the potential di direct transmission of bloodborne pathogens such as HIV and hepatitis B virus to healthcare workers or patients. Exposure may take place during patient care, clinical or surgical procedures, processing of soil instruments, cleaning and waste disposal. Needle stick injuries carry a high risk of infection. The actual injury risk level will depend on the type of needle and depth of the injury, the amount of blood or blood product on the needle, and the viral load in the blood. Damn it. We're at like what, 151 or something. The risk of acquiring HIV from an HIV infected person through the needle stick injury is an estimated 0.3%, three infect HIV infections for every 1,000 injuries. The risk of acquiring hepatitis B virus infection after being stuck within a, ne with a needle that has been used on a person with hepatitis B ranges from 6% to 37%, with an average of 18%. Finally, the risk of acquiring hepatitis C infection after being stuck with a needle has uh, been used on hepatitis C infected person is 1.8%. Most instances of transmission of infection in the healthcare facilities can be prevented through the application of basic infection control precautions in the circumcised clinic. Standard precautions, as described below, should be applied to all patients at all times regardless of their infection status. That hmm. Why can't you just be helpful? Is it so weird to hold it with your right hand and scroll with your right finger? Apparently, PDF viewer. I don't know what what app this is. This is uh no, but it's just the PDF. No, it's, I think it's Google Drive. Standard precautions are a set of practices to prevent the control of infection. They include the use of personal protective equipment designed to protect healthcare workers and patients from contact with infectious agents. Just move the... F mm, I'm not having fun with technology. Yeah, just move that 
over so I can see. There we go. Laboratory and healthcare workers can protect themselves and their patients from exposure to HIV and other infections by following standard precautions. Often during clinical care, it is not known whether a patient is infected or colonized with potentially pathogenic microorganisms. Every patient and every member of staff should therefore be considered at risk, both of infecting others and of acquiring an infection. Standard precautions should be applied during all contact between healthcare workers and patients in all healthcare facilities at all times. The key components of standard precautions are hand washing and antisepsis. Um, hand hygiene, use of personal protective equipment when handling blood, blood products, bodily fluid or excretions, mucous membranes, non-intact skin, or wound dressings, prevention of needle stick and sharp injuries, appropriate handling of patient care equipment, environmental cleaning and management of spills, appropriate handling of waste. Each of these components is discussed in detail below. Hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the single most important and most co-effective measure to eliminate disease-causing microorganisms that contaminate hands and to limit the spread of infection. Proper hand hygiene can also can be accomplished by frequent hand washing and frequent use of an alcohol-based hand rub. In most clinical situations, an alcohol-based hand rub can be used for routine hand antisepsis. Commercial, and hand, commercial hand rubs, liquid soaps, and skin care products are sold in disposable containers and may be used provided they meet recognized international materials or the European Committee for Standardization, as well as accepted by healthcare workers, where such products are not available or are too costly. An alcohol-based hand rub can be produced locally at low cost. Clean water should be available for hand hygiene in all health care settings, providing clean services to male circumcision, clean it, screening surgery, and follow-up. All staff should wash their hands with soap and water before following their clinic duties, and whether hands are visibly soiled, and whenever hands are visibly soiled. In addition, staff should use an alcohol-based hand rub frequently, particularly before and after direct contact with each patient. Hands should be washed or treated with a hand rub. Before and after direct contact with each patient, after removing gloves, before handling an invasive device for patient care, whether or not gloves are used, after contact with blood, blood products, bodily fluids or excretions, mucous membranes, non-intact skin, or wound dressings, after using the toilet, normal personal hygiene, washing hands with soap and water. These steps and procedures and techniques for washing hands are shown in figure 8.1, which is also available as a World Health Organization poster. Single-use disposable paper towels are not available. Ensure that towels are not used more than once before laundering. That's weird. How to hand wash? Wash hands only when visibly soiled. Otherwise, use hand rub. Duration of the entire procedure, 40 to 60 seconds. This is something that I could see, like, hanging up in a life skills classroom. Um, but you know what? It's never, too, it's never too late to learn. Step zero, wash hand, wet hands with water. Step one, apply hands with so, enough soap to cover all hand surfaces. Step two, ooh, rub hands ooh, pam, palm to palm. Step four, right palm over left dorsum with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Backs of fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked. Rotational rubbing of left thumb. Collapsed in right palm and vice versa. Rotational rubbing backwards and forwards with, collapse, with clasped fingers in right hand in left palm and vice versa. Rinse hand with water. Dry thoroughly with single-use towel. Use towel to turn off faucet. And your hands are safe. Big figure 8.1, correct hand washing technique for health care workers. Now this is an alcohol-based hand rub. The steps, procedures, and technique for using an alcohol-based hand rub are shown in figure 8.2, which is also available as World Health Organization poster. How to hand rub? Rub hands for hand hygiene. Wash hands only when visibly soiled. Duration of this procedure, 20 to 30 seconds. So first, you apply a palmful of product in the cupped hand and cover all surfaces. Rub all hand, rub hands palm to palm, right hand over left dorsum with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Palm to palm with fingers interlaced, backs of fingers with opposing palms and fingers interlocked. Rotational rubbing of left thumb clasped in right palm and vice versa. Rotational rubbing backwards and forwards with clasped fingers of right hand and left palm and vice versa. Once dry, your hands are safe. This is figure 8.2, a correct hand rubbing technique for healthcare workers. Keep in mind the following. Alcohol-based hand rubs do not remove soil or organic matter. If hands are visibly soiled, wash them with soap and water. 
Staff who frequently wash hands or use alcohol-based hand rubs should use hand lotions and creams regularly to minimize drying of the skin and reduce the risk of ir irritant contact dermatitis. Staff with an allergy or adverse reaction to alcohol-based hand rubs should use uh, other hand rubs or soap and water. If potentially, potentially infectious blood or other bodily fluid is splashed onto non-intact skin or there is a potentially infective per percutionous injury do not use alcohol-based solutions and strong disinfectants wash the affected part with water soap and seek advice for post-exposure prophylaxis which is pep see pages 8 to 16 surgical hand scrub the hand scrub procedure is for the surgeon as described in chapter 4 personal protective equipment personal protective equipment Provides a physical barrier against microorganisms, helping to prevent them from contaminating hands, eyes, clothing, hair, and shoes, and being transmitted to patients and staff. Personal protective equipment includes gloves, masks, protective eyewear, face shield or goggles, cap or hair cover, apron, gown, and footwear, boot or shoe covers. Personal protective equipment should be used by healthcare workers who provide direct care to patients, support staff, including medical aides, cleaners, and laundry staff. And, med and family members who provide care to patients in situations where they may have contact with blood, blood products, and bodily fluids. Labor laboratory staff who handle patient specimens should always use personal protective equipment. Protective equipment that is used for single use, e.g. disposable gloves, eyewear masks, gaps, caps, gowns, aprons, and footwear should not be reused. It should be disposed of according to the health care facility protocol. Reusable equipment should be decontaminated according to the manufacturer's instructions or laundered according to the health care facility protocol. You know, even like these these funny gross out PDFs always have like the one chapter that's just like standard procedure. And this is like the boring part. This is like the lull. And it's probably not going to get more interesting from here. Gloves. The use of gloves does not replace the need for hand hygiene by either hand rubbing or hand washing. Gloves should be worn whenever the person is likely to come into contact with blood or potentially infectious materials, mucous membranes, or non-intact skin. Gloves should be removed immediately after caring for a patient. Gloves should not be used for the care of a patient of more than one patient. Change or remove gloves for following situations. During patient care, if moving from a contaminated body site, to a clean body site within the same patient after patient contacted before touching another patient. In countries with a high prevalence of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV infection, wearing two pairs of gloves, double gloving, may be appropriate for surgical procedures lasting more than 30 minutes or involving contact with large amounts of blood or bodily fluids. The situation is not likely to pr properly screen pr par patients undergoing clinic-based circumcision. Table 8.1. Glo gloving requirements for gloving ta for common tasks in male circumcision. Checking blood pressure or temperature, giving an injection, no gloves required. Drawing blood for te testing for HIV, type of gloves, examination gloves. Handling and cleaning instruments, handling contaminated waste, cleaning spills of blood or other bodily fluid, utility gloves. Surgery, sterile surgical gloves. Keep in mind the following. Wear gloves for the correct size, particularly for surgery. Use water-soluble, non-fat-containing hand lotions and moisturizers to prevent skin from drying, cracking, and chapping. Avoid oil-based hand lotions and creams because they can damage latex, rubber, surgical, and examination gloves. Keep fingernails short. They should not extend beyond the fingertip. Bacteria and other microorganisms can cause disease collect under long nails. Long nails also tend to puncture gloves more easily. Store gloves in an area where they are protected from extremes of temperature. Glove re uh, reprocessing is strongly discouraged and it should be avoided. There's currently no standardized, validated, and affordable procedure for re reprocessing gloves. Using gloves when they are not necessary re represent represents a waste of resources. Masks, caps, and protective eyewear. Mask caps... Mask protects the mucous membranes of the mouth and nose from possible infections, as well as they reduce the risk of transmission of infections from the healthcare worker. They should be worn by anyone undertaking the procedure that is likely to generate splashes of blood, pro blood products, and bodily fluids. Surgical masks are designed to restrict fluid, resist fluids, and are preferable to cotton or gauze masks. Caps or hair covers and eyewear, such as plastic goggles, safety glasses, and face shields and visors, protect against accidental splashes, spills, and leaks of blood or other bodily fluids. Protective eyewear should be worn by theater staff during circumcision surgery. Caps are recommended but are not essential. Aprons in the surgeon's gown. 
Aprons made of rubber or plastic provide a waterproof barrier to keep contaminated fluids off the health per workers' clothing and skin. Staff should wear aprons when cleaning instruments and their other use for patient staff. If an apron is used, it is worn under the surgical gown. During the circumcision, a, sur a surgery... A surgeon's gown is recommended, though some sur surgeons prefer to use a clean or disposable apron. Footwear. Appropriate footwear is necessary to protect the feet from injury for sharp and heavy items. Rubber boots or leather shoes provide the best protection, but must be regularly cleaned. Avoid wearing sandals, thongs, or shoes made out of soft material. Immunizations. Certain vaccines, such as hepatitis B, can be used for providing healthcare workers and laboratory staff again, can be, yeah, can be protecting. Um, against diseases they may be exposed to during their work. Safe handling of hypodermic needles and syringes. All clinic staff should be uh, trained in the safe handling of sharp instruments. Single-use auto-disable syringes with integrated needles are safer because they cannot be used again, but are expensive. Hypodermic needles are the most common ca cause of injuries of all types of clinic workers. Healthcare workers are most often stuck by hypodermic needles during patient care. Cleaning staff are most often stuck by needles when washing soiled instruments. Housekeeping staff are most often stuck by needles when disposing of waste material. Tips for safe use of hypodermic needles and syringes. Disposable needles and syringes need, must only be used once. Do not disassemble the needle and syringe after use. Do not bend or break the needles before disposal. Dispose of the needle and syringe together in a puncture-resistant container. In general, it is safer to dispose the needle and syringe directly into Sharp's container er, without recapping. If a needle must be recapped, use the one-handed recapping method. Place a surface cap on a firm, flat surface. Holding the syringe in one hand, use the needle to scoop up the cap. With the cap over the needle, tip the, the syringe upright, vertical, so that the needle is pointing towards the ceiling. With your forefinger and thumb on, of your other hand, grasp the cap just above its opening and push it firmly down onto the hub, the place where the needle joins the syringe. And here is figure 8.3, which shows a one-handed needle recapping method. Go get them, boys. Go get them, team. Sharps container. Clearly labeled, puncture, and tamper-proof sharp safety boxes or containers are a key component in efforts to keep injuries from disposable sharps to a minimum. Place sharps containers as close to the point of use as possible and practical, ideally with arm reach, but away from busy areas. Avoid placing containers near light switches, overhead fans, or thermostat controls, which people might accidentally put their hand into them. Attach containers to the walls or other surfaces if possible, at a convenient height, so that the staff can use and replace them easily. Mark the container ease clearly so that people will not mistakenly use it as a rubbish bin. Mark the fill line at three quarters full level. Do not shake the container to settle its contents to make room for more sharps. Never attempt to empty the sharps container. Figure 8.4, this is a puncture-proof containers for disposal of sharps. And it shows what looks to be like a trash can and then like a bottle of bleach. Processing of instruments, environmental cleaning, and management of spills. Soiled instruments and other reusable items can transmit infection if they are not properly reprocessed. Effective and safe reprocessing includes disinfecting instruments and equipment, equipment immediately after use. Clean, cleaning to remove all organic matters and chemicals and high-level use disinfection or sterilization for, for instruments that will be used in normally sterile critical sites, i.e. within the body, in sterile tissue, cavities, or the bloodstream. Before sterilization, all equipment must be disinfected and cleaned to remove debris. Sterilization or intended to kill living organisms, but is not a method of cleaning. Disinfection. Disinfectant solutions are used to inactive, inactivate any infectious agents that may be present in the blood or any other bodily fluids. They must always be uh, available for cleaning working surfaces. Equipment that cannot be autoclaved and non-disposable items and for dealing with any spillages involving pathological specimens or other known or other known or potentially infectious material. Used instruments should routinely be soaked in a chemical disinfectant for 30 minutes before cleaning. Disinfection decreases the viral and bacterial burden of an instrument, but does not clean debris for the uh, instrument and sterilize or sterilize it. The purpose of disinfection is to reduce the risk of those who have to handle the instruments during the further cleaning. Disinfection is not a sterilizing process and must not be used as a substitute for sterilization. There are many disinfectant solutions with varying degrees of effectiveness. In most countries, it is most widely available. Is, the most mi widely available disinfectant is sodium hypochlorite solution, commonly known as bleach or chloros, which is a particularly effective antiviral solution. Cleaning. 
All used instruments and equipment must be cleaned with detergent and water after disinfection and before being and before being high level disinfected or sterilized. Otherwise, organic matter may prevent adequate contact with the disinfectant or sterilizing agent. The organic matter may also be may also bind and inactivate chemical disinfectants. Instructions for manual clearing. Wear thick household or utility gloves. Wear protective eyewear, mask, or and protective apron if available to prevent contaminated fluids from splashing into your eyes or onto your body. Thoroughly wash items to be cleaned with soap and clean water. Use liquid soap if available. Do not use abrasive cleaners or steel wool, especially on metal. They cause scratches and increase the risk of rusting. Using a soft brush, scrub instruments, instruments under the surface of water to prevent splashing, paying particular attention to any teeth, joints, or screws. Rinse the instruments with clean water. Dry the instruments with a towel or allow them to air dry. High-level disinfection. High-level disinfection destroys all microorganisms except some bacterial endospores. It is usually used for heat-sensitive instruments and equipment that are used in critical sites, but that is cannot be sterilized. High-level disinfection is the only acceptable alternative to sterilization for the heat-sensitive surgical instruments. There is no single ideal disinfectant. Different grades or disinf of disinfectants are used for different purposes. However, glutarol, glutarol, otherwise known as Luteraldehyde is generally the most appropriate chemical for high-level disinfection. It must be used very strictly under very strictly controlled conditions in a safe working environment, and the manufacturer's handling instructions must be strictly followed. Sterilization. Sterilization is the destruction of all microorganisms, include ba including bacterial endospores. Sterilization can be achieved by either physical or chemical methods. Sterilization is, is necessary for medical devices that will be used in sterile body sites. Sterilization can be done using high-pressure steam autoclave or dry heat oven. Chemical, chemicals such as ethylene oxide or formaldehyde, radiation. Sterilization of all surgical instruments and supplies is crucial in preventing HIV transmission. All viruses, including HIV, are inactivated by high-pressure steam sterilization autoclaving for 20 minutes at 121 to 132 degrees Celsius or for 30 minutes if all the instruments are in wrapped packs. Items that have been sterilized need to be properly stored to ensure that they do not become recontaminated. The storage area should be kept clean, dry, and free of dust and lint. The temperature should be kept at approximately 24 degrees Celsius and that the, receipt, the relative humidity at less than 70%, if possible. Sterile packs and containers should be stored 25 to 25, 20 to 25 centimeters off the floor, 40 to 5 to 50 centimeters from the ceiling, and 15 to 20 centimeters from an outside wall. Do not use wooden or cardboard boxes for storage of sterile items as they shed dust and debris and may harbor insects. Mark the date of sterilization on the packages and use the oldest packages first. First in, first out. Dates serve as an indicator of when the packages should be used, but do not guarantee the steril sterility of the packs. Environmental cleaning. God, this goes on forever. Routine cleaning is important to ensure a clean and dust-free clinic environment. Visible dirt usually contains many microorganisms and routine cleaning to help eliminate such dirt. Administrative and office areas with no patient contact should be cleared, cleaned regularly in the same way as other offices. Most patient care areas should be cleaned by wet mopping. Dry sweeping is not recommended. Hot water, 80 degrees Celsius, is a useful and effective environmental cleaner. The use of detergent is of a detergent solution and improves the quality of cleaning. All surgical surfaces and all toilet areas should be cleaned daily. The operating table and instrument trolley should be cleaned with detergent and water between cases. Management of spills. Any area that is visibly contaminated with blood or body fluids should be cleaned immediately with detergent and water. After cleaning, disinfect the area with 0.5% sodium hypochlorate solution. Safe disposal of infectious waste materials. God, this goes on forever. Oh my god. Oh my god. This goes on to 172. Oh my god. We've got like nine more pages of this. <laughs> mm, eight, okay, I was wrong. Disposal of infectious waste materials. Waste management. The purpose of waste management is to protect people who handle waste items from accidental energy injury. 
prevent the spread of infection to healthcare workers and the local community. Tips for safe handling and disposal of infectious waste. Place all waste in plastic or galvanized metal containers with tightly fitting color-coded covers that differentiate infectious from non-infectious waste. Place all disposable sharps in designated puncture-resistant containers. Place waste containers close to where the waste is generated, in a position that is convenient for users. Ensure that equipment used to hold and transport waste is not used for any other purpose. <sighs> I am angry. People are giving me messages. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, what was I? What was I talking about? Place all disposable sharps in designated puncture-resistant containers. Place waste containers close to where the waste is generated in a position where this is convenient for users. Ensure that equipment is used to hold and transport waste is not used for any other purpose. Regularly wash all containers with a disinfectant solution, 0.5% sodium hypochlorite solution. Then wash the soap, rinse with water, and allow to dry. When possible, use separate containers for waste that will be treated or will be disposed of in a particular manner. In this way, workers will not have to handle or separate waste by hand. When patients are being cared for at home, contaminated waste such as dressings and other items that may have been in contact with blood such as, and, or other bodily fluids can be buried in a covered pit or burned in a drum incinerator in the yard. Disposing of sharp items. Disposable sharp items. Items such require special handling. They are items most likely to injure the healthcare workers who handle them. If these items are disposed in a municipal landfill, they will become a danger to the people in the community. Step one: Do not use, do not recap a used hypodermic needle, or disassemble the needle and syringe. Place the needle and syringe in a puncture-resistant sharps container. The opening should be large enough to allow items to drop container through easily, but small enough to prevent anything being removed from inside. When the container is three-quarters full, dispose of it. Where dispose it when disposing the sh of sharps, the sharps container, you wear heavy-duty utility gloves, cap, plug, or tape the opening of the container tightly closed. Make sure that no sharp items are sticking out of the container. Step three. Dispose of the sharps container by burning, encapsulating, or burying it. Remove utility gloves. Wash hands and dry them with a clean towel, cloth or towel and allow to air dry. Burning waste containers. Burning destroys the waste and kills any microorganisms and is the best method of disposing of contaminated waste. It reduces the bulk volume of waste and also ensures that items cannot be scavenged and reused. Encapsulating waste containers. Encapsulation is the easiest way to dispose of sharp containers when the container is three quarters full, pour cement, mortar, plastic foam, clay, or other similar material into the container until it is completely full. After the material has been hardened, seal the container and dispose of it in a landfill or bury it. Burying waste. In healthcare facilities with limited resources, burial of waste such as excised foreskins near the facility may be the only practical option for waste disposal. The limit to limit healthcare risks and environmental pollution, some basic rules should be followed. Restrict access to disposal site. Build a fence around the site to keep animals and children away. Line the burial site with a material of low permeability, e.g., clay, if available. Select a site at least 50 meters away from any water source to prevent contamination of the water table. Ensure that that the site is proper drainage is located downhill from any wells and is free of standing water and is not an area that floods. Post-exposure prophylaxis. Healthcare, healthcare workers may be accidentally exposed to blood or, and other bodily fluids that are potentially infected with HIV, hepatitis virus, or other blood-borne pathogens. Occupational exposure may occur through direct contact of non-intact skin and potentially, in, potentially infected blood or bodily fluids from splashes into the eyes or mouth or through injury which, with a used needle or sharp instrument. Post-exposure prophylaxis PEP can help ex prevent the transmission of pathogens after such a potential exposure. Managing occupational exposure to hepatitis B, hepatitis B, and HIV. The immediate response to exposure to blood or other fluids that are potentially infected with hepatitis P virus, hepatitis C virus, or HIV is as follows. Step one, provide immediate first aid care to the exposure site. If a splash or spill occurs on the skin, wash the area immediately with soap and water. Do not use caustic agents, alcohol, or bleach because they will irritate the skin and may increase the risk of infection. Do not apply a dressing. If a splash or spill occurs in the eyes, nose, or mouth, 
on any mucous membrane, rinse the area with clean water for at least 10 minutes. If an injury has been caused by potential and contaminated sharp, wash the area with soapy water and allow the wound to bleed freely for a few minutes if possible. Then give normal first aid. Step two, evaluate the risk by determining the type of fluid, blood, visibly bloody fluid, or any potentially infectious fluid, and the severity and type of exposure, um, percutaneous or needle stick, mucous membrane, or intact or in non-intact skin, and the source of the infection. If the source person is identified, it is important to try to obtain information about on his or her hepatitis and HIV, serostatus, and if possible, positive and evaluation on the clinical status and treatment history. Assess the risk of infection using available information. The process source person may be tested only with his or her informed consent. Do not test discarded needles or syringes for virus contamination. Management of exposure to hepatitis B. Medical response to exposure to hepatitis B virus, HPV, depends on the patient's immune status, as determined by the history of hepatitis B vaccination and vaccine response, and whether the exposure poses a risk of infections. Transmission of HPV may occur following percutaneous injury or contamination of mucous membranes or non-intact skin. The virus does not cross intact skin. HP HPV post-exposure prophylaxis is safe for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Table 8.2. Recommendations for HBV post-exposure prophylaxis according to immune status of an exposed person. HPV immune status and post-exposure prophylaxis. Unvaccinated HBV vaccination and HPV immunoglobulin, previously vaccinated known responder, anti-hepatitis B surface, antigen response, none. Previously vaccinated known non-responder, HBV vaccination and HBIG, antibody response unknown, test. If antibody response is poor, give HB vaccination and HBIG. People who receive hepatitis B vaccine should be tested for anti-hepatitis B surface antigen one to two months after the last dose. Note that the anti-hepatitis B surface antigen response to vaccine cannot be ascertained if the person was given HBIG in the previous three to four months. Management of exposure to hepatitis C. There's no post-exposure prophylaxis regimen for hepatitis C virus, HCV. Evaluate a person who has exposed to hepatitis C virus by performing a baseline test for anti-HCV antibodies and anonine aminotransferase, ALAT. Perform follow-up testing for anti-HCV antibodies and H ALAT, ALAT four to six months after exposure. Repeatedly reactive anti-HCV enzyme immunoassay immunoassays, immunoassays should be confirmed with supplemental tests. Any person who is found to have HCV antibodies should be referred to a specialist for care. Post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. Post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV is, set of, is a set of comprehensive actions aimed at preventing infection in the exposed person. It includes first aid care, counseling, and risk assessment. HIV testing follows informed consent and, depending on the risk assessment, the provision of, for a, short, of a short course, 28 days, and antiretroviral drugs and with the follow-up and support. Step 1. First aid. Provide immediate first aid care for the exposure site, as described above. Step two, report an evaluation. After the incident, an ex the exposed person should be referred and tr to a trained service provider. Give counseling, evaluate the risk of HIV transmission having occurred, and decide on the need to prescribe antiretroviral ARV medications and provide HIV infection. The incident should be reported for further evaluation according to the national requirements regarding regarding recording and notification of occupational in injuries and diseases. The recommendation for HIV post-exposure prophylaxis is based on an evaluation of risk, uh, the type of exposure of HIV status, source Table 8.3. Table 8.3, recommendations for HIV post-prophylaxis. Um, type of exposure, source known, HIV positive, Consider HIV prevalence in population or subgroup. Source known HIV negative. Percutaneous severe EG injury with large hollow bore needle. Deep puncture visible blood on device. Needle used in artery or vein. Two drug regimen. Consider HIV prevalence in population or subgroup. PEP not recommended unless there is risk that the source is in window period. Percutaneous, not severe, e.g. injury with small bore or solid needle, superficial injury. 
to drug fallen regimen. Pep not recommended. Pep not recommended. Splash on non genital mucous membrane or non intact skin. Severe exposure, severe, e.g., exposure to large volume of blood or semen. Two drug regimen. Consider HIV prevalence in population of group or subgroup. Pep not recommended unless there's a risk that the source is in the window period. Splash on non genital mutilation mucous membrane or non intact skin, not severe, e.g., exposure to small amount of blood or semen or, le or to less infectious fluids such as cerebrospinal fluid. PEP not recommended. Two drug regimen is if circumstances require. PEP not recommended. PEP not recommended. These drugs are recommended in certain settings. See discussion on choice of regimen in text. Although PEP is not recommended, it is inappropriate to withhold PEP if the exposed person insists. In this case, the true drug regimen is given. Recent HIV infections not detected with antibody tests. <sighs> Post-exposure prophylaxis is not indicated. One, if the exposure person is already HIV positive for a previous exposure, if the, in the context of the chronic exposure, e.g. related to exposure for, to HIV for unprotected sexual intercourse with a known HIV positive partner, if the exposure poses risk to tra of transmission, e.g. exposure of intact skin to potentially infectious bodily fluids, exposure to non-infectious bodily fluids, feces, saliva, urine, sweat, Exposure to bodily fluids from a person known to be HIV negative, uh, unless the source of a person identified being at high risk of having been recently infected and currently within the window period for seroconversion. Step three, testing and counseling. If testing is available, the exposed person should be offered a chance to be tested for HIV and receive appropriate counseling. The person should always have the choice to refuse testing. Do not delay the ARVs for PEP when waiting for HIV test results. The exposed person could start taking ARVs for PEP immediately and stop the treatment if the test... Yo, there's a ladybug on my phone. Um, test results that he or she is already HIV positive. Antiretroviral drugs for PEP should be started as soon as possible and in any case within 72 hours after exposure. The drug should be taken continuously for 28 days. Each circumcision clinic should either have the necessary drugs in stock or know where they can be obtained, so, the treat so that treatment can be started within 72 hours. Whenever possible, the source patient should also be tested with his or her informed consent. If the patient results show that the source person is negative, PEP can be stopped. Counseling should include provision of information on the importance of adhering to treatment and the information of HIV prevention in general in the workplace. The person should be advised to use condoms and not to donate blood or organs for up to six months after exposure. Women in childbearing age, of childbearing age should be advised to use con contraception, and alternatives of, to breastfeeding should be discussed with women currently feeding their infants. There is a high risk of transmitting HIV to the infant if their mother becomes infected during breastfeeding. Antirotroviral me medications for post-exposure prophylaxis. If a national guidelines of prof post PEP exist, these should be followed. If not, the World Health Organization recommendations may be applied. WHO recommends a two-drug PEP regimen unless there is suspicion of evidence of drug resistance. The standard PEP regimen consists of two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, NTRIs, and RTIs, and the possible regimens are given in Table 8.4. Table 8.4. Recommended two drug PEP regimens. Preferred regimens Zidovudine ZDV and Imavid Imivudines 3TC or Stavudine D4T plus 3TC. Ten uh, alternative regimens Tenofovir Disoproxyl Fumarate TDC plus 3TC or TDF plus Emtricibine FTC. These combinations are currently commercially available as fixed-dose combinations. Note that non-NRTIs are not recommended for PEP in regions where the prevalence of drug resistance is above 15%, or when there is suspicion that the virus could be resistant to one or more of the following drugs included in the standard PEP regimen. A third drug, a uh, pro protease inhibitor, should be added to the two chosen NRTIs in this situation. It is recommended that to consult an HIV expert. Table 8.5 recommended three drug uh, PEP regimens. Preferred regimens, ZDV plus 3TC plus LPV slash R. 
alternative regiments. We've got four of them. We've got ZDV plus 3TC plus SQVR or ATV or slash R or FPV slash R. You can take TDV, TDF plus 3TC plus SQV slash R or ATV slash R or FPV slash R. You could take TDF plus 3FTC plus SQV slash R or ATV slash R or FPV slash R. D4T plus 3TC plus SQR, SQV slash R or ATV slash R or FPV slash R. Um, ZDV is Zydovudine, 3TC is Lamavudine, LPV slash R is Lyonapudivar slash Reaction Navar, SQR is Saquina Vir slash Ritanavir. ATV slash R is, oh god, these are awful, Atanazavir slash Ritonavar, FPV slash R is Bosam Prinavir slash Rotonavir, D4T is Stavudin, TDF is Tenafavir, and FTC is Emtricitabine. Women of childbearing age using not not using reliable contraception should not be prescribed medications such as combination didinocene plus stavudine they should be offered a pregnancy test before starting the pep regimen lactating women should be aware that arv are ex are excreted in breast milk and that the virus itself can be transmitted during breastfeeding when and where safe fe and feasible alternative feeding options should be discussed with breastfeeding mothers step five Follow-up and testing. Follow-up visits should be should aim to support the person's medical adherence to, to PEP. Prevent the or treat side effects of the medicine and direct seroconversion. And if occurs, the following steps are to be recommended. There should be regular follow-up for the first six weeks after starting PEP to support good adherence. Perform HIV antibody testing at the baseline six to 12 weeks and six months after exposure. Perform HIV antibody testing with the person if the person develops any illness compatible with acute retroviral syndrome. Advise exposed persons to take precautions to prevent secondary transmission during the follow-up period. This includes avoiding pregnancy and seeking safe alternatives to breastfeeding, avoiding donating blood, tissue, or sperm using condoms during sexual intercourse until the target is at least six months. At six months, confirms that exposed person remains seronegative. Evaluate, evaluate exposed persons taking PFP within 72 hours after exposure and monitor for drug adherence and possible drug-related side effects and toxicity for at least two weeks. If the person develops HIV antibodies, he or she should be revered for treatment and case and support. The incident report and evaluation of risk of exposure, see step two, should also lead to the quality control and evaluation of working safety conditions should be also lead to quality control and evaluation of working safety conditions. Appropriate correctional measures, such as strengthening adherence to standard precautions, if relevant, should be taken to prevent other exposures to HIV and other bloodborne pathogens. Clinic staff should know their HIV status. It is vital for all clinic staff to carry out surgical procedures to have an HIV test at periodic intervals in accordance with national HIV testing guidelines. If a healthcare worker is known to have recently had a negative HIV test, then post-exposure prophylaxis can be started immediately, if relevant, following exposure to the potentially infected blood. In addition, healthcare workers would be showing leadership in the context or national campaigns to increase awareness of HIV status. References. World Health Organization, Sharp Injuries, Geneva, 2005, Environmental Burden of Diseases, Series number 11. World Alliance for a Patient Study, a World Health Organization alcohol-based formulation in World Health Organization Guidelines on Hand Hygiene in Healthcare, Advanced Draft, Geneva, World Health Organization, 2006, WHO slash EIAP slash SPO slash QPS slash 05.2, HTTP, colon, backslash, backslash, www.o dot in slash patient safety slash en slash world health organization in slash international label organization post exposure prophylaxis to prevent hiv infection joint world health organization slash ilo guidelines on post exposure prophylaxis pep to prevent hiv infection world health organization geneva 2007 <sighs> we are finally out of the woods we're finally at Chapter 9, Managing a Circumcision Service. Summary. 
The manager of a clinic circumcision service has a number of roles. These include ensuring quality of services, making sure that good quality records are kept, monitoring and evaluating the program, and carrying out supportive supervision. To meet these responsibilities, the clinic manager must set the desired levels of performance for the services provided, assess current levels of performance, work with other clinic staff to analyze the causes of inadequate performance, and find solutions for identified problems. Cord keeping, monitoring, and evaluation. The clinic manager should ensure that the health care providers maintain adequate records on all clients. Records should include information on the identity of the client, the type of service provided, forms to assist the task are given in Appendices 9.1, Stock Card, 9.2, Stock Taking Card for Consumables, 9.3, Adverse Event Form, and 9.4, Register. A more detailed account of indicators and monitors and evaluation of male circumcision programs is given to, in the World Health Organization, which UN AIDS publication guides and Indicators. Oh shit, we got Sawyer at Phipps in here. How we doing? Oh god, you. Yeah, you you you're just in time. We're finally at chapter nine, managing a circumcision service. Chapter nine is main managing a circumcision service. Once page one seventy two of one seventy nine. If you want to follow, uh, oh page one seventy two of one ninety. If you want to follow along in your PDF. Uh, I'm pretty sure chapter 9 is either the last or second to last chapter, I'm going to be honest. Alright, well, I might be done by then. Alright, I'll see you later, buddy. Alright, see ya, pal. Indicators. Healthcare facility managers need detailed information to allow them to make decisions about how best to use scarce resources. They might want to know about the answers to questions such as, are we reaching our target audience? Can we provide the necessary services? For example, do we have the appropriate equipment, staff, and medications? Are our services of high, of high quality? For example, do they meet national and international standards? Do our services meet the needs of our clients? Are we referring clients who need it? Uh. For each question, managers should develop one or more indicators to monitor the services or the impact of changes. For example, to assess the quality of the circumcision service provided, an appropriate indicator might be percentage of male circumcision clients who are admitted or referred for management and of, of an adverse effect. Answering these questions depends on careful record keeping by staff who understands the purpose of the records. What is monitoring? Monitoring is the routine assessment, e.g. daily, monthly, quarterly, of information or indicators related to ongoing activities. Monitoring helps to track progress towards the program targets or performance standards and identify aspects of the program that are working according to plan and those that are in need of adjustment. What is evaluation? Evaluation is the measurement of how things change as a result of the inter interventions implemented. There are, of course, many factors that can cause things to change. A formal evaluation tries to demonstrate how much a specific intervention com contributed to a an observed change. Why evaluate male circumcision programs? That's a good question. The purpose of evalu evaluating a male circumcision program is to assess progress made at the particular points in time, assess progress towards ob objectives, provide feedback on whether targets are being met, identify reasons for successes and failures, and providing a basis for future planning. What is a monitoring system? Collecting information to track indicators requires a, a, the collaboration of dedicated and knowledgeable staff. Obtaining and reporting the required information to represent an extra burden of work and may even be impossible unless an effective monitoring system is in place. This implies all those involved know what information is needed and whom. Tools needed to collect the information are available. All those involved know how to how and when to report the information. One person is responsible for making sure that the system is working, i.e. indicators are up to date, that records are working are properly kept, and that data are reported to appropriate patterns. The person responsible for monitoring the system must keep clinic staff informed about what needs to be recorded and reported. He or she must also adjust monitoring tools to reflect the information required. Monitoring performance in male circumcision programs. Figure 9.1 is a graph representation of how monitoring through routine data collection can help identify how program performance, represented by the thick arrow, relates to program objectives, using an example to the cumulative number of circumcisions performed per month. Program objectives, circumcision performed. Programs performance, circumcision performed. Start a program, end of program. 
that's just a diagram, I guess. Figure 9.1, monitoring and the evaluation of program performance in relation to program objectives. Evaluation. Evaluation can be done by reviewing available records and reports, client record forms, clinic register, theater register, adverse effect forms, drug inventory forms, referral forms, etc. Conducting supervisory assessments, having staff conduct self-assessments, conducting peer assessments, obtaining feedback from clients, e.g. through exit interviews, surveying community perceptions of the service, comparing the clinic's services with those of other facilities. What are good data? I think that was another question in uh, the female genital mutilation one, too. A monitoring system will provide useful information only if the data re recorded are good. Clinic managers should in ensure that the staff are aware of the following. Understanding the data. Staff responsible for keeping records should know exactly what information is needed. For example, adverse effects associated with male circumcision. Recording the data every time. Every time a staff member performs a procedure, sees a client, prescribes a medication, receives a test result, or makes a referral, it should be recorded on the appropriate form. Recording all of the data. All the information requested on monitoring forms should be completed. This might require noting when a particular treatment was not provided. Recording the data in the way in the same way every single time. The same definitions, rules, and tests should always be used in reporting the same pieces of information in the long term. This may not be possible as tests and definitions change, treatment evolve, and new technologies are developed. When it is not possible to record data in the same way, a note should be made describing the change. It is not the role of clinicians, surgeons, or medical, clinical, and nursing officers to develop a functioning, functional monitoring system for the facility. That is the role of the health planner or clinic manager. However, the clinicians need to know who is responsible for the monitoring system, to record data accurately and reliably, and to know how and when to report information related to service and or to patients. Clinicians can also help those responsible for the system by providing feedback and how system is working how information is shared with other cl clinicians, and how easy the various forms are for clinicians to complete accurately and reliably. In this way, the monitoring system to be as in this way, the monitoring system to be as accurate and reliable as possible. Using monitoring information for intervention related decision making. In the context of record keeping and monitoring, information is good only if it can be used. Data that cannot be used should not be collected. Quality assurance. Quality assurance is the assessment or management that the quality of care and services and the implementation of any necessary changes uh, to either maintain or improve the quality of care rendered. Quality assurance has also been defined as a systemic process for closing the gap between actual performances and desirable outcomes. The quality of male circumcision services can be defined through development and, and communication of standards. Quality can then be measured by determining whether the standards are being met Various methods can be used to measure quality, e.g. self-assessment, peer assessment, and external assessment. Quality improvement methodology can be used to continuously improve the quality of male circumcision, care, and services. I, um, the World Health Organization has developed a comprehensive guide to quality assurance for male circumcision programs. This guide defines 10 service standards that each program should meet box that includes the essential competencies for male circumcision and service provision i'm just gonna take a little break because i'm feeling very um tired Oof. all right let me just take a tiny break all right good just had to just had to check something. Just had to check that my uh, refrigerator wasn't running. <sighs> the guide defines ten service standards that each program should meet. Uh, in each edition, it outlines the process of quality assessment and includes guidance for facility managers and staff. The guide is supplemented by a toolkit to assist managers and staff assess the quality of services. Recommended male circumcision standards. One. Through 10. An effective management system is established to oversee the provision of male circumcision services. A minimum package of male circumcision services is provided. The facility has the necessary medicine, supplies, equipment, and environment for providing safe male circumcision services of good, of good quality. Providers are qualified and competent. Clients are a profession on HIV prevention and male circumcision. 
Assessments are performed are performed to determine the condition of clients. Male circumcision surgical care is delivered according to evidence-based guidelines. Infection prevention and control measures are practiced. Control cont continuity of care is provided. A system of monitoring and evaluation is established. Traditional approaches to supervision emphasize inspecting facilities and error and checking individual performance. They focus on finding fault or errors and sanctioning those responsible or those to be responsible. And though this type of supervision is often causes negative feelings and rarely results in an improved service. In contrast, supervision for performing quality improvement focuses on World Health Organization, Male Circumcision Quality Assurance, a guide to enhancing the safety and quality of services, Geneva, World Health Organization, 2008, available at malecircumcision.org. World Health Organization, Male Circumcision Services and Quality Assessment Toolkit, Geneva, World Health Organization, 2009, available at malecircumcision.com. Record keeping, evaluation, and supervision. The goal of providing high-quality health services, the style of, encur of encouraging inclusive, supportive interaction, and a process of con continuous performance and quality improvement. The goal. The goal of supervision is to promote and maintain the delivery of high-quality health services in a traditional system of supervision. This goal is often lost or at least not apparent to those being supervised. By clearly stating that the goal of supervision is the delivery of high-quality health care services, the supervisor can, can transform sometimes negative impression of a supervision into a positive one. The style. Supervision for performance and quality improvement should be done in a style that involves as many stakeholders as possible, achieves results through teamwork, and provides constructive and useful feedback. The underlying assumption is that people who work will work better when they genuinely when they actively participate and are listened to treated well encouraged to do a good job and recognized for a job well done the process supervisors can use step by a step by step process of performance and quality improvement presented here to help achieve a high quality service the process is illustrated in figure 9.2 the process involves a cycle of logical steps which are repeated until the desired performance is achieved the cycle can be used to solve any type of performance problem for instance involving infection prevention practices management of stocks or counseling figure 9.2 the performance and quality improvement of process of process get and maintain stakeholder agreement define desired performance gap find causes of performance gaps select interventions and imp to improve performance implement interventions to improve performance monitor and evaluate performance assess performance the following in a uh, the performance of uh, and quality improvement process involves the following steps Oh, it, it involves quite the amount of steps, but only like two pages, so that's not bad. Define desired performance. In order for people to perform well, they must know what they are expected to do. Performance standards need to be set. Staff must know not only what their duties are, but also how they are expected to perform them. Their the, des the desired performance should be realistic and based on common goals. The expectation of the community and resources available, examples of desired performance and standards related to male circumcision are all clients above the age of 18 years must complete a written informed consent before undergoing male circumcision. Instruments during a male circumcision procedure must be decontaminated in 0.5% sodium hypochlorite solution for 10 minutes before being cleaned and sterilized. All clients undergoing male circumcision and or their parents should be counseled about HIV. Assess performance. The team should continually assess its own performance in relation to it, how it's expected to perform. This assessment can be done in a continuous basis informally or more formally at periodic intervals by monitoring specific activities and steps, conducting self-aware uh, assessments, or obtaining feedback from clients. Using the above desired standards as examples, performance of assessment may show the, of the following. 76% of clients over the age of 18 years complete a written informed consent gap before undergoing male circumcision, a gap of 24%. Instruments used during male circumcision procedures were decontaminated in 0.5% sodium hypochlorite for 10 minutes before being cleaned and sterilized for 50% of the time, a gap of 50%. Adapted from performance of improvement framework developed through collaboration of human... of Effort by members at the Performance of Improvement Consultative Group, PICG. 36% of clients were undergoing male circumcision and or their parents were counseled about HIV, a gap of 74%. Find the causes of performance gaps. A performance gap means that what is occurring does not meet the performance standards that have been set. If this is the gap, if, if, this, if this is found to be the case, the manager needs to explore with the staff why the gap is occurring. 
Sometimes the reasons for poor performance are not immediately obvious. It may take some time to find the real cause. For example, if 74% of clients undergoing male circumcision are not being counseled about HIV infection, analysis of the gap may be reveal the following possible causes. Shortage of staff, especially counselors and nurses, a high client load, no space in the clinic for counseling clients, a shortage of test kits for HIV, staff not aware of fa facility policy, or no one in the facility has been trained in counseling and testing. Select and implement interventions to improve performance. Once the causes of the performance gap have been determined, the manager and staff will need, will need to identify and put in order of priority, plan and implement, intervent, implement interventions to provide performance. The interventions can be directed at improving the system and skills of staff or the environment and support systems. Many different types of interventions can improve worker performance. To make the best use of resources, it is important to select the most appropriate ones. Monitor and evaluate performance. Once an intervention has been implemented, it is important to determine whether it has the desired result. It, in other words, um, it did the intervention lead to improved performance? Did the team come closer to meeting established standards? If not, the team will need to look again at what is hindering performance to make sure that the interventions were targeted at the real cause of the performance gap. If performance has improved, it is important to continue monitoring to make sure that the level of performance is maintained. Appendix 9.1, we're in the end game. This is a sample stock card. Product. E.g. 1% no, plain lidocaine. Expiry dates, cost per items, selling price, if applicable, reorder level. You have date, in, out, balance, and comments. Appendix 9.2, sample stock taking card for consumables. Date of stock taking, initials of stock taker. We have the details, the, qu the, um, the quantity, the comments. So the co in the quantity, we have the stock taking, the stock card, and the difference. We've got 1% plain lidocaine. Paracetamol tins, ampicillin tins, sterile gloves, examination gloves, packets, utility gloves, spirit bottles, betadine bottles, gauze rolls, cotton wool rolls, 3.0 chromic cat gut, adhesive plaster rolls, normal saline, bottles slash bags, 27 gauge needles, 30 gauge needles, 10 milliliter syringes, 5 milliliter syringes, 2 milliliter syringes, safety pins, tapper 4 8 circle needles, JIK bottles. Appendix 9.3, sample male circumcision adverse event form, client's name, date of visit, date of circumcision, patient's ID number, instructions, check appropriate box for any adverse effects. So we've got the adverse event, the description, and the severity. So we have adverse event, A, during surgery, pain, 3 to 4 on the pain scale, 5 or 6 on the pain scale, 7 on the pain scale, excessive bleeding more than usual, but easily controlled, bleeding that requires pressure dressing to control, blood transfusion or transfer to another facility required, anesthetic-related event, palpitations, vasovagal uh, reaction or emesis, reaction to anesthetic requiring medical treatment in a clinic, but not transfer to another facility, anaphylaxis or other reaction to requiring transfer to another facility, excess skin removed, adds time or material needs to, to, to the procedure, but does not result in any discernible adverse condition. Skin is tight, but additional operative work not necessary. Requires operate re operation or transfer to another facility to correct the problem. Damage to the penis. Mild bruising or abrasion, not, treat, not requiring treatment. Bruising or abrasion of the glands or shaft of the penis requiring pressure or dressing or additional surgery to control. Part of all the glands or shaft penis severed. Treatment provided. Treatment outcome. Adverse effects completely resolved. Adverse event partially resolved. Adverse event unchanged. Was patient revered? Yes. No. If yes, where? Adverse event, event B. Uh, less than one month after surgery. Pain. Three to four on the pain scale. Four, five or six on the pain scale. Seven on the pain scale. Excessive bleeding. Dressing soaked up through with blood, a routine, routine follow-up visit. Bleeding that requires a special re return to the clinic for medical attention. Bleeders that, bleeding that requires surgical re-exploration. Excessive skin removed. Client concerned, but there is no discernible abnormality. Skin is tight, but ad additional operative work not necessary. Requires re-operation or transfer to another facility. Insufficient skin removed. 
Foreskin partially covers the glands only when extended. Foreskin still partially covers the glands and reoperation is required. More swelling than usual, but no significant. Oh, wait. Um, swelling or hematoma. More swelling than usual, but no significant discomfort. Significant tenderness and discomfort, but surgical re-exploration not required. Surgical re-exploration required. Damage to the penis. Mild bruising or abrasion, not requiring treatment. Bruising or abrasion of the glands or shaft, requiring pressure, duressing, or additional surgery. Part or all of the glands, shaft of penis, severed. Infection. Erythema, more than one centimeter beyond the incision line. Perulent dam discharge from the wound. Cellulitis or wound necrosis. Delayed wound healing. Healing takes longer than usual, but no extra treatment necessary. Additional non-operative treatment required. Requires reoperation. Client concerned, but no discernible abnormality. This is appearance. Significant wound disruption or scarring, but not, does not require reoperation. Uh, problems with urinating. Transient complaint that resolves without treatment. Requires a special return to the clinic, but no additional treatment requires. Re requires referral to another facility for management. C. This is over one month after uh, surgery, or equal to one month after surgery. Infection. Urethra more than one centimeter beyond incision line, purulent damage from the wound, cellulitis, or wound necrosis. Del delayed wound healing. Healing takes longer than usual, but no extra treatment necessary. Additional non-operative treatment required requires reoperation. Appearance. Client concern, but no discernible abnormality. Significant scarring or other cosmetic problem. Does not require reoperation. Requires reoperation. Excessive skin removed. Client concern, but there is no discernible abnormality. Skin is tight, but additional operative work not necessary. Requires reoperation or transfer to another facility. Insufficient skin removed. Foreskin partially covers the glands only when extended. Foreskin still partially covers the glands and reoperation is required to correct. Torsion is observable, but does not cause pain or discomfort. Oh, this is for tor torsion. <sighs> Causes mild pain or discomfort, but additional uh, operative work not necessary. Requires reoperation or transfer to another facility. Erectile dysfunction. Client reports occasional inability to have an erection. Client reports frequent inability to have an erection. Client reports complete or near complete inability to have an erection. Psychobehavioral problems. Client reports mild dissatisfaction with the circumcision, but no significant psychobehavioral consequences. Client reports significant dissatisfaction with the circumcision, but no significant psychobehavioral consequences. Significant depression and or other psychological problems attributed by the client to the circumcision. Treatment provided. Was the patient referred? Yes, no. If, where, um, and when. Treatment outcome. Adverse effect completely solved. Uh, adverse event partially resolved. Adverse event unchanged. In your clinical, judge cl clinical judgment, was this adverse event related to male circumcision or not related to male circumcision? Other comments? Date? Name of healthcare provider. Appendix 9.4. Sample male circumcision register. Date? Patient number? Surname, given names, age, procedure, type of anesthesia, start time, end time, surgeon's name, nurse's name, comments or notes. And oh my god, for more information, please contact the Department of Reproductive Health and Research, World Health Organization, Avenue Appia 20, CH 1211, Geneva 27, Switzerland. Fax plus 4122 791 4171. Email reproductive health at who.int. www.who.int slash reproductive health. That is it. We have read the entirety of the, the male genital mutilation PDF. And it only took a bazillion years. Oh, I am so glad that that is now over with. Thank you for making it this entire way. Um, I, I'm going to be recording a podcast tonight, but I probably won't get it out until later because this is going to take like all the time in the world just to you know render on my computer. Now, with that being said, um, thank you so much for listening. Um, it is an honor to have you listen this far. And you know what? If you're already here, why not subscribe? Um, hopefully, my witty banter throughout it seemed interesting enough to can, like want to pursue that more in depth. Because if so, I do a podcast bi-weekly now at this point because of my mom, um, where I... You know, I just let loose and, and be silly. Uh, I do other stuff, too. I have a band camp. I have 
uh, three separate Instagram accounts that are all doing wacky stuff right now. Um, I, you know, I'm pretty active. I do a lot of stuff. Uh, I have a Twitter account. I have two Twitter accounts at this point. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a lot of stuff. Um, you know, I also have this YouTube channel and I have projects, you know, I'm, I've, I've got a lot of stuff to do. So, you know, like expect good things in the future. I, if, if I do another one of these, it'll probably be like MK ultra or something. I don't know. It's going to be fun. Um, but with that said, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I will see you soon. Um, hopefully for the next video. Uh, goodbye.